Chapter One of What They Couldn't. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What They Couldn't A Home Story by Pansy. Chapter One Family Problems. The Camerons were moving. That was their chronic condition, at least so the neighbors thought, and really it did seem as though they were always either just trying to get settled in one home or planning to break up and get ready for another. We move and move, would Lucia say, and never get anywhere. I wish father would make one grand move out west or down south or anywhere besides just here. I should like to go a thousand miles away and begin all over again. That would take money, the elder sister Mary would reply. Ever so much money. When do you suppose father would get enough together to take a journey to say nothing of taking all our belongings along? It costs money to move from one end of the town to the other, would Lucia retort. A ruinous amount, those furniture vans charge just frightfully. I don't wonder that father was pale this morning and couldn't eat any breakfast after settling with them. If we had all the money that we have spent in breaking up and moving and getting settled again, my! I'd furnish this house anew from attic to cellar and take a journey into the bargain. We might go in emigrant wagons and camp out at night. I've read about people doing it and having great fun. Oh, dear, I wonder how it feels to go places and have what one wants and never think or care how much the whole costs. The conversation, if conversation it can be called, was sure to end with some such sentence and a sigh, albeit the sigh was a light one, for Lucia was young and the cares of life sat lightly on her as yet. Perhaps she, in common with the entire younger portion of the family, felt them more heavily this morning than ever before. Some way this move had been the hardest. The last one always was, the Camerons declared. And in their case it was truer than it may be in many, for each time they moved into a smaller and more inconvenient house than the last one was, and each time the strain of getting settled, and of learning over again the lesson of doing without, was increased by the fact that, as Lucia expressed it, there were more things to do without each change they made. The air of the new house was surcharged with groans and regrets and queries. How were they ever to get along with one less sleeping room? Where was Mac to be put when he came home? Mac and Rod just despised rooming together. Moreover, the room was so small that those great tall fellows couldn't be expected to endure it. And a house without a china closet in the dining room! Who ever heard of such a thing? Nor did it lessen the gloom of the occasion to be told grimly by Mary that most of the china was smashed and did not need a closet. Truth to tell, some pieces of the smashed china were so choice and so beloved that the mistress of this new home sat down in the disorder and cried over her loss. "'Mother gave me that set when I was married,' she said, her lip quivering, "'and to think not a whole piece is left to me now.' Mary Cameron tried to be sympathetic, but it was hard work. There were so much more important things than old china. There, for instance, was the new silk dress which she had been promised this fall. Didn't she make her old white dress do all summer, saving for that pale green silk which she meant to have? She did not share Lucia's anxieties in the least about the boys. She even declared with curling lip that she saw no reason why Mac and Rod should not share the family straits as well as to have all the trouble fall on the girls. It may be necessary at this point to explain that the Camerons were not poor people in the sense in which they may seem. Mr. Cameron's salary was two thousand a year, and was paid in regular quarterly installments, as sure to come as the sun was to rise. 
there are people with whom such a state of things would mean wealth. The Camerons were not among them. Given, a family of grown sons and daughters, six in number, all of them with expensive tastes and desires, three of them still in expensive schools, none of them having ever learned even the initial letters of the art of true economy, and it will readily be seen that to make ends meet, even on two thousand a year, may become a difficult task. Not that the Camerons did not consider themselves economical. It was a word they hated, yet it was continually on their lips, and there were undoubtedly ways in which they economized. The difficulty was that they began at wrong ends. The very house in which they had just slept through the first night and awakened in the crisp October morning to wrestle with boxes and bales and bundles was an illustration. Two rooms smaller than the last house, and into that they could barely crowd, a house whose plumbing was doubtful, whose gas fixtures leaked, whose water pipes were always out of order, whose kitchen was dingy to the last degree, whose dining room was narrow and dark, and whose hall was a miserable little square, from which Lucia said one must retreat to outdoors if one wanted to change one's mind and turn around. And it was seventy dollars a year more rent than was the large, roomy, sunny house on Seventh Street, a house which actually had a cherry tree all its own, and a robin that built its nest there every spring, and a bit of a side yard to put the tree in, and a dry cellar, and no steps down from the dining room to the kitchen. Yes, the house was for rent. They could have had it as well as not. In fact, the owner urged Mr. Cameron to take it, and promised to repaper the two front rooms upstairs if he would. Why did they not? Why, because it was on 7th Street and not on Durand Avenue. To be sure, the house they had taken was at the extreme lower end of the avenue, where none of the people lived whom they knew, even by sight. But nevertheless, it was Durand Avenue, and the Camerons, even without discussing it, had known to a woman that of course they could not go down on 7th Street to live. Nobody lives there they said. Now Seventh Street was one long row of dwelling houses on either side, neat, trim-looking houses, always tenanted, so of course somebody lived there. You must judge what the Camerons meant. Because the Cherry Tree House was larger, and was on a corner, and had the dry cellar, and some other special advantages, it rented for more than the other houses on the street, and was, consequently, occasionally vacant for a few weeks at a time, looking for the person who could afford to pay that amount of rent, and yet who would be willing to live on 7th Street. You think, perhaps, there was a nuisance of some sort hidden away around the corner? Or at least that the place was inconvenient of access? Nothing of the sort. The lower end of Durand Avenue was but a block away from a suspicious vacant lot where nuisances did sometimes congregate, but the corner house on 7th Street stood high and dry, and had only rows of neat and comparatively new dwelling houses all about it, and the center street line of cars, which connected with almost every downtown line in the city, wound around that very corner. Oh, do not ask for any explanation as to why some people could not live on 7th Street, the Camerons knew, without reasoning, that it could not be done. There were other things they knew. This unfortunate year it became absolutely necessary to have a new carpet. There was no dissenting voice save from the boys. They declared that they did not see but the old carpet was good enough. But the boys were away in college, only home for vacations, and were having, the girls said, every earthly thing they wanted, and didn't care how shabby the folks at home were, so that they had plenty. The boy's opinion was counted out. Mr. Cameron, accustomed to leaving all such matters to his wife and daughters, said only, if they must, they must, he supposed, but he did not see where the money was to come from. However, Jameson and Burns would wait for their pay so the new carpet was bought. 
Axminster it had to be. To be sure, it cost more than a body Brussels, and Mrs. Cameron, who remembered the days when body Brussels carpet was quite the thing to buy, voted in its favor, but she was tremendously overruled. Nobody uses body Brussels in their parlors any more. It is simply for sitting rooms and bedrooms. Mrs. Cameron argued vigorously, but submitted at last. It is good economy to get the best while you are about it, I suppose, Mr. Cameron said with a troubled face on being appealed to. Somewhere in the dim recesses of his memory, he had stored away certain aphorisms of that kind which he brought out on occasion. Nobody explained to him that a good body Brussels had far more enduring qualities than cheap Axminster so called. It is not even certain that any of his family knew the fact. It was in the midst of the miseries of getting settled that there came a letter which all the family, Mr. Cameron accepted, sat down in the half-regulated sitting-room to discuss. More or less excitement was evidently felt concerning it. Mary was the first to express herself, her cheeks unnaturally flushed the while. Mrs. Cameron was re-reading the letter. "'I must say, I think Mac and Rod are two of the most selfish creatures I ever heard of in my life. Dress suits, indeed! Why, they are nothing but boys!' Mrs. Cameron glanced up from the letter. Don't be absurd, Mary. I believe you think boys never grow up. Mac is twenty-two, the time when most boys consider themselves men. It is the time when most boys are thinking about supporting themselves, and not depending on their fathers for dress suits and everything else. I say it is selfish. Sending for more things just now, when we are moving, and doing without everything we can to help along. Look at those curtains, darned in half a dozen places. I have been ashamed of them for the last six months. Suppose I say we must have new ones. I'm sure they would be as important as dress suits for the boys, and a great deal more sensible. Still, Mary, interposed Lucia's quieter voice, they say they cannot attend the president's reception without them. Then I should think it would be a good plan for them to stay at home. The idea that college boys cannot appear at a reception unless they are dressed in the extreme of fashion. I cannot go to Mrs. Peterson's dinner party next week unless I have my new silk dress that was promised me. Suppose I say so. At least three tongues would begin to tell me how entirely suitable my old blue dress is that I have worn wherever I've been for the last year. But because it is the boys who want things, we girls must give up, of course. Lucia laughed over this. There is some truth in what you are saying. We have been giving up things for those boys ever since they entered college. If they appreciated it, I would feel differently but they take it so entirely as a matter of course that I must say it is discouraging. Well, said Mrs. Cameron, do you want us then to write to the boys that they cannot have dress suits and must stay at home from the reception? This was putting the matter blankly. Evidently the sisters were astonished. They were not accustomed to such direct questions from their mother. Neither of them desired to have such words sent to the boys. If it were true, as the boys said, that all the students in their set wore dress suits, why, certainly, their brothers must have them. It was really a foregone conclusion, as they expected their mother to understand. It was hard that they could not have the privilege of grumbling, since they were to make the sacrifice. It was a curious development of this entire family, that they did their giving up with grumbling. It was true, as the girls had said, that much had been sacrificed for their brothers. Mr. Cameron, who in certain respects was something of a cipher in his own home, constantly allowing himself to be overruled and led whither his better judgment did not approve, could yet be firm on occasion. He had, as Mrs. Cameron expressed it, set his foot down, that both his boys should have college educations. 
he was not one of those who deemed the collegiate education as important for the girls as the boys although he had done his best for his daughters the two elder ones had been sent to excellent and expensive schools and emily the youngest was still a schoolgirl the father had had pride in his daughter's acquirements but he had had determination in regard to his sons they were smart boys they made fair records for themselves in preparatory schools even excelling in certain studies and to college they should go it had been and was still a hard struggle college life proved to be a much more expensive thing than it had been when mr cameron was a young man and his boys were not of the sort to carefully curtail their expenses although they thought they were models of prudence the dress suits which had suddenly appeared before them as necessities will serve as illustrations of their mode of thought necessities were what other people in their set had to have remained quietly away from dress occasions because to have what they judged to be suitable attire would burden the people at home was thought of but cast aside as impracticable it would be a discourteous way of treating the invitations of the faculty to join the few quiet scholarly students who frequented such places conspicuous in the suits which they wore for best was not even thought of at all by the camerons their home education had developed no such heights of self-abnegation as that it would be worse than living on seventh street neither strange to say would mary cameron who grumbled the loudest have had them do any such thing no one understood necessities of this kind better than she why of course not she said in answer to her mother's question they will have to have the suits i suppose all the same i think it is mean in them to send doing it in such a lordly way why can't they at least show that they appreciate the sacrifices we shall have to make to gratify them i don't see anything very lordly about the letter mac writes that they cannot go to the receptions without dressing as others do and of course they can't you are always hard on your brothers mary i hard on them who gave up a silk dress for their sakes i should like to know talk about their having to dress like others when they appear in society how do you think i will look in that horrid silk until people can describe me as the girl in the old blue dress oh mary said lucia do give us a rest about that silk dress i am sure if you never mention it again we shall none of us ever forget that you were going to have one and didn't we have heard so much about it lucia spoke laughingly she generally did nevertheless there was a sting in her words perhaps that phrase will describe the cameron habit they stung one another from the mother down to even emily who being only fifteen could still be told on occasion to say no more they loved one another this family not one of them thought of doubting it in times of illness it would not be possible to conceive of tenderness and self-abnegation greater than theirs long nights of weary watching were as nothing long days of patient persistent gentle caretaking were matters of course yet directly the invalid took on once more the appearance and habits of health the stinging process commenced it was as if the stock of patience which had seemed inexhaustible during illness had suddenly frozen and left only irritable nerves over which to tread not that the camerons were always in ill humor far from it they had their merry hours and their good times together it was only that the two excitable nerves lay always near the surface and would not bear so much as a pin-prick those dress suits were really more than a pin-prick sixty additional dollars when the family purse was strained already to its utmost was no small matter i declare said mr cameron at the dinner-table that evening leaning his weary head on his hand and giving over the attempt to eat the not too inviting dinner 
which had to be served in the kitchen as the only spot available, I don't know how to raise the money. The boys did not say anything about it when they went away, and I tried to plan for everything that would be wanted before Christmas. One would suppose if it were such an important item, they would have remembered and spoken of it. When I was a young fellow, if I had a decent suit for Sunday, and a halfway decent one for every day, I considered myself well off. The boys had entirely new suits throughout only six weeks ago. "'It isn't that their clothes are worn out, Edward,' said Mrs. Cameron, her tone showing that her nerves felt the pinpricks. "'They must wear what others do if they mingle with them, of course. Don't you understand? Rodney says all the fellows, except two or three who are being helped through college, wear evening dress at the receptions. You wouldn't want your sons to appear different from the other respectable young men, I suppose, would you?' "'I don't know,' said Mr. Cameron, and he tried to let a faint smile appear on his face to lessen the seeming harshness of the words. "'I would like them to appear as honest men if they could, and I don't know how they are to have new suits this fall unless I borrow the money, with no prospect of paying for it so far as I can see. I don't know but they would better join the two or three who are being helped through college.' That is what it will amount to in the end. "'Oh, nonsense!' said Mrs. Cameron, and her voice was unmistakably sharp. "'What is the use of talking such stuff as that? We are not paupers. A man who gets a two-thousand-dollar salary ought to be able to furnish his children with clothes without having a fuss about it every time they need a pocket handkerchief.' "'I know it,' Mr. Cameron said, and he wore the perplexed look his face was sure to assume when any phase of the subject was before them. I don't understand how it is. When I sit down with pencil and paper and calculate the year's expenditures, so much for living and so much for extras, it all seems to come out reasonably well. But when we get to the end of the quarter, we are behind every time, and something will come of it one of these days. I can't see how it is going to end. "'I'll tell you what, father,' said Emily briskly. "'I'll leave school if you'll let me. Then there will be no bills to pay for all sorts of extras. Music, you know, and books and everything. That will make quite a difference in a year's time.' It was a fortunate diversion. The entire Cameron family laughed. Emily was, sometimes merrily and sometimes a bit sharply, called the family dunce. She hated study, and cared almost nothing for music, and would have been only too glad to be relieved from the burden of both. The intensely personal reasons for her magnanimous offer were so entirely apparent that it needed no other answer than a laugh. It cleared the atmosphere somewhat, albeit Mr. Cameron sighed almost immediately. But he said, as he arose from his barely tasted dinner, "'Oh, well, we shall pull through somehow. We always have. I'll ask Hosmer to let me have a little advance. The boys have got to be like others, I suppose. Get the letter written, some of you, and I will have the money ready for the first mail tomorrow.'" End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of What They Couldn't by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Trying to Be Long. It was while they were piecing the dining room carpet that the next subject for discussion and annoyance came before the Camerons. Those two words, discussion and annoyance, might almost be called the keynotes of their lives, so frequent had they become the one seeming to be a sequence of the other. It is very probable that sewing on the old carpet helped to irritate the nerves. It is not particularly soothing work, and Lucia hated sewing. "'I wish we had sold this old thing to the ragman,' she said gloomily. "'The last time we patched it, I remember we said it would not hold together for another move.' "'Then you would have had bare floor for the dining-room, I can tell you,' said Mrs. Cameron. 
I am not going to ask your father for another thing this fall that can be done without. He hasn't slept for two nights, worrying about the extra money needed for the boys. What is the use in father's worrying? That will not help pay any bills. I should think it would be a good deal more sensible to him to get his sleep and save his strength. Don't criticize your father, said Mrs. Cameron sharply. I will not bear it. The poor wife criticized him herself sometimes with great sharpness, and in the presence of the children, but she would not permit them to follow her example. Like many other nervous, overstrained women, her thought of the husband of her youth was always tenderness, but her words to him were often tinged with whatever feeling rasped the hour. "'Why, dear me!' began Lucia. "'What did I say?' I am sure that I pity father as much as anybody can, and I think— Here Mary's entrance from the kitchen interrupted the sentence. Mother, she began, Betsy says she cannot make another pudding until she has a new pudding dish. The old one leaks. Then we will go without pudding, said Mrs. Cameron with emphasis. I am not going to get a new pudding dish, nor a new anything for Betsy. She is careless with the dishes, or they would last longer. She is always wanting something, asked for a new bread bowl only this morning. Well, mother, the bread bowl got broken in the moving. It wasn't Betsy's fault. I do not think she should be made to suffer. You packed the bowl yourself, remember. For pity's sake, don't talk about the bread bowl. It was quite likely I remember that I packed it without being told. If you had not hurried me almost to distraction over that last load, I could have packed it more securely. I'm sure I don't want to talk about bread bowls, said Mary, bringing needle and thread and preparing to do her share of the long seam which was to be sewed in the mended carpet. I have something of more importance to say. I saw Jessie Lee just now when I was sweeping the leaves from the porch, and she says the Denhams are going home next Tuesday. What shall we do about that? Congratulations to Mrs. Lee would be in order, I should say, replied Lucia. I hope we shall never have any friends who will think it their duty to make us as long a visit as the Denhams have been making. Long as they have been here, said Mary, we have not invited them even to lunch with us, and we have been everywhere with them three times out to formal dinners, four or five times to lunches, and to evening gatherings innumerable. Mother, we shall certainly be obliged to have them here, shall we not? Oh, dear me, said Mrs. Cameron, and she dropped the patch she was deftly fitting into the carpet, and looked her utter dismay. Mary Cameron, what can you be thinking about with all that we have on hand now? I am thinking about the fact that the Denhams are going on Tuesday, as I said, and that there are just four days left in which to show them any courtesy, unless, indeed, we have lost all sense of propriety, and are going to let them leave without having received any attention from us. You have been out to dinner once with them yourself, mother. I know it, said Mrs. Cameron, her face a study. I wish we hadn't accepted one of their invitations for I really do not see how we can entertain them now. I don't know why not. We can't give a party for them, I suppose, as we really ought to do. We are under obligations to so many people that I am ashamed to meet some of them. But we are equal to a plain lunch, I should hope. Russell Denham is going back to college as soon as he has taken his mother and sister home, and Mac and Rod will be with him a good deal this winter, I suppose." They wouldn't like it if they knew we had not shown their friends any attention. Oh, well, I suppose we shall have to do something. But I declare it worries me dreadfully, so unsettled as we are, and this little bit of a house to have company in. I wish we didn't have anything to do with society. We have extremely little, Mary replied coldly. I sometimes think with Emily that it would be better if we just said squarely that we are nobodies and do not expect to be invited or to belong. The mother winced. She wanted her children to belong. 
her ambition for them in society and everywhere else was limitless of course we must do something she said briskly what shall it be we can get up a lunch as you say more economically than a dinner or a regular evening gathering it would be less burdensome to your father too for they will know that he cannot get away from business for luncheon and he is so tired nowadays that he shrinks from seeing company but you must be content with having everything very simple we cannot undertake any expense remember their ideas of simplicity would have bewildered some people a lunch without salads was not to be thought of of course and chicken salads were the best no matter if chicken was very expensive just now it did not take a great deal for a salad then oysters were getting nice and after the long summer seemed so new raw oysters were the very thing with which to begin a lunch served on the half shell and properly garnished there was no simple dish which looked more inviting as for the creams they must have them from alberg's of course oh positively there were none fit to eat after having had his no matter if he did charge seventy-five cents a quart it would be much better not to have cream at all than to have an inferior quality they could afford to pay a little extra for creams and ices because they would make their own cake very few of the girls did that when they had company they just ordered from some first-class caterer lucia sighed and wished that they could afford to do so it would be only pleasure to have company if they could give orders as other people did and have trained servants to attend to everything at home at the mention of servants mrs cameron could not suppress a groan of anxiety how could they hope to serve guests properly with only betsy to depend upon she was a new recruit and a cheap one therefore not much could be expected of her i shall just have to stay in the kitchen and attend to things myself she said that will be the only way to avoid distressing failures and as it is i tremble for the serving i wish i could be in two places at once oh mother said lucia dismayed you cannot be in the kitchen what a ridiculous way to have company with the lady of the house invisible mary you surely do not think anything of that kind can be done it's like everything else said mary drearily of course we cannot have company like other people we never can we have been invited and invited just as i said until i am ashamed to meet my acquaintances and yet the very thought of paying some of our obligations sets us all into a tremor if we could hire a professional waiter for one day to help betsy out we could hope to have things decent mrs cameron caught at the idea perhaps they could do that it would not be such a very heavy expense for one day a part of the day indeed they would save the price of it in the end because professional helpers knew how to manage without spoiling anything it was curious what a relief this professional assistant was and how many things grew out of her proposed services it was mrs cameron herself who said that since they were to have help she did not know but they would better make it an occasion for asking a few others the expense would not be materially increased and as mary said they were indebted to so many people there were the westbrooks for instance and the overmans and mrs lorimer why not make a clean sweep of it and ask them all but mother think about what it will cost to get ready for so many objected lucia what will father say it would not cost so very much more mrs cameron argued strong for the time being in the thought of that professional helper we shall not have to pay any more for help than we would if we had just three or four and i really do not see how we can have anybody without inviting those i have mentioned we have been entertained by them so many times it was too true and there were found to be others quite as alarming as the ones mentioned until mary who finally went for pencil and paper and began to consider them numerically and systematically declared that it was not possible to get along without inviting seventeen 
then we might as well make it nineteen said lucia composedly and ask that mrs landis and her brother we shall never have a better opportunity to return their kindness the idea said mary why in the world should we ask them they will not know a person who will be there and we know them very little ourselves i can't help it we can make them acquainted with the others they have certainly been very kind to us we never had neighbors before in our lives they must be from the country they have such friendly uncitified ways i like them very well indeed and i think it would be bad manners to say the least to have company and not invite them when they are almost in the same house one may say and when we have all been in there to have tea with them lucia may or may not have understood what a troublesome subject she had introduced to mary it seemed to be a positively irritating one she expressed herself so decidedly and with such annoying sharpness that lucia who at first made it as only a passing suggestion grew obstinate declaring that she had nothing to say about the other guests and it was strange if she could not select two then mary replied that of course if lucia had adopted professor landis as her particular friend nothing more was to be said she had not imagined so great a degree of intimacy on such short notice then lucia her face aglow with indignation appealed to her mother as to whether it was necessary for mary because she was less than two years the elder to insult her in that manner mrs cameron hastened to the rescue assuring both girls that she was ashamed of them why couldn't they talk things over without always having some sort of a fuss as for the landis young people she thought it would be very proper to invite them they were not exactly in their set perhaps she thought with lucia that they were probably from the country but they were nice pleasant persons and had been very kind and thoughtful to them two more would make very little difference and their father would be pleased to have them show kindness to his neighbors he had spoken of them several times it ended by an invitation being sent to the landis brother and sister and to several others whom it became imperative to remember it was quite safe to say that not a cameron among them had any idea whereunto this thing would grow or they would certainly not have begun mr cameron was bewildered i thought you said he began to his half distracted wife when she essayed to explain that we would make a special effort to economize to help meet the extras for the boys and for the moving well i wonder if i am not doing it she replied irritably you know very little about it edward or you would understand that i am straining every nerve i ironed all the afternoon in order to save extra help betsy would never have gotten the ironing done if i hadn't she is a stroke of economy herself i never had such poor help oh nobody knows how i twist and contrive in order to help it is hard to have to be blamed when i am doing my best i am not blaming you rachel mr cameron said and he tried to speak quietly i am only asking questions i don't understand we all felt i supposed the need for special care this fall and here we have a party on our hands there has not been a season in ten years when we could have afforded it better a party repeated mrs cameron in intense annoyance now edward i call that being very disagreeable i have explained to you that it is only the plainest possible luncheon served to a few of our most intimate friends and i told you the special necessity of it at this time too i don't believe even you careless as you are would be willing to have the denims leave without showing them so much attention when they have been here for two months and have been more intimate with our young people than with any others russell denham has certainly paid mary a great deal of attention i think she is interested in him it is for her sake that i want to be courteous i thought you would appreciate that a little note of injured innocence was added to the tone mr cameron still tried to understand 
why not invite the Denhams and the Lees in to have a comfortable, quiet dinner with us and make no fuss about it? If the young people enjoy one another's society, I should think that would be a pleasanter way to secure it, and the expense would be less, certainly, to say nothing of the work. You are hardly able to take any more care upon yourself. Oh, Edward, you don't understand such things. One would suppose you were from the country yourself to hear you go on sometimes. Fancy Mary singling out the Denhams from all her acquaintances and inviting them to a family gathering. I should not like to have her even know that such an idea had been mentioned. It would be the same as asking the young man if he did not want to belong to the family. There is nothing special between them, Edward, and of course we do not want to act as though we expected there would be. Well, well, said Mr. Cameron, there is no use in talking about it, I suppose. I was brought up in the country, and I wish sometimes that I still lived there. I like country ways best. We had a friend in to take supper with us whenever we wanted to, and thought nothing of it. What I want to know is how much this thing is going to cost. I want it in black and white. He drew out notebook and pencil and looked determined. Come now, I'm not going to run into a thing in the dark. At least, I'll act as though I meant to be honest, just as long as I can. How many people are there to be? Mrs. Cameron hesitated and faltered. Why, the girls thought they ought to ask the porters if they did the lees, and I myself suggested the Overmans, we have been there so much. And Lucia thought our next-door neighbors, the girl and her brother, ought to be asked. You know they had us there for tea that first evening we were in the house, and were very kind. You spoke of offering them some attention. "'How many does it all make?' asked Mr. Cameron, with the air of a martyr. "'Why, I think it counts up twenty-three. I'm sure I did not mention when we began that there would be half so many. But the girls feel really embarrassed about accepting invitations and not making any returns. Twenty-three outsiders, and four of our own, make twenty-seven, and cream to be ordered from Alberg's, I suppose? Yes, I was sure of it. Seventy-five cents a quart. Say, two gallons. That is the least you can get along with. Eight times seventy-five. That makes six dollars just for cream. What next? That inexorable pencil scribbled and figured, and Mrs. Cameron, growing each moment more perturbed, made reluctant admissions to searching questions, and at last, in a shamefaced way, admitted that they could hardly hope to get through with the plainest possible luncheon for less than an outlay of thirty dollars, including the extra help which it was necessary to have. "'I would get along without that if it were possible,' she explained humbly. "'I am willing to work my fingers to the bone in order to give the girls half a chance in the world.' but I know perfectly well that Betsy will blunder in some way if I leave her to herself for a moment, and I can't be in two places at once. Exactly the price of one of the dress suits, said Mr. Cameron, re-adding his hateful figures. Now put down ten dollars for the things we have forgotten, and for the smashes in crockery and the like that will result, and for the new things here and there to be added, and we shall do well if we escape with forty dollars. Doesn't that seem rather hard on our creditors, Rachel? We are a hundred dollars behind this quarter already, you know. But at this point Mrs. Cameron's nerves would bear no more. She sank in a limp heap on the chair before which she had been standing, gathered her housekeeper's apron to her eyes, and cried outright. Mr. Cameron looked appalled and helpless. His wife rarely cried, almost never in his presence. He essayed to comfort, bunglingly yet sincerely. He didn't know much about such things. Of course she was doing the best she could, he was sure of that. The girls must be like others, he supposed. She must not think he meant to blame her. He was harassed about money a good deal of the time, and it made him less careful of his words, perhaps, than he ought to be. She was not to worry and of course she could not give up the scheme now. He did not mean that. In fact, he did not mean anything. 
she must not think any more about it, but just go on as she had planned. He went away looking troubled. Something he must have said to cause his wife's tears. A man was a brute who made a woman cry, and infinitely more a brute when that woman was his wife, the mother of his children. But what had he said to bring the tears to Rachel's eyes? He had seen them a trifle red on rare occasions, as though something might have troubled her, but he did not remember ever before having seen her break down in a burst of weeping. He ought to be careful. Perhaps this eternal fret and worry about money matters was making him hard. He did not want to be a man who seemed to think only of money. When he was young, he had never expected to develop into such a man. There were many things he had thought in his youth which had not matured with his years. And he sighed heavily, and asked himself, as he had done a hundred times in the last few years, whether there were not some quick way of making money. There were Jones and Osborne who were making it by speculating. Only the other day Osborne told him about gaining a thousand dollars in a few hours of time, and Osborne had no family to support. What would not a thousand dollars be to him with sons and daughters to think about? If he only had a little money to start with, there was no reason why he should not be as successful as Osborne or Jones. All the way to the office he thought about it, and tried to contrive ways of securing a few hundreds with which to try his skill. He hesitated for a word and finally chose skill. He did not like the sound of luck. It was not the first time that the harassed father had thought in these lines. That man Osborne was always offering to invest for him in a way that would bring at least twelve per cent. Oh, twelve per cent was nothing! In a way that would be sure to double his money in a few years' time. End of chapter 2Chapter Three of What They Couldn't by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Burns and Heart Burns. Through trials manifold, the Cameron family pressed their way to the day of the lunch party. What they endured from incompetency and accidents and unforeseen complications cannot be put on paper unless you are the mistress of a home limited as to room and dishes and means, and are trying to entertain twenty or thirty people in the space designed for ten, you will not be able to understand or appreciate the situation. A hundred times before the climax was reached, did Mrs. Cameron wish that she had let the Denhams go on their way unentertained. She even had occasionally a wild wish that something very unusual would occur, if, for instance, one of them could fall ill just on that fatal day, and be very ill for a few hours, so that the imperative necessity for recalling the invitations would be manifest, and then recover rapidly without any unpleasant consequences, what a relief it would be! She would be quite willing to be herself the victim, if Providence would so order." Nay, as she struggled on with her mighty problem of salads and sauces and expenses, she grew so weary that it seemed to her a sharp illness which would compel her to lie still for hours, yes, even for days, was the only comfortable thing which could happen to her. Nobody sickened, however, and the fatal day arrived. Betsy, poor, blundering mass of good-natured stupidity, had been doing her best, but to the overstrained nerves of the Camerons, it seemed as though she actually tried sometimes to be stupid and slow and exasperating. They ceased trying to speak to her in other than a sharp, irritated way, which of itself, if they had but understood her, deprived poor Betsy of what wits she had. It was annoying, certainly, to have her slam the oven door quite shut when she was told to leave it ajar, and thereby ruin one entire mass of cake on which Mary had spent her strength and endurance. It is perhaps not to be wondered at that she spoke so emphatically to Betsy as to make that young woman appear before her mistress with red face and angry eyes to declare that she would not be imposed upon another minute. She would just quit, so there! 
than a soothing potion had to be administered, for to lose even Betsy at such a crisis as this was not to be thought of. That professional helper, who was such a tower of strength in perspective, needs a word of comment. He came at the appointed hour, but his importance was something phenomenal. Mrs. Cameron, who was utterly unused to masculine help in the kitchen, and who, whenever she had thought of this addition to her forces, had produced before her mental vision a smiling-faced, deft-handed young woman who would know just what to do without being told, and who yet would do her bidding on occasion swiftly and well, felt utterly cowed before the majestic personage in immaculate necktie, who gazed about him on the diminutive quarters where he was expected to reign, with something very like a sneer on his face, and asked where the trays were, and if they had none larger than that, and how many sets of spoons were there, and where were the relays of napkins to be found, and where were the coffee spoons and the oyster forks? Where were, indeed, all those fine, queer-shaped, costly little extras which he was accustomed to see? The Camerons did not possess them. Mary, as she listened to the professional's abundant questions, realized perhaps as never before what poverty meant, and felt for a moment the utter folly of trying to do what they could not. Never mind, it must be lived through now. The guests were almost at the door. It would never do to flinch. She helped her mother answer the embarrassing questions as best she could. She put on an air of superiority and tried to give the majestic person an order or two, but faltered and crimsoned to her very forehead when he only stared and told her he couldn't do that sort of thing, of course. He had never been in the habit of doing it, she must call upon some under-servant. After that, Mary went to receive her guests, leaving her mother to cope with the important stranger. There proved to be a number of things for which he had been depended upon that were entirely out of his province, and at the last moment Betsy had to be further bewildered by receiving minute instructions concerning matters of which she was as ignorant as a child. I shall have to stay out here and direct things, declared Mrs. Cameron in excited tones to her two elder daughters, as they lingered for a moment in the kitchen for a last word together before the ordeal commenced. There is no use in trying to plan differently. That horrid fellow! As she spoke, she looked about her nervously to make sure that he was far enough away at the moment not to hear her opinion of him, and sank her voice to a whisper, that horrid fellow will do only the things which have been expected of him before, and they are very few indeed, apparently, and he asks for some new-fangled dish or spoon or fork every minute. I wish he were where he came from. I could get along better without him. But I shall have to stay and watch Betsy. She doesn't know the ice pitcher from the cream jug today. She blunders all the time. Oh, mother, don't do that! Let her blunder. Let them both manage. The fellow will behave better perhaps when we are all away. Tell him to direct Betsy. Whatever you do, don't stay in the kitchen and leave us to look after the guests. That is something I have never seen done, and when father isn't here either, it will look horrid. I think father might have come home for a little while. Well, he couldn't, said Mrs. Cameron sharply. And once for all, Lucia, stop criticizing your father. You do altogether too much of that sort of thing, and I tell you I will not have it. The voices of the coming guests broke up this family concave suddenly. Lucia went to receive them with a heightened color on her cheeks. Her mother's reprimand hurt. She was fond of her father, and knew she had meant only to express a desire for his presence among their guests. Mrs. Cameron returned to her arduous duties, resolved to put everything in as good train as she could, and then leave the helpers to themselves, since the girls felt so badly about her not being in the parlor. She would do almost anything rather than add to their annoyance. The guests were very gay. They had no anxieties concerning the feast, and were prepared to enjoy themselves. 
most of them were old acquaintances accustomed to meeting one another at all sorts of gatherings had the camerons been at their ease they might have enjoyed the hour which intervened before lunch was announced as it was visions of betsy's blundering or of selmser's obstinacy kept constantly floating before their mental vision it was a relief when the summons to the dining-room came at least the suspense would soon be over now but it was not it seemed to draw itself out endlessly whether his majesty called selmser essayed to teach them the folly of trying to serve so pretentious a luncheon with their resources or whether he was so carefully trained to run in a particular groove that he really could not step out of it will not be known certain it is that the courses were so long in being served as to lead one almost to forget what had last appeared several of the guests had no forks for their salads until after the others were ready for the next course this selmser explained afterwards to the annoyed hostess was unavoidable because there were not forks enough for the different sets some had to be washed and waited for a thing unknown before in all his experience of serving it seemed also to take an unaccountable time to replenish the cream pitchers and cake plates and when the coffee and chocolate began to come in so slowly that part of the company sat with empty cups before the other part had been reached it was with difficulty that mary cameron restrained herself from rushing out to the kitchen to express her mind to both betsy and his majesty it is perhaps a pity that she did not for some unknown reason selmser had at that moment rebelled the ices needed his attention he declared and betsy must serve the rest of the chocolate in vain she protested that she could never carry that great awkward tray it would slip out of her hands she knew it would he assured her that she would have to carry it if it went and added that she would better step lively for some of them would be getting too old to drink it by this time he should think what could they expect with a house full and only one person to do it all so betsy who had all day been honestly doing the best she could seized the chocolate pot in both her red nervous hands and made a dash for the dining room she might have done well but for a miserable mend in the dining room carpet covered for this occasion by a rug from one of the chambers over this rug betsy stumbled her feet had not grown accustomed to expecting it at that place a moment more and there was a confused mass of betsy chocolate pot rug and a scalding hot fluid the pain which this latter occasioned rose above every other consideration at least for betsy and she howled there were people present who had been acquaintances of the camerons for years but some way it was dorothy landis who sprang to betsy's assistance it was her brother who said kindly to lucia that although he was only a teacher he had once been a medical student and knew exactly what and how to do for a scald they might safely leave betsy's hand to him meantime dorothy landis had with haste and skill assisted in removing the debris and had accomplished one thing more for which mrs cameron's heart went out in gratitude let me open this side window and call our annie she is really very good at serving table i thought of offering to lend her i wish now we had yielded to our neighborly feeling while she spoke she raised the sash and called in a very few minutes annie came white aproned low-voiced swift and silent of movement the very perfection of a maid from that moment the table service went on smoothly even his majesty seeming to discover that in the keen-eyed swift-moving annie he had met his peer if only that landis girl had offered her before it was mary cameron who thought this feeling almost indignant the while over such a breach of neighborliness as the delay suggested nor did she at the moment realize that had the offer been made before it would probably have been declined with stiff dignity and have been commented upon as a specimen of country ignorance it was over at last 
the chocolate stain had been washed out as well as it could be emily lamenting the while that it covered the only bright breadth of carpeting in the room the picked-up dinner had been served by the united efforts of the weary mother and her equally weary girls betsy being still in the depths of misery with her scalded wrist and hand emily had vexed them all and brought a sharp reprimand on herself by announcing suddenly at the dreary dinner that the chickens for the salad cost two dollars and forty cents the grocer called to her and gave her the bill as she passed and that hired fellow threw a whole nice bowlful of it away and did they know he broke the largest meat dish do for pity's sake let us eat a few mouthfuls mary had said angrily without having bills and broken dishes thrown at us then emily had told her that she was cross and that she was most of the time she saved all her pleasant words for other people and never had any for her own folks of course the mother had to interfere then and because she was overworked she did it sharply bidding the fifteen-year-old girl hold her peace. If she had no better words than those to speak, they did not want to hear her speak at all. It cannot be a matter of surprise, under the circumstances, that the girl revenged herself by murmuring that one who had such examples to follow as were given her ought not to be expected to speak pleasant words. Then the entire family had a diversion. Mr. Cameron, who had been unusually silent even for him suddenly made a remark i had a letter from aunt eunice this morning this in itself was a somewhat surprising announcement aunt eunice his only sister a maiden lady was not given to letter writing the few letters which her brother had received from her in the past half dozen years had been written for the purpose of giving some family news very brief letters they were mary remembered two of them one received three years ago ran thus brother edward james died last night i suppose you cannot come to the funeral being so far and there is no need we shall bury him on thursday your sister eunice another received later ran brother edward johnson has foreclosed we shall move of course Hannah did her best, but she is only a woman and had sharpers to deal with. We shall manage, I dare say. I am letting you know because I said I would, not because I expect anything. Hannah was her sister-in-law, the widow of the James. Aunt Eunice's expectations had been fulfilled. Her brother could do nothing for her, save to write a sympathetic letter and bewail the fact that the hard times and a large family to support made it impossible for him to come to the rescue. The girls had thought their aunt's letters queer, not to say heartless. Only three lines to tell father about the death of his brother, and no particulars, Lucia had said, and added, Imagine my writing to one of you announcing the death of Mac or Rod in any such fashion. She had shivered as she spoke the words, and Mary had said, Don't! What is the use in imagining anything so horrid? Yet both of them had quarreled with their brother Rodney that very afternoon, and did not speak to him for twenty-four hours. But the small knowledge which they had of Aunt Eunice made them wait for their father's news with expectancy. She and her sister-in-law had kept together and managed as best they could since the death of the husband and brother. "'Well,' said Mrs. Cameron, after waiting a moment for the expected news, "'what has moved her to write a letter? Is there anything special?' "'Yes, there is. Hannah is dead.' The girls exchanged glances of amusement, and Emily giggled a little. It struck her as amusing that this relative was never heard from except through the agency of death. Hannah was only an aunt by marriage, and one whom they not only had never seen, but had never heard much about. It was not to be expected that they should care very deeply, though their father shot an annoyed glance at them. "'Poor thing,' said their mother, meaning aunt eunice 
she will miss her sadly i suppose they have been together for so long she will have some of hannah's nieces come to live with her will she not no said mr cameron she cannot live on there what hannah had was an annuity it stops at her death she wants to come here undoubtedly she meant his sister eunice and not the aunt who had changed worlds but the Camerons could hardly have looked more startled had they supposed he meant her. Here? repeated Mrs. Cameron, amazed and dazed. Why, how could she? There is something peculiarly trying to some nerves in this repetition of the last word they have spoken. It always tried Mr. Cameron. He could not have told why. Moreover, the question was inane. She could come on the cars, of course, just as any other person would, he replied, more testily than he was in the habit of speaking. Well, but, Edward, I don't understand. She doesn't mean to come here to stay, of course. Why should she be at the expense of taking so long a journey when she has but little means? Mr. Cameron pushed away his plate, with the remains of the luncheon still remaining as they had been served to him, and gave his attention entirely to his wife. "'Why not?' he asked. "'Why should she not come here to stay? I am the only brother she has, the only near relative living. She is without means of support, and by the death of her sister-in-law is left desolate. What more natural than that she should write to me and propose to come to my home?' "'For pity's sake!' said Mary. "'Oh, dear!' said Lucia. And Mrs. Cameron said, Edward, how can we do it? You know we just managed to live as it is, and Rachel is coming home in a few weeks. That will be another one to feed and clothe. How is it possible for us to take care of your sister? I don't know, said Mr. Cameron doggedly. I know how it cannot be done. If we are to give lunches, and buy new carpets and china, and even silver in order to do it, we must let our relatives go to the poorhouse, I suppose. Oh, father, said Lucia, while Mary spoke rapidly and in excited tones, I must say, I don't think that is quite fair. We haven't had any company before to speak of in two years, and father talks as though we gave lunches every other day. As for new carpets, we had to have that one. The company had nothing to do with it. Three pieces of china to replace broken ones, and a half dozen plated spoons, was every article that we bought on account of the company, and we had to manage in a way that will humiliate us forever, in order to get along without the things which with other people are matters of course. I am sure I do not want any more company." I thought today if I lived through the humiliation of this attempt, I would never ask to make another. Hereafter, I am going to decline all invitations, to be spared the mortification of never being able to return courtesies. Mary, said her mother, as soon as her voice could be heard. Mary, hush, you forget yourself. But Mr. Cameron had already attained to the self-control which he usually had. I am hard on you, I suppose, he said wearily. I am harassed to the point of despair in many ways. I know you have to do without many things that others have, and it humiliates me that it is so. But I do not know how to help it. I do my best. I must write to Eunice, I suppose, that we have no place for her. If she cannot find a home among any of her old acquaintances and work for her board, she must go— where shall I say? The sudden revulsion of feeling in his family, if he had not been accustomed to it, would have astonished him. Oh, father, Lucia said, you wouldn't do that. Father, said Emily, that would be perfectly dreadful. Why, she is our own auntie. Among the girls, poor Mary was the only silent one. She was struggling to keep back a rush of tears, and could have spoken no word whatever had happened. Nor were the tears pushing their way for her own sake. She was already utterly miserable because of the way in which she had spoken to her father. 
she had not meant to censure him. She was often so grieved for his embarrassments as to lie awake at night wondering what could be done. It was terrible in her to add to his burden by speaking as she had. Mrs. Cameron glanced at her and was sorry for her. I don't see, Edward, what is to be gained by talking in that way. The girls do not mean to complain. They are generally very patient, I am sure. Mary has, of her own accord, given up things which she was to have in order to save expense. As for Eunice going to the poorhouse, that is nonsense. She will come here, of course, if there is no other way. We shall manage it somehow. Of course, said Lucia quickly. Mary and I wouldn't think of having anything else done, would we, Mary? She can have the room that Rod and Mac were to have. They won't be home until the holidays, and some way can be planned for them. And I can leave school now, certainly, chimed in Emily, triumph in her voice. If I give up my music, it will save thirty dollars a term. I think it is dreadful to spend so much money just on piano lessons. Thirty dollars is worth saving, isn't it, father? But even this offer could not lighten the harassed father's burden. Perhaps he realized better than, in the excitement of the moment, any of the others did, what a burden he was about to add to the family through his maiden sister. Still, what else was to be done? It was hard on a man if he could not make room in his home for his only sister. After the first exclamations, they had all known how it would end. Not a Cameron among them would have had the father do other than write by the morning's mail to Aunt Eunice to come to them as soon as she could make arrangements to do so. Nevertheless, they left the dinner table that evening so overwhelmed with this new calamity as to almost forget even the trials of the lunch party. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of What They Couldn't by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four O Wad Some Power. O Wad Some Power, the gifty gee us to see ourselves as ithers see us. That last sentence does not apply to Mary. Aunt Eunice's coming was dreadful enough, but it could not overshadow the miseries of that humiliating luncheon. When the hated dishes were fairly out of sight for the night, the girl threw a light wrap about her and went out to the side porch to be alone with her gloomy thoughts. The evening was crisp even for October, so much so that Lucia called after her that if she was going to moon out there, she would better put on a heavier shawl. She vouchsafed no reply to this and felt sure that the light wrap which she had chosen would be all sufficient. To be sure, her hands were cold, she could feel that they were like ice, but her head was hot and throbbing, and to get where it was cool and still and dark had become her necessity. Let it not be supposed that Mary Cameron was so weak a young woman as to have worked herself into the state of misery over the annoyances and embarrassments attendant upon the day's experience. It was trying, of course, to have had a series of mishaps, and finally an accident, all of which were the evident result of incompetent help and insufficient means. But such possibilities had been taken into consideration when the lunch was planned, and the girl had strength of character to rise above such petty trials after the first excitement was over. There was a deeper cause for her gloom, there had come to her that day a revelation concerning the character of one of her guests, one which, though slight in itself, revealed much to her, and hurt her as she had not before understood that she could be hurt. It was when Betsy lay prone upon the floor, howling, as Emily expressed it, for all she was worth, and the distress of the hostess was at its climax, that Mary's eyes chanced to make a swift journey to the corner where Russell Denham was enjoying himself with a charming young lady at either side. Of course their attention was arrested by the accident, as whose was not, thanks to Betsy's effective voice. 
but it was the look on Russell Denham's face which lingered with Mary and stabbed her. An unmistakable smile disfigured his handsome features. Now it is possible that a man may smile, even under such circumstances, if he have no special interest in the immediate sufferer. Certainly Betsy's appearance and tones had their ludicrous side, and it was not probable that she was very seriously injured. But there are smiles and smiles. This one had in it a hint of a sneer, an amused sneer, it is true, but still a sneer, not so much about Betsy as over the whole miserable attempt at doing things as other people did and failing. At least Mary, though she tried her utmost to do so, could not translate it otherwise. It was almost as though she had heard his voice in amused sarcasm, turning the whole thing into ridicule. In vain she told herself she was unjust, unreasonable, to so translate a passing glance on the face of a man who spoke not a word. But in her inmost heart she felt that the smile was not one which would have lingered on his face had he been in hearty sympathy with the people who were trying to entertain him. The contrast between his manner and that of Mr. Landis, for instance, was sufficiently marked to impress itself upon her. It was of no use to tell herself that Mr. Landis was officious, that it would have been in better taste for him to have kept his seat and appeared not to notice the accident, as other well-bred persons did. Mary Cameron knew that it was not true to her own convictions when she did so. Poor Betsy was, at this moment, blessing the man for his prompt and efficient help. Still, it was folly to contrast the two. Not every young man is an apprentice in a drug store long enough to know how to succor scalded hands. She did not know anything about it, but she presumed this was the case with Mr. Landis. Certainly, she had not expected nor desired Mr. Denham to rush to Betsy's help, but, yes, there came constantly back to her that tantalizing but, it stood for so many things. He had not even said to her the well-bred nothings with which the others had made their adieus. Such a charming time! So sorry that poor girl had to hurt herself! The only mar to a pleasant occasion! A unique lunch party! Russell Denham had said as he extended his hand, and there was still that lurking smile which she hated curving his lips. When Jessie Lee had essayed to express civilly her regret that poor Betsy had suffered, he had said gaily, Oh, we cannot afford to regret that. It added a touch of uniqueness to the whole. I assure you she looked quite picturesque reclining there. It was after the manner of an eastern salaam and he laughed again, while his sister added, "'There was an eastern howl, at least. Wasn't she terrific, Miss Cameron? I know by the strength of her lungs that she could not be fatally injured.' It had all been hateful. It was not so much the words as the undefined, subtle something behind them which Mary Cameron felt, the something which made her ask herself now, as she threw back even her small wrap and let the night wind blow about her throbbing temples, what Russell Denham had meant by the attentions he had lavished upon her during the past two months. Why had he several times in a marked manner singled her out from others, and given exclusive thought, apparently to her, since he could wear that smile and speak those indifferent words when he must have known she was suffering humiliation? Only a night or two ago he had said to her, To think that I have been lingering here for more than seven weeks, when I half expected to limit my stay to as many days. I am afraid you do not understand who is to blame for this dereliction from duty. And he had looked at her in such a way that she could not but understand that he was casting the sweet blame upon her. Then immediately he had added, I confess that they are the shortest seven weeks of my life, but perhaps they have seemed long to you, sometimes I fear so. She had been on the eve of confessing that they did not, that she had enjoyed them more than she was wont to enjoy the society of her friends, but that irrepressible Emily, who was always where she ought not to be, 
had burst in upon them at that moment with some gay news gleaned from the girls and they too had chatted together constantly thereafter so there was no opportunity for reply as she thought of it now was she glad or sorry that she had not told him she had enjoyed the weeks what might he not have said in reply but then if he meant none of it and could he have meant anything and have smiled and sneered as he did to-day the blood seemed to roll in waves over her face as she wondered if he had insulted her by saying soft nothings to her he was not a boy to play at offering special attentions as some idiotic boys might do just to see if they knew how to use the language of their elders true he was on the eve of a return to college but it was for a postgraduate course and taken because he was fond of study and had abundant means and abundant leisure he was twenty-six she had discovered it when they were comparing dates in regard to certain past experiences why i was at that very concert he had said in almost boyish delight i remember it was my twenty-fourth birthday and i indulged myself in a rare musical treat in order to celebrate the event to think that you were in the same row of boxes and i never knew it how shall i account for such unparalleled stupidity on my part even while she laughed gleefully over his pretended disgust at not recognizing a person of whom he had never even heard she had felt at her heart a little thrill of satisfaction then he was twenty-six years old now and she had but passed her twenty-fourth birthday an eminently proper age were they for being intimate friends even the most intimate he seemed younger than that she had thought him possibly a trifle younger than herself and had caught herself wondering whether people would discover it some day and make unpleasant remarks thereupon no they were neither of them young simpletons playing at life it made the pain all the sharper for mary cameron to remember this she had not been a girl who was especially fond of the society of young men she had almost no intimate friendships with them lucia was inclined to have at least half a dozen very good friends among the boys friends with whom she corresponded in a happy-go-lucky sort of way writing when she felt like it and when she did not letting weeks even months slip by with an occasional statement that she supposed she ought to answer charlie's letter or she was afraid dick would think she had forgotten how to write but mary had not interested herself enough in any of their acquaintances to write to them save when business or some courtesy called for it she had often wondered whether she were different from other girls why they cared some of them so much for the attentions of the young men of their set and whether she ever should care in the least about these things perhaps her very indifference heretofore made the sting deeper when she discovered that she had grown to have a feeling which to say the least was not indifference for this young man who could smile when she was troubled and who was going away to-morrow and had left her that day with a genial well i suppose this is good-bye you will hardly allow me to call in the morning since i must leave at twelve the eastern princess will demand some of your mourning perhaps i shall not soon forget my pleasant visit to your city did he really mean that that was good-bye she had thought that even letter-writing of which she was not fond as her brothers could testify would be pleasant if the letters were to be addressed to him but he made no mention of letters although when he offered to mail for her one evening a letter to her brother he had glanced at the address and said has it become natural for you to address letters to the university so that your friends who beg for them one of these days will not have to wait for you to get in the habit of it she had laughed in reply and also blushed as she remembered that his postgraduate course was to be taken at the university where her brothers were after that she had expected to be asked to correspond with him and had gone over in her mind the reply she would make she blushed under cover of the darkness as she thought of it now 
aside from the fact that her interest in this man had been unusual from the first and had steadily increased with acquaintance it was humiliating to have it seem as though her friendship had been trifled with in truth she did not admit it after a little it suggested itself and she put it away as unworthy of her and of him no opportunity had offered itself for him to say the words he meant to say that ridiculous affair of betsy and the chocolate had made it impossible to plan for any real conversation afterwards then emily was at hand of course she always was when she was not desired girls of fifteen ought to be sent to boarding school until they could learn common sense and good manners mr denham would call in the morning despite his hint to the contrary she had not told him he could not from nine until twelve was ample time for a call provided he wished to make it or even if he should be detained from that he could write she had not told him she would not address letters to him it was foolish for her to condemn him as a trifler merely because he had laughed when she did not feel like it the quiet and coolness of the front porch suggested this train of thought was it fortunate or otherwise that she could not hear a conversation which was taking place at this moment at the extreme upper end of durand avenue russell denham was taking his sister home from an evening visit and the two were discussing the luncheon party after a moment's silence the young man broke forth afresh prefacing his sentence with a light laugh what a ridiculous tableau that whole thing made the howling girl with chocolate pouring serenely over her the faces of the guests and above all the faces of our hostess and her two older daughters it would have been more humane not to have laughed but really i don't see how a fellow was to prevent it the whole thing matched somehow matched what russell why the effort at style and elegance and the effort to appear at ease when the entire family were undoubtedly far from ease one could see that affairs were in jeopardy all the while miss cameron conversed with one eye on the kitchen door so to speak even before the luncheon was announced and even that rollicking miss lucia was subdued and nervous yet the camerons are used to good society and always have been we have met them everywhere they are more used to going than to entertaining evidently said her brother the question is why could they not have been content with an effort that was within their means and in correspondence with their surroundings a man would have known better than to place himself in a position where such embarrassments as they labored under were possible fancy waiting ten minutes by the clock for an extra spoon for the coffee whereupon he laughed again do you know said his sister that you relieve my mind immensely i really thought or feared until to-day that you had a very special interest in miss mary cameron i am sure you have shown her more attention than is your habit and it seemed to me several times that i joined you when you were on the verge of a conversation which might end dangerously mr denham did not laugh this time instead he was silent for several seconds then he said in a changed tone to be entirely frank with you miss cameron has interested me more than young women generally do possibly had i not been strangely interrupted more than once i might have said something which would need to be repented of i have not been entirely sure of my own mind at any time but i thought perhaps on a closer acquaintance i should grow to be i will confess that the farce we have been through to-day opened my eyes somewhat to her true character and well to speak plainly frightened me it is a very little thing you think to accomplish so serious a result but look at it the camerons are poor much poorer even than we are and you know very well that at home we never indulge in this sort of thing the father is working on a salary not a very large one either and just at this time he is decidedly embarrassed young holcomb was speaking of it to-day 
he told me that mr cameron has asked the hosmers twice lately for an extension of time he looks harassed and worn under such circumstances his daughters might be excused from entertaining guests one would think or if they considered that impossible why not as i said have given us a simple cup of chocolate and a biscuit or cracker or whatever you call those little things which people serve their dishes would have gone around for such an entertainment which they manifestly did not for this spread i frankly confess i was disgusted with the whole thing i could not help realizing that in my mother's house nothing like it could ever have occurred i hate to see people undertake what they cannot carry out i own it is queer that it should have given me such a revulsion of feeling as it did but i came away from there telling myself that i could not afford to be interested in a girl like that my income would never justify it any one who tries to make a dollar look to her friends as though it was ten dollars and she had plenty more in reserve i am afraid of yet you have the name of being very lavish with your money russell that mr stewart who sat beside me at table hinted that you were a subject of envy on that account among his gentlemen friends oh that is because i have arrived at the age when a man is generally in business for himself and am still studying i cannot go around the country telling every one to whom i am introduced that what money i have is bestowed upon me by the most eccentric of uncles who made it impossible for me to use another penny after my education is completed and that i am hard at work planning ways and means to get a living after i have secured as good an education as the money will give professor landis whom we met to-day and whom by the way i like better than any of the other fellows told me i was right in believing that it would make a great difference with my prospects as a teacher if i took a thorough postgraduate course i grant you that thanks to my whimsical uncle i am sailing under what might be considered false colors but i am doing it honestly and mean to tell the exact truth to whomever is intimate enough with me to have a right to it i thought i should have told miss cameron before this but i have decided that i probably never shall well but russell are you not a little severe i am not fond of mary cameron but i ought to want justice done her perhaps she is just the creature of circumstance the lavish effort at expenditure to-day may not have been in accordance with her ideas or wishes all mothers are not like ours and although she is the eldest daughter younger ones sometimes have more weight in the home than their elders no said her brother emphatically i have been all over that ground mary cameron was the moving spirit there to-day the anxious way in which her mother's eyes constantly sought hers to see if things were going to her mind and her deprecating manner in which she appealed to her when they went wrong would have been pitiful if it had not been exasperating it told the entire story i could fancy mary getting into a storm of determination to carry her point regardless of results she is not a meek and quiet spirit in fact i thought she had an independent spirit at first and admired it but instead she is one of those who must ape society ways of doing things whether they be reasonable ways or not even though she adds to her father's burdens as the smallest expenditures must at present to have a social hour with her friends and give them pleasure was not her aim to-day but to show the overmans and westbrooks who are worth hundreds of thousands that she can make as expensive a spread as they can and even that failed you see she could not do it no i am quite decided that i was mistaken in her character and that my expectations which at present are represented by zero will not admit of my further cultivating her friendship his sister laughed cheerily your tone as well as words show that you do not care the impression which she made has evidently not been a very serious one i am glad of it as i said i have not been drawn to her 
and it is a great comfort to think that I need not oblige myself to like her for your sake. But I hope the poor girl has not become too much interested in you for her peace of mind. Oh, not at all, her brother said quickly. Miss Cameron's weaknesses do not lie in that direction, and of course I have not made my possible thoughts concerning her plain to her. I think she likes me very well, and might have learned to like me better perhaps, but that is over. Nevertheless, as he left his sister at the door of the library with her girl friends, and went on up to his room, he sighed and said to himself, Nettie knows very little about it after all. Mary Cameron came nearer to touching my life than I supposed any woman could. Hi-ho, trifles light as air accomplish strange results sometimes. Who would have supposed that a luncheon party, got up regardless of expense, and calculated to impress us with a sense of position in life, would have had such a peculiar effect on me. I wish I had gone to Boston yesterday as I ought, instead of lingering here purely for the sake of having another visit with her. Then I might have, or no, of course I don't wish that, because then I should have, do I wish it, I wonder? Oh, get out of the way, I don't want you at least." The very last sentence was addressed to the cat, who came purring about him ready to be played with. With regret be it stated that he kicked her, not seriously, but unmistakably. Assuredly, Russell Denham was in ill humor. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of What They Couldn't by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five In the Gloom. The twilight deepened, and the evening grew more chill. Mrs. Cameron put her head out of the door once and said, "Mary, I think you are imprudent. It is really quite cold." Still the girl lingered. She was not crying, she had no desire to cry but it seemed to her that she could not go into that well-lighted sitting-room and listen to Emily's chatter about the guests and the luncheon and Aunt Eunice. Neither could she go to her own room, for Lucia would be sure to follow quite soon, and there would be her tongue to endure. If Lucia said anything about Russell Denham tonight, she did not know what would become of her. She could not endure the thought of the family wondering that he did not come for a farewell call, or asking if he meant to call in the morning. A quick, firm step sounded on the pavement. There had been many since she stood there, but there is a difference in footsteps. These demanded attention. They grew slower as they neared the little gate which shut her in from the street. They lingered at the gate, and the clear voice said, "'Good evening.' For a moment Mary Cameron's heart had seemed to stand still, could this be he, come after all, to tell her good-bye? Then it went on again, in dull thuds. It was only their next-door neighbor, or, as Lucia expressed it, the one who lived almost in the same house. "'Good evening,' he said, and his hand was on the little gate, although his own gate was just the other side of it. "'Are you enjoying the darkness and stillness? Isn't there a restful hush over the world to-night?' I think I like dark nights almost better than moonlight ones. At least they certainly have their charm. He had come up the steps as he spoke, but Mary had no words for him about the beauty of the night. She wished he would go away and leave her alone. I have not mistaken the house, he said, and she could feel that he was smiling. Although they are so close and so exactly alike that one might readily do so. Do you like twin houses, Miss Cameron? No, she said coldly. I don't think I like twin anything. It seems to me that houses and people would do better not so close. She made a mental reservation in favor of Lucia and McCloyd, who were twins, though she found herself thinking that even they would be better friends if they were not in some respects so much alike. I think I agree with you in the main at least about houses. 
it is the misfortune of the city that it forces itself upon its neighbors, leaving no green and quiet spaces between. The girl had absolutely no words for him. She did not mean to be ungracious, or rather, she did not mean to show her ungraciousness. She had said too many sharp words to Lucia about this man, and he was too distinctly associated with her day's mortifications to be other than disagreeable to her now. She had even sneered at his profession. I presume he teaches spelling and arithmetic in one of the ward schools, and therefore expects to be dubbed professor on all possible occasions. Those small teachers are always jealous of titles. This she had said, not having any knowledge of his position or desires, but simply on general principles, and because she felt at the time like saying something disagreeable. Lucia seemed to her to have taken up those strangers in an unaccountable manner. What if they did rush in and have all the family come over for a cup of tea the evening they arrived at their new home, belated and damp from the dreary autumnal rain, and very weary? It was kind, of course. Who denied it? But the very act showed their country breeding. People in cities did not offer strangers who moved next door to them cups of tea but people in cities are supposed to know how to treat their callers, and it was no part of Mary Cameron's intention to be rude to the young man who had stopped in a friendly way to speak to her. She simply could not think of a civil commonplace to say. He relieved her embarrassment. I had it in mind to ask a question or two today, had the opportunity offered. My sister and I are comparative strangers in the city, you know, and I believe you are old residents. Some of the churches near us have been closed since our coming. What can you tell us concerning them? Is there one where we are needed? I haven't the least idea, said Miss Cameron promptly, glad of a subject upon which she could speak glibly. We have no more knowledge of this part of the town than entire strangers have. Our own church is away uptown at Fountain Square." but you do not expect to continue your connection with that church now that you have come to this part of the town, I presume? Why not? We have not thought of such a thing as making a change in that respect. We are sufficiently homesick now without adding to it unnecessarily. I beg pardon. I had supposed the distance would be an objection. Oh, not at all. The cable takes us quite to the doors. It connects with the Central Avenue one, you know. Then, feeling that the occasion demanded so much courtesy from her, she added with an attempt at graciousness, If you and your sister are fond of good music, you will hear none finer in the city than at the Fountain Square Church. They spend thousands of dollars every year on their choir. They are also quite attentive to strangers, have pews set apart for their use. You might like to go there evenings occasionally. No, he said quietly, I think we will find our corner nearer home. There is a little church on Smith Street, just out of Durand Avenue, which interests us. The pastor is absent, in attendance upon his father who is ill, I understand, but the people are very cordial. If it shall prove that we are as much pleased with the pastor as with his flock, I think we shall decide for that church. To tell you the truth, we had hoped that you would join us there. The church evidently needs help, and affords a splendid opportunity for work. They have a Christian Endeavor Society, which could be made a power in the neighborhood. Mary Cameron received a fresh ascension of dignity. The man actually wanted to patronize them, and get them into that little hive on Smith Street, which already swarmed with people, judging from the crowds of children who blocked the streets on Sunday mornings, surging out of their Sunday school. We haven't the slightest idea of making any change, as I said, she replied coldly, and she wished he would go home. It was growing chilly, she began to realize it. Did he expect her to invite him into a family chat? She did not mean to do it. Certainly she was not going to show him to the parlor and undertake to entertain him, and it would hardly do to call Lucia to the task and then vanish. Why could he not see that she wanted to be alone, 
even though she came to the front doorsteps to secure the opportunity. He seemed to have no idea of going. He leaned against the railing which separated his home from theirs, and looked up at the faraway stars in silence for a moment, then said suddenly, "'Miss Cameron, do you ever feel—I hardly know how to express it— perhaps I will say homesick for a visit with Jesus Christ, not for communion with him through prayer, of course that is always open to us. Isn't it wonderful, by the way, that it is? Suppose we had to wait for times and occasions. Suppose, for instance, you and I could not speak to him tonight, no matter how great our need, but must wait until tomorrow or next week or next month for a certain date to arrive why one would hardly dare to live. But I am not speaking of that which is already ours, I mean a real human longing for the visible presence of my friend Jesus, the desire to clasp his hand, and hear his voice, and walk with him, perhaps arm in arm, down the busy streets, and converse with him as friend to friend. Do you ever have such desires, so strong that they seem to fairly clamor for satisfaction? Miss Cameron was very much startled. Was her next neighbor a lunatic? What a strange, irreverent way to speak of Christ! Certainly she never had such desires. On the contrary, the very suggestion of them made her feel afraid. It would be to her a terrible thing to meet face to face with Jesus Christ. She did not think people ought to talk in that way. Nobody did who was entirely sane, she believed. I don't think I understand you very well, she said hesitatingly, and her hand was on the doorknob. She had thrown off the night latch when she came out. The utmost she wanted now was to get in, out of reach of the voice of this strange man. He took his eyes away from the stars and looked at her. I beg your pardon, he said, recognizing the tremor in her voice. I was simply thinking aloud, as I do sometimes with my sister Dorothy, and I thought, too, to be entirely frank, that your face today had a look of unrest, as though you needed the familiar companionship of which I speak, and longed for it. Do you not think we keep our intimate friend too far away, and forget that he is interested in the various trifle that pleases or disturbs us? That is why I sometimes fancy, in my folly, that it would be better if we could see him for a little, and clasp hands with him, even though he had to go away again to-morrow. I am afraid I have always envied the disciples. I could bear the sight of the cloud, I think, which received him, if only I could have had three years, yes, even three days, a visible presence to remember for ever. Which shows, by the way, what poor, selfish creatures we are, while I was enjoying his companionship, what would my brethren only a few miles away do without him? And, as he has arranged it, we have him always, each of us, if only we could realize it. Miss Cameron had never been so uncomfortable in her life. Never, in all the twenty-four years she had lived, had she heard from mortal lips such sentences as these. Christians she had met, of course, she hoped they were none of them heathen. But the Christians she knew had common sense, and did not rave in the darkness about impossible and really terrible ideas. At any risk she must get away from him. If he thought her rude, she could not help it. "'I think I must go in now,' she said hurriedly. "'It is growing very chilly. Do you—will you—come inside?' She hesitated and stammered over the simple invitation, in great fear lest he should accept it. He could not resist a smile in the darkness at her expense, it was so evident that she wanted to be rid of him. He made his adieus with all speed after that, and Mary Cameron returned to the family room to be stormed with questions. What was she doing out there in the darkness so long? Wasn't she chilled through? It was the coldest evening they had had. Tomorrow she would have a stiff neck and a sore throat and wonder where she took cold. Who was out there with her? Surely they heard voices. I know, said Emily, the irrepressible. It was Mr. Denham come back to say good-bye. 
I knew he would find his way around here again. It would have saved him lots of car fare if he had stayed when he was here. Why in the world didn't you come into the parlor? It is lighted and deserted. I should think it would have been a great deal pleasanter than out there in the dark and cold. Was Mr. Denham there, Mary? the mother asked. She spoke gently, yet with an undertone of curiousness in her voice, yes, and of satisfaction. The poor, sore-hearted girl resented it all. They would be glad to be rid of her. They were watching to see what possible chances there might be to that end. They had discussed her prospects and hopes, probably, while she was out there in the darkness and loneliness. She could not bear it. No, she said, her voice high-keyed. He was not. Why should you think he would be? Is it possible I cannot be out of the room a few minutes without having my affairs discussed and my actions commented upon? I think Emily ought to be taught not to meddle with matters which do not in the least concern her. My patience, said Emily. Did anyone ever see a crosser creature? If Mr. Denham knew what he was about, he would take care how he had anything more to do with you. I think somebody ought to warn him. Emily, said the mother in great severity, I am ashamed of you. How can you be so disagreeable? Apologize to your sister at once. But the sister had fled. She wanted no apology. She wanted only to get away out of sight, where she might pour out her heart's pain undisturbed. It was hard enough to be left in solitude on this evening which she had thought would be made bright with the companionship of one who sought her company above all others. It was horrible to be made the gazing stock of even her own family. She overrated the state of things, of course. The oversensitive always do. The merest passing mention had been made of her fondness for the front porch that evening, then the family had returned to the all-absorbing theme of Aunt Eunice. There was need for planning if she was to become for any length of time a member of their family. Mary and Lucia shared each other's room, not because of any special fondness upon their part for each other's society, but because space had been scarce. In the other house there had been a tiny room, or what they had called such, in point of fact it was only a good-sized closet opening out of Mrs. Cameron's room, which had been declared to be just the thing for Emily. She had rebelled a little, had said it was nothing but a clothes press, and she was tired of being tucked away anywhere, and she was old enough, she should think, to have a decent room, and what was the use of their keeping a spare chamber always in immaculate order, with the best things in the house in it, for nobody to use? she was sure they rarely had company. But at the same time there had been enough of the child about her to be secretly glad that mother's room opened into her closet, and that on dark nights when the wind blew she had only to listen to hear her father's regular breathing. There were times when it gave her a delightful sense of security, and made her even take the closet's part, when Mary occasionally argued the propriety of her taking the spare room to herself and letting Lucia and Emily share the other. That this had never been done was because that guest chamber, with its well-bred air of being always ready, was really dear to Mary's heart. But the Durand Avenue house had no convenient closet, and it had distinctively one less room to plan with, and Rachel was coming home. This gave to Emily, for a time at least, the luxury of a whole room to herself, as she delightedly expressed it. For to Mary, the well-understood peculiarities of Lucia were more endurable than the unknown possibilities of Rachel, and she distinctly refused to share a room with the latter. Now the question was, what should be done with Aunt Eunice? Should they put her with Emily? thus giving her tacitly to understand that they had no guest chamber and were incommoding themselves to receive her? They discussed this carefully, the mother and Lucia giving little heed to Emily's groans the while. She was still regarded as a child who must do as she was told. Rachel was not coming for at least six weeks yet, and who knew what might happen in that length of time? 
but there were objections to the plan. Mrs. Cameron did not quite like to voice them. In her heart, she said, if anything should happen that Rachel did not come as soon as she was expected, and a girl who was away in California with cousins might have occasion to change her mind, then Aunt Eunice would be settled with them, and feel that she was not in any one's way. If, on the contrary, they should give her the boys' room, always referring to it as such, when the Christmas holidays began to draw near, it would be apparent to every reasonable creature that there was no place for Aunt Eunice. They could hardly be expected to turn their own sons out of the house in order to make room for their father's sister. Mrs. Cameron said this over to her own heart, in order to arouse the proper feeling of indignation. But she found that she did not like to present the argument about rooms aloud, even to Lucia so she presented the great discomfort there would be to a middle-aged woman in having a young, careless girl like Emily always with her. It would really be inhospitable. "'And the great discomfort it would be to me!' Emily chimed in. "'You don't any of you think of that!' These sentences had been interspersed with wishes from the mother that Mary would not stay out in the chilly air so long, and occasional wonderings from Emily as to who was out there with her. Mother and daughter had both laughed at Emily's pathetic reference to herself, which was often the only reply the girl received, and then Mary had come in from the porch and concocted out of nothing, as has been shown, her theory of having been discussed all the time she had been away. Young Landis, not finding his sister Dorothy visible anywhere, went from his neighbor's porch to his room, and sat down to consider what had been said. He looked grave and disappointed over it. I did her no good, he thought, not the least in the world. The poor creature carries unrest and dissatisfaction written on her face, so that he who runs may read. How very plain it is that she is not acquainted with him whom to know aright is peace, and I did not help her. Instead of being plain and direct in what I had to say, I went off on some ideas of my own, which she did not understand any more than if I had spoken Sanskrit. I might have known that she wouldn't. I actually frightened her. To think of Jesus Christ as a personal presence is a terror to her. How few there are who seem to know him aright. I wonder if he feels it, as we feel the indifference, the positive slight, of those with whom we would be friends. Think of him stooping to win us by every gentle, tender word in our language, and we indifferent. Sometimes it passes belief that he can endure this sort of thing much longer. Sometimes it is the strongest mark of divinity which I recognize, that he does so endure through the ages." Fancy a young woman having so little to occupy her precious Sabbath time that she is willing to spend two hours, to say the least, in going and returning from Fountain Square, in company with crowds of Sabbath breakers bent on reaching a like locality for a different reason from hers. Though, when one thinks of it, her reasons for going seem not to be very definite. She does not impress one as deeply attached to her church." it would almost seem as though she sought it because it was located at Fountain Square. Now, Brother Landis, that is a charitable conclusion. No doubt she does feel at home there, and desolate here. Apparently I am not the one to help her into a happier frame of mind. And he laughed outright over the girl's manifest desire to be rid of him. I ought to have let my sweet little Saint Dorothy undertake that task but the girl looked so utterly miserable today. I wonder what it is. Certainly the accident, awkward as it was, cannot account for such unhappiness. Ah, well, I cannot carry my neighbor's burdens, but I confess to an unusual desire to help this girl. Perhaps it is because she seems in such dire need of help. I wonder if the people who are striving after a place and name in this world, and failing to reach them, are not more to be pitied than the people who are content down where they are. That is a question in social ethics to consider. To answer it in the affirmative, 
would upset all the theories of philanthropists the world over. Oh, the world! When will it learn what it needs? End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of What They Couldn't by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Isn't she a terror? Aunt Eunice was duly watched for and met at the station, met several times, in fact, by anticipation and at various depots. On two occasions, Mr. Cameron lost his lunch entirely in order to be in time for a train on which it was thought she might arrive and after all this she came at an hour when she was not expected rattled up to the door near midnight in a cab and made her voice distinct to all the anxious ears which were hovering about upper windows while she had a parley with the driver about the unreasonable sum which he wished to charge her because it was characteristic of aunt eunice it shall be mentioned here that he did not receive the fare he called for but this beginning did not prepossess the Camerons in her favour. "'Listen to her!' exclaimed Emily, with a very distinct gurgle of laughter. "'She is telling him that he ought to be published in all the papers, and that he will find he has tried to cheat the wrong woman this time.' Emily was the only one who laughed. Mary was indignant. "'Why doesn't the creature come in and let father attend to the cabman?' she inquired angrily of no one in particular. It isn't enough for her to appear at an unearthly hour of the night, after being waited for at every depot in town, but she must arouse the neighborhood with her tongue. Father, said Emily with another giggle, he stands at one side vanquished. She has already told him to go away and let her alone. That she knows how to manage a cabman, she guesses, if she doesn't, he can't teach her. "'Do let us go back to bed,' said Lucia, shivering under the light wrapper she had hastily thrown about her when the bell rang. "'If I had imagined it was she ringing so furiously, I would have stayed there in the first place. I thought of Mac and Rod and a telegram. We can survive until morning without seeing her, I think. Emily, come away from the window and close it.' you would laugh if a madman were out there instead of a mad woman i am going down said emily dashing into her own room to make a rapid toilet mother may need some help in looking after her she is in such a belligerent frame of mind perhaps this too was characteristic it was often emily who went down to give mother a little help in emergencies to be sure she got no credit for it with the family Emily's curiosity, they said, would take her out of bed, into the most disagreeable places, if there were anything new to be seen. But the mother or Betsy often had the benefit of snatches of help from her. It was a cold morning, cold enough to make everyone realize that November had come and meant to be severe and surly. The Camerons were in the sitting room, variously employed. Mrs. Cameron was busy with a roll of garments which had arrived by mail from the boys. They did not know what was the matter with them, Mac wrote, except that they seemed to need mother. "'If they were my boys,' said Aunt Eunice, gazing with severe eyes on yawning rents in the garment being held up for inspection, "'they would know what was the matter and get a lesson to remember into the bargain. Things don't tear like that unless they have awful jerks getting them off. Boys ought to learn how to take off their clothes decently before they go away from home. All boys are careless sometimes, I suppose, said Mrs. Cameron coldly. She had been known to tell her sons that never were there two such careless creatures born, she verily believed, but she was not pleased to have such an idea even hinted at by another. Yes, said Aunt Eunice grimly and that is the way to make them so. From the time they get on roundabout jackets until they are married and have families of their own to look after, they hear it everlastingly said that boys must be boys, and boys are born heedless, and all that sort of thing, 
until they get a notion that they are of no account unless they pull and haul and tear around like wild animals, and destroy more things than they use. I haven't any patience with that kind of bringing up. "'Aunt Eunice, how many boys have you brought up?' asked Lucia, looking up from the cow she was carefully daubing into her painting. Aunt Eunice's sallow face grew suddenly red as she replied, "'I haven't brought up any, as I suppose you know very well without my telling. But I was brought up to be respectful to my elders, which is more, I should think, than can be said of some.' "'Lucia,' said Mrs. Cameron, warning and distress in her voice, but Lucia's only reply was, "'Dear me, mother, I only asked a question.' "'Mother,' said Emily, rushing into the room from the outside world somewhere, and speaking eagerly. In fact, Emily Cameron generally rushed to and from all places, and always spoke eagerly. "'Mother, the class begins tonight, and I haven't got my ticket or shoes or anything. Can't I see about them right away?' "'I must have a talk with your father first, Emily,' said Mrs. Cameron, looking more distressed. "'I haven't had a moment when I could mention it.' "'But, mother, I tell you, they begin tonight. If I lose the first lesson, I might as well lose the whole, and they will all be ahead of me.' "'Then you would better lose the first lesson,' said Mary, quickly. "'I don't see how father can afford the money for that class this fall.' "'Now, Mary Cameron, you only say that to be hateful. You know you told mother you thought I might better give up my music than my dancing lessons.' "'Dancing lessons!' repeated Aunt Eunice in impressive tones. "'A granddaughter of Daniel Cameron! Well, well, what next, I wonder?' "'Emily,' said Mrs. Cameron, with decision, I wish you to let that subject entirely alone until I can talk with your father. I thought you had more sense. She shot an annoyed glance in the direction of the newcomer as she spoke, and Emily, who had forgotten her in the excitement of the moment, went slowly from the room murmuring something which it is thought was not complimentary to Aunt Eunice. That person knitted hard and fast on a stern gray sock she was fashioning, and did not speak for several minutes. Then she addressed Mary, who was sewing braid in elaborate design on something white and silky. "'What is that you are making?' Mary explained that it was a new front to wear with an old dress to brighten it up. "'Humph! I should think it would disfigure it, putting beads on in all sorts of shapes, exactly as the squaws do. They used to come to our back door by the dozens, rigged up in beadwork, but I did not know that civilized women copied their fashions. I should think you were too old to wear such things. Here Lucia laid down her paintbrush to laugh immoderately. I'm not seventy yet, said Mary, bestowing an indignant glance on Lucia. No, but you are twenty-four years and two months. I kept a record of my brother's children in my Bible, and I know to a day how old each one is. It seems to me that a young woman who has reached your age shouldn't waste her time on such follies. What do you do with all your time? Do you teach or what? This last question was evidently addressed to Lucia and had reference to her painting. What, I guess, she answered, laughing, and added, no, ma'am, I never had the misfortune to be obliged to teach anybody. I paint for my own amusement. Humph! I hope you find yourself amused. That cow you are making don't look any more like a cow to me than it does like a rooster, and I have been brought up with both of them all my life. Our minister used to say that he thought people ought not to spend time painting pictures unless they could make money by it, or had a special genius in that direction. I shouldn't think you have the genius if I am any judge. People do not usually put on spectacles and move as close to oil paintings as they can get in order to judge of their merit, said Lucia, trying to defend her cow. They have to be viewed at a distance. I should think likely, and the greater the distance, the better the view. Why don't you two young women go to work and earn some money for your father? 
he says he has hard times to make ends meet, and I don't wonder, I am sure. Before I was Mary's age, I had earned two hundred dollars from my father, teaching in district schools and boarding around. I worked, I tell you. I hadn't any time to waste on sewing beads to wear around my neck. And as for Lucy... My name is Lucia, Aunt Eunice, interposed that young woman. Oh, well, Lucia, then. I don't see any sense in such a name. Plain Lucy used to be good enough for your ancestors. You were named after your Aunt Lucy Edmonds, weren't you? A body would think to read over your names that you had lost all the Y's out of the language down this way. Spelling Emily, E-M-I-L-I-E. -I, -E. I ended it in a good honest Y in the family Bible, and so I did yours. What is Rachel doing? This sudden change of subject was addressed to Mrs. Cameron, who made haste to explain. Why, Rachel, you know, went back with her Aunt Kate six years ago, and has not been home since. Not in six years! No, it seems a long time, doesn't it, to give a child? Edward and I have seen her since, but the children never have. It was a sacrifice, of course, but my sister Kate seemed to need her, and begged for her. She had no daughters of her own. Then, at that time, they could give her advantages which we could not. We let her go only for the winter, we supposed, but in the spring my sister wanted to take her to the mountains, and it seemed an opportunity for the child. During the next winter Kate lost a son, and we couldn't deprive her of Rachel then. In the early spring they went to California for my brother-in-law's health, and after he died, of course Kate needed Rachel more than ever, and they were so far away, too. For one reason and another she kept staying on, until it is now nearly six years. But we are expecting her home very soon. My sister Kate died in the spring, you know. Rachel would have come then, had there been a suitable escort for her. But her cousins wanted her to stay dreadfully. They missed their mother, and felt all broken up. Yes, she is with the cousins. There were two boys. They are both married and have pleasant families, and Rachel is naturally attached to them. But John, the elder, is coming east in about six weeks, they think, and Rachel is to come home with him. It is a dreadful long time to give up the care of a child, said Aunt Eunice. I don't understand how you could do it. We have to do a good many things which we think we can't said Mrs. Cameron, sewing vigorously on the patch she had set in Mac's garment. My sister Kate was lonely. Both her boys were away at school, and she took the greatest fancy to Rachel and begged for her. And as I had three other daughters and two boys all at home with me, it did seem selfish. "'It is a wonder she did not want one of the older girls,' said Aunt Eunice. I should have thought they would have been of more use to her. Yes, said Lucia. I have often wished she had wanted me. She lived then where there was a fine art school, and I might have learned how to paint a cow. She wanted Rachel and nobody else, said Mrs. Cameron. She had lost a little daughter a year or two before, and she fancied that Rachel looked like her. I suppose that accounts for the great affection she had for her from the first. Did she leave her property to her? Mrs. Cameron shook her head and sighed. She had no property to leave. They used to be in good circumstances, quite wealthy indeed, but my brother-in-law was unfortunate in some way. He speculated, I believe, and lost heavily. Then he was ill for a long time, and they traveled, and used up a great deal of money, so that when he died there was barely enough to support my sister and Rachel during her life. The boys are in good business, but they are young and have growing families, and of course not much to spare. Kate left Rachel the most of her clothes and her watch and such things, but no money, or barely enough to bring her home. She is saving what she had for that purpose." No, we didn't send her away from home to secure a fortune. If we had, our sacrifice would have been in vain. 
as it is she was a great comfort to her aunt all her life and we cannot regret having spared her to her mrs cameron meant every word of this nevertheless it had been a sore trial to her when the brother-in-law lost his money she could not help commenting severely at the time on his folly in allowing himself to get entangled with speculations also she could not help admitting to herself that if it had been mary or lucia who had been chosen with the advantages which her sister kate had offered they were old enough to have profited more by it than rachel had probably done she was only eighteen now it cannot be denied that much as the mother in her wanted to see this member of her flock she had wakeful hours over the problem of how they were to properly clothe another young lady aunt eunice had a way of turning suddenly from one topic to another apparently entirely irrelevant she took one of those flights now where do you go to church the merits of the fountain square church were carefully pointed out to her how far away is it they really did not know it was quite a distance well couldn't they guess it was it half a mile or a mile or two miles what did they mean by quite a distance lucia stayed her brush to count the squares why it must be about four miles for pity's sake they didn't mean that they walked four miles to church walked no indeed who had thought of such a thing well then how did they manage they didn't keep a horse edward told her did they have to do with those precious cabmen like the one who tried to cheat her out of fifty cents why aunt eunice said mary speaking for the first time since she had been compared to a squaw we know you have lived in the country all your life but surely you have heard of horse cars and cable cars and such conveniences oh yes aunt eunice said she had heard of them and travelled in them too but she didn't suppose that respectable people went to meeting in them she knew james used to think they were as sabbath-breaking an institution as he knew anything about once he was offered some stock in them and he wouldn't take it because he said a man who made his money by trampling over the sabbath as they did couldn't prosper that is probably the reason that he died poor said mary aunt eunice's sallow face flushed and her gray eyes flashed no it wasn't any such thing it was because he trusted one of your rich fashionable men too much and got cheated james was always anxious to think that folks were better than they were that was about the biggest fault he had oh we had considerable knowledge of what was going on in the world if we did live out west you are not very well acquainted with the west i guess the electric cars passed our door but we didn't ride in them on sundays here lucia indulged in another laugh why aunt eunice she said that is the queerest idea i ever heard of they are necessities in cities how would people get to church or to sunday school or anywhere without them don't you have any churches within four miles of you oh yes of course but they are not the ones that we want to attend exactly then that isn't necessity it is notion not that there is any argument in what you said however you fix it i suppose if we really couldn't go to church without breaking one of the commandments to do it the lord would contrive to get along somehow without our being there are you two girls church members another startling transition the girls exchanged glances each wishing that the other would answer at last lucia ashamed of the silence admitted that they were not well why aren't you that seems queer business one wouldn't think you were the grandchildren of daniel cameron your father joined the church when he was thirteen years old and a nicer more faithful boy in church and sunday school i don't believe there ever was aren't none of you young folks church members the boys are i should hope mrs cameron felt obliged to answer this no mccloyd and rodney are good boys 
quite as good as some church members I should mention. They have never given us cause for special anxiety, but none of our children have felt called upon to unite with any church. That isn't everything, Eunice. Of course not, whoever thought it was. But it is what one might expect from Daniel Cameron's grandchildren. Edward must have changed a good deal since he was a boy. I hope he doesn't often rush off as he did this morning. Mrs. Cameron could not help a sigh of anxiety as she replied to this last remark. He is nearly always in a hurry. He has to work very hard, too hard for his strength. But we were later than usual this morning. We delayed breakfast in order to let you rest after your journey. I? Goodness! I was up and had my windows open airing my room a full hour before your bell rang. Nobody has me for an excuse for laziness, I can tell you. Perhaps sufficient illustration has been given to suggest the general character of the new inmate of the Cameron family. A stern, strong-minded, rigidly upright, narrow Christian woman, one who for years had carefully repressed anything like tenderness in her disposition, and judged her neighbor rigidly by the rules which she thought she applied to herself. One consequence of her training was that she failed in the very things which she most desired to accomplish. Perhaps above all other interests, she truly desired the advancement of the kingdom of Christ in the world, and perhaps it is not extravagant to say that she never spoke to a person on the subject without antagonizing him or her. It will readily be seen that her effort with the Cameron girls was not one calculated to win. She was not more successful with the father. Edward, what time do you have family worship? You flew off this morning without seeming to remember that there was such a thing but I presume you do not live like heathen always. What is the supposed hour? To tell you the truth, said the much embarrassed man, we have not been having family worship of late years. As the children grew up, they were irregular about getting down to breakfast, and I was always in a hurry, and so, well, the fact is, we dropped it. Dear, dear, said Aunt Eunice, what next, I wonder? and you a son of Daniel Cameron. What would father say, do you suppose? I must say, Edward, I am disappointed. I judged from all I heard about your family that you were not what you used to be, but I did not suppose you had gone back on your early training like that. Isn't she a terror? was Emily's query, as she sought her elder sister's room to relieve her mind. Did you ever realize before what an affliction it was to have Daniel Cameron for a grandfather? Poor father was utterly squelched tonight. I haven't seen him look so miserable since Rod got into his last scrape. I'm going to write to the boys and tell them Aunt Eunice wants to know if they are church members. Whereupon she threw back her head and indulged in a merry laugh. If she is a specimen of the average church member said Mary. I hope I may be kept from ever joining their ranks. Of all the disagreeable meddling old cranks I ever heard of, I think she is the worst. How we are ever to endure her until Christmas, I cannot imagine. And at that very moment, the disagreeable meddling old crank was on her knees, praying earnestly and most sincerely for her brother and his family, that they all might be turned from the error of their ways. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of What They Couldn't by Pansy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 A Peculiar Man Professor Landis was moving about his room, making ready for the day's duties. The university where he was engaged during the day was a long distance from Durand Avenue, making it necessary for him to take lunch downtown, so he must make ready for an all-day's absence. His sister Dorothy, whose hours were earlier than his, had departed in the eight o'clock car, so he was practically alone. This being the case, 
he indulged himself in his favorite pastime of singing as loud as his lungs would permit. As he moved leisurely about, doing little last things, he let his splendid bass voice out in full power, so that it rolled through the quiet house like a trumpet. He was mistaken in supposing that he had no listeners. Said Aunt Eunice, on the other side of the dividing wall, "'Do hear that man roar! It is to be hoped that the rest of the family are deaf and dumb.' "'There is no family,' said Emily, to whom was often left the duty of replying to her Aunt Eunice's remarks." "'You don't mean to say that he lives in that big house all alone?' "'It isn't very big. It is as like ours as two peas in a pod. And his sister lives with him. But she teaches, I guess. Anyway, she goes off early every morning, with her arms full of books. So he is alone, except for the girl in the basement. He often roars around like that. I like it. I think his voice is splendid.' "'And what does he do for a living?' "'Why, he teaches too, somewhere. At least we think so. They call him Professor Landis.' "'Humph! And so he and she live all alone. I suppose they are orphans. I should think it would be cheaper to board, especially as they have to keep a servant. But I suppose they both get good salaries and choose to live it all up. That is the way young folks do nowadays. And when I was a girl, we lived on as little as we could, and saved the rest, or spent it on some of the family who needed our help. Mercy! I don't like his voice. It sounds like distant thunder. Entirely unconscious of criticism, Professor Landis paused long enough to look thoughtfully at a bit of paper, on which was written a couple of names, then placed it in his diary, and began on the last verse of the hymn he loved. If our love were but more simple, we should take him at his word, and our lives would be all sunshine in the sweetness of our Lord. Then, his own preparations completed, came the last thing before leaving the house. This professor of Latin dropped on his knees and prayed, if people who wondered at some of his ways could have heard that prayer, it would have given them a hint of the motive power of his life. It was not a lengthy prayer. Manifestly, the words were spoken by one who was very familiar with the friend whom he addressed. There was no introduction, nothing of the usual formula of prayer. It would have given a listener the impression, which would have been a true one, that the man had prayed before this same morning, and now was only claiming a parting word before he went out into the world. He asked for a special blessing on the scholars who should that day come under his care, that his influence in the class might be such as would some way hint of the leader whose colors he wore. He asked for two or three individually, referring briefly to the reason why they lay so close to his heart, more than that, he asked for the right word to say to any whom he should chance to pass, to and from his duties that day. He remembered those to whom he would have no chance to say a word, and begged that if possible, by look or smile or courtesy of some sort, he might help to make their day brighter and better. In short, he asked to be Christ-like that day. Happy the mother who can send her boy out from home each morning to the care and influence of such a teacher. He is subject to a thousand temptations and strains which she does not and cannot understand. She will never know, perhaps, how much she owes to the influence of the thoroughly consecrated teacher, or that it is because of him that the boy bears the strain. Never mind, God knows." It was the living up to the spirit of such prayers as these which made of Professor Landis a man whom some called peculiar. He had heard the name applied to him, and, while certainly he did not seek to win it, yet he was in no wise disturbed thereby. In truth, he liked the word. As often as he heard it, there came to his heart the memory of the strong old words of promise— now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. 
this young man frankly confessed to his own heart that he coveted for himself that promise. His exalted ambition was to be a peculiar treasure to the Lord Christ. It was the spirit born of intimate companionship with this friend of his, which led him, as he stood on the platform of the crowded streetcar beside the red-faced, gruff-voiced driver, to say pleasantly, "'It is too bad to crowd you so that you cannot have room for your stool. When we get the cable on this line, you will have it easier, will you not?' Humph, the man said. "'More like I won't have it at all. A lot of us fellows will get turned off then.' and have to lie idle for a spell, and live on nothing while we're doing it. That's the way them new-fangled things always work. Perhaps a dozen times before, in the course of the previous two weeks, had this streetcar driver, whose heart was sore over expected trouble for himself and family, made a similar comment concerning the new arrangements which were being watched for eagerly by the passengers. A dozen times had he received either no reply at all, or a good-natured, oh, maybe not, or a half-sneering, you fellows always look on the dark side, don't you? And then a dismissal of himself and his trouble from their minds. But the thirteenth time he mentioned it, Professor Landis was the listener. Is there fear of that? he asked. Then followed question and answer in rapid succession, until the young professor, who had never met the man before, he having been temporarily transferred to that part of the line, knew more about his affairs, it is quite safe to say, than did any of the men for whom he had been working for a year or more. Also, the professor had gotten out a little book, and noted down name and residence, and an item or two about the man's boy, who was ill, and made, in curious little characters which the man could not have read had he been given opportunity, certain suggestions to himself for future use, and then had said, "'The next corner is mine, Mr. Stiver. I'm coming to see that boy of yours on Saturday, if I can. My time is full until then. Meantime, here is my card, and if your fears are realized about being discharged,' bring that card to my address on any day after five o'clock, and I will see what can be done towards getting you work. Now, will you give the boy this little book from me, and will you keep this one yourself, and take a peep into it at some odd moment? The books were not three inches long, either of them. The boys had one or two bright pictures in it, and some cheery words. The man's was a collection of very carefully chosen and most striking Bible verses, which Professor Landis had arranged for his use. The driver, who was known to his portion of the outside world as Number 17, looked after the young man curiously as he sprang from the car and went with rapid strides down the street. "'He's a chap, he is,' he said to himself, as he strained his eyes to see what would become of the strange man. I never hit on his like before. I'm blessed if I don't keep the little book, and take a look into it, too, just for his sake. And he put both of them carefully away with the card which had been offered first. One other incident occurred during the progress of that car downtown, which deserves to be chronicled. Aunt Eunice Cameron was also one of the passengers. She had hailed the car at a crossing between it and another line, and she left soon after Professor Landis did. Now Aunt Eunice was a tract distributor, one of the kind who are, after their fashion, instant in season and out of season, and are always rebuking, reproving, and exhorting the world. As Aunt Eunice brushed past the driver, she said, here, sir, is a tract for you. If you will read it, which I don't suppose you will, it will do you good. You're right there, said Mr. Stiver. I won't read a word of it, nor keep it neither. I know you're kind, and I've got no use for you. Thereupon he threw the meek little leaflet after her. Another specimen was number 17 of the total depravity of mankind. What is the use in trying to do good in the world if this is the result? If people could only be induced to undertake the work that they could do 
instead of being apparently possessed of Satan to be forever dabbling with that which they cannot do. As for sincerity, not Professor Landis himself was more thoroughly in earnest than was Aunt Eunice. That gentleman stayed his steps just at the door of the public library, and held out his hand to a young fellow of perhaps nineteen, unmistakably a country youth, who had not been in town long enough to wear away a certain rusticity of manner. His face this morning wore a gloomy expression, and his heavy eyes told a story which would probably have filled his country mother's heart with anxiety. The face lighted just a little under Professor Landis's cordial greeting. "'Ah, Ben, good morning. I have been hoping I should meet you. We missed you last night.' "'Did you?' said Ben, and he smiled grimly, the look on his face suggesting that he felt tempted to add, "'I don't believe a word of it.' I certainly did, said Professor Landis, moved perhaps by the look to drop the plural form. I was much disappointed. Were you engaged at the store? No, sir. Ben would have liked to say that he was. He hesitated, but the professor waited with those steady, inquiring eyes fixed on him. I went somewhere else, he said at last. To a better place, Ben? The blood crept slowly into the sunburned face. A place where the most of them were better pleased to see me, he said with a slow laugh. Then, after another pause, It is of no use, Professor Landis. I can't feel at home in the places where you want me to go. The folks wear different clothes from mine, and act and talk different. I don't know how to do it, and I don't want to be stared at, nor laughed at, nor patronized. There are places to go where folks aren't so particular, and where some of them at least don't know any more than I do myself. Good places, Ben? Places which you would like to describe in your letters to your mother? Again the red showed plainly on his face, and the answer came slower than before. They are not the worst places in the world, by any means. Some of the boys are real kind, and often there isn't much to find fault with. In the opinion of mothers, do you mean? Ben laughed faintly. Mothers are very particular, he said. Yes, they are. Good mothers always are, and good sons like to honor even their notions. You and I ought to remember that. I have been separated from my mother most of the time for five years, yet I leave undone to this day certain things which I would like well enough to do, and in which I see no danger, because I am sure they would distress my mother. As it is, she feels, I believe, that she can absolutely trust me. The younger man looked up at him with a gleam of appreciation in his eyes. Evidently he admired the character which he made no pretense of imitating. Professor Landis changed his position so that his hand could be rested familiarly on Ben's arm, then he said, in winning tones, "'Ben, my boy, I wish you would make up your mind to be a little more independent.' The boy started and looked puzzled. Clearly, if there was anything on which he prided himself, it was independence. That he was not able, as he expressed it, to hold up his head with the best of them, was the main reason why Professor Landis found it so hard to win him to places where he might have been helped. I mean it, the professor said, smiling. If you were able to rise superior to the question of dress, and to the fact that you, being still quite young, do not know all the customs of society, and determined to mix only with people who could help you in these directions, as well as in some others, and whose acquaintance it would be an honor to have, it would make a radical difference in your life. Oh, said Ben, well now, Professor Landis, that isn't so easy a thing to do as it sounds. You folks who have lived in cities all your lives, and had things, and been to places, and all that, don't know a thing about it. If folks were all like, well, like you, raising his head with a determined air, as though resolved that it must be said, it would make a big difference. But to feel that you are making mistakes all the while, 
and that you don't know what to do with your feet or your hands, and that you haven't got a thing about you which is up to time anyhow, and to hear a giggle every now and then behind your back, and see pretty near a sneer before your eyes, isn't the pleasantest experience in the world, I can tell you. Folks who must go somewhere or freeze aren't to be blamed for choosing decent loafing places instead of such gatherings, I think. Didn't I admit that it was not easy? I said it required independence of spirit above the average. I thoroughly mean it. It is true, I do not think the giggles nor the sneers are by any means so numerous as they seem to you. Although I admit that even in what is called good society, one comes in contact with some underbred people who indulge in both. What I deplore is the fact that Benjamin Reader, a young man whose mother and father depend upon and trust, has not independence of character sufficient to pass these experiences by with the indifference which they deserve, and make the most of his opportunities in spite of them. Last evening, for instance, at the church social, we had some very choice people present, whose acquaintance it is decidedly worth one's while to make. Yet the young man of whom I speak lost the opportunity, and if I am not greatly mistaken, spent the evening in a way which he will not describe to his mother when he writes that long letter for which she waits. One of these days the young man's heart will ache because of the places he left blank in those letters. Be sure she notices the evenings about which he is silent. I am afraid she even cries over them. It is a way mothers have, and the days will surely come when he cannot reach her with letters. If I were he, I would make them wellsprings of joy to her while I had her. Evidently he knew his boy. Ben Reader's eyes drooped and dimmed. He had not been so long away from the country home that his heart had ceased to beat the faster at the sound of his mother's name, and there were times at least when he wanted nothing in life so much as to please her. The two men were moving slowly down the street together now. Professor Landis had gone as far in this direction as his work led him. But no matter, the master's work seemed to call him a few steps farther. He saw the impression he had made, and waited in silence for a moment, but his next sentence was a mistake. Did young Myers stop for you last evening? Ben's face darkened. Yes, sir, he did and if you will be kind enough to let him know that he needn't try to patronize me any more, I'll be glad. I think likely that is the reason why I finally gave up going. I can't stand his airs nor his advice. He told me last night that if I'd wear a different necktie I would look less queer. He even offered to lend me one of the right kind. I came pretty near kicking him downstairs to pay for it. My necktie may not be just the right shape, but it is my own, and was bought with honest money. I didn't want to rig up in any borrowed finery. Besides that, there isn't a worse giggler in the crowd than this same Myers. I don't want to have anything to do with him or his kind. He and that Miss Hudson that he goes with so much were giggling for all they were worth the other night at the concert. I knew it was about me. Anybody could see that at a glance." and I suppose it was my necktie that tickled them, though what is the matter with it I'm sure I don't know. It is new and clean, and there are ten thousand others like it in the store where I bought it, so it must be in fashion for somebody. And then Professor Landis knew, by a bell which began at the moment to twang, that he must leave this part of the vineyard and make haste to other work. I am sorry, was all that he had time to say to Ben. Then he went swiftly back over the ground which he had slowly traversed, thinking deeply as he went. Not only had his question been a mistake, tossing Ben's thoughts suddenly back upon his own uncomfortable experiences, but evidently his experiment with young Myers had been also. Myers was one of his students, a merry-hearted, good-natured sort of a fellow, who had never so much as thought of doing or trying to do for others. Though a young man of means and of assured position, these seemed of so little consequence to him 
that it occurred to his Latin professor to send him in search of reader, in hopes that his free and easy ways might put the boy more at his ease, and that he himself might get really interested in the effort, and begin to think of something besides his own amusement. He had shown him carefully, he thought, the sort of boy reader was, and the sort of help he needed. Neckties, though unmentioned, were certainly among the list of things wherein help was needed. But what a disastrous way to undertake it! That hardly seems like Myers, he said to himself, going over Ben's story. He seems to care extremely little about dress and conventionalities of that sort, and yet to be thoroughly posted. But I am distressed that I sent him after Ben. If I could have gotten the foolish boy to the social last evening, I could have introduced him, I think, to one or two persons who might have helped him. I wonder if Miss Hudson's influence over Myers is calculated to destroy what little there may be in him to be used for service. Both of them among the gigglers. Poor Ben! And through the disturbed brain of this Christian worker there ran a phrase somewhat after this fashion. For neckties and giggles shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of What They Couldn't by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight A Lesson in Fanaticism. It was later in the day by several hours when Professor Landis finally reached the public library, whither his steps had been tending when he met young Reader. In fact, the working hours of the day were over. It had been an unusually busy day in the university but the professor who had gone to his duties from his knees had not for a moment forgotten whom he served, and had kept that part of the service uppermost. In consequence of this, who shall be able to estimate the work he had done that day? Work of which even he had no knowledge. In fact, his part was only to drop the seed. He had not been able, even with other crowding cares, to keep young reader out of his thoughts. He was troubled for the frank-faced boy who had a mother in the country watching hungrily for each male, in the hope, oftentimes he feared the vain hope, that she might hear from her boy. There were rumors, which he trusted did not reach the mother, that would have given her some definite anxiety. Not that Ben Reader had gone far astray, many people would not have thought him astray at all. In fact, among his associates, he was called the deacon because there were so many things he would not do. But Professor Landis had high ideals, and he believed that mothers were very particular, as Ben put it. Still thinking of Ben, he almost ran against Miss Cameron as she stood at one of the tables turning over a pile of books which had been brought her. I beg your pardon, he said, and then scrutinized the girl's face closely. It always arrested his thoughts, because there was an unrest written on it so distinctly. His acquaintance with the Camerons had not progressed rapidly. Miss Cameron had so manifestly desired to avoid his company, that Professor Landis had hesitated, since the night when she all but sent him away from her porch. He told himself, then, that perhaps he would better leave her entirely to Dorothy. She was evidently not one whom he could reach. Yet, as often as he met her in streetcar or on the street, her face would always oblige him to leave other thoughts, and wonder if there were really nothing he could do for her. Today came in force the very impression which he had had several times before concerning her. The girl was brooding over herself. Some trouble, real or fancied, was eating her strength away. If she could get interested in someone else, someone whom she could help, would it not help her? He thought of Ben Reader. Had the two an idea in common on which one could seize? Oh, she could undoubtedly do much for Ben, this girl who had brothers and so understood boys and their needs and temptations. 
this girl who had a home to which she could occasionally invite the homeless boy. But would she? While he decided to sacrifice a little more time in order to see whether this latest idea would develop, he began a desultory conversation with her, watching for the right opening for his thought. Do you come here for books, Miss Cameron? Comparatively few people seem to have found this branch of the library. I find it much more convenient than the one farther uptown. Are you looking for anything special? Perhaps I can aid you. This as she pushed the pile of books impatiently from her and drew a catalogue nearer. Nothing special. I am looking for something which I care to read. No, you couldn't help me. I want an unmitigated novel. I do not suppose you allow such wickedness on your lists. Are novels wicked? he said with a smile. I suppose so, from the standpoint of particular people. Everything that is interesting is more or less wicked, is it not? That depends. I know some interesting things which I would not enter in that list. What sort of novels do you like, Miss Cameron? The unmitigated ones, as I told you. I like to read about real people, not the affected effigies which they put into the goody books. Howells, for instance? Miss Cameron made a gesture of disgust. No, indeed. I never read Howells if I can find anything else to pass the time. He is much too real. There are troubles enough in the commonplace line of one's own without wading through his books, which sound as though he had merely written out what he saw on the street. That strikes me as one of the finest compliments to Howell's genius that I have heard in some time. But since you evidently do not like real things after all, tell me if you ever indulge in one of my favorites. Do you read Miss Warner? If her face had shown disgust over Howell's name, how shall its expression now be described? You cannot mean the old-fashioned Miss Warner, with her interminable wide, wide world, and Queechy, and the hills of something or other, she said. Ah, but I do. She is the very Miss Warner, with her say and seal, and her old helmet, and all the other creations of her earnest brain. I am glad to find you familiar with her. I am not. You give me too much credit. It was a spasm of my childhood, long since past. Professor Landis, it is not possible that you can intend to seriously commend her writings. Why not? Because she is not worthy of it. From a literary point of view, which I supposed a teacher would feel bound to consider, I am sure she is of no account. As for her characters, because I do not like the hopelessly commonplace realism of Howells, it does not follow that I can be satisfied with the impossible immaculateness of her everlasting hero or heroine. It is the same person always, whether in masculine or feminine dress, and the most improbable one imaginable. I have heard that criticism before. It never strikes me as quite fair. It ignores the possible design in the author's mind. Oh, her design was to make all the money she could, I suppose. But it really surprises me to hear you commending her. Gentlemen generally appreciate the weakness of her characters. Do you think them weak? I frankly affirm that I do not. But, Professor Landis, isn't marked unnaturalness an element of weakness? The literary critics all say so, and Miss Warner will bear off the palm for that characteristic, I am sure. Did you ever meet such a being, for instance, as her wonderful young man? Never mind whether his name be John, or Winthrop, or Mr. Rees, he is the same person. Do you know him, Mr. Landis? I admit at the outset that I have never met him. But may I ask you one question? Are the characters you have mentioned better than the pattern? The pattern? She repeated in genuine bewilderment. This young woman was so unused to meeting a religious thought in ordinary conversation that her mind did not take in his meaning. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came among us for that purpose, among others, you remember. Has Miss Warner succeeded in imagining a human being superior to him? 
of course not but she has tried to make a human being like him and that makes the whole unnatural i beg pardon but what is a copy worth unless one strives to attain it let us suppose an artist with a perfect model quarrelling with it wishing to clip off a bit of the ear or the cheek or the forehead because he cannot hope to copy it in absolute perfection i do not think the case is parallel mr i beg your pardon professor landis the artist struggles after perfection but does not expect to attain and when occasionally one poses as having done so we naturally dislike him he made no reference to her marked use of his title but passed it by as of too little consequence to notice and gave himself to her illustration in life i grant you that such is the case but have you not touched upon the special realm of religious fiction should it not be the aim of the christian writer to portray so far as he or she may be able characters as they would be if the lord jesus christ had all the power over their lives which he ought to have in other words must not religious fiction in order to have the right to be deal with humanity not so much as it is but as it might be if it would not that we would have all fictitious characters of that type if i remember correctly some of miss warner's creations are intensely human but the power of her work to me is that she tries in each book to present one person at least who has reached the place spiritually which we all believe that those who profess to follow christ ought to reach it is not the impossible after all which she represents but the unusual miss cameron made that particular gesture of hers which meant dissent and slight annoyance i am not fond of religious fiction she said i prefer authors who leave it out of their thoughts entirely as not suited to fiction and deal with life as they find it ah but do not such authors deal with life as they find it i grant you that those who ignore it are numerous one may revel in fiction for a lifetime and not so much as suspect that there is such a factor as christianity at work in the world but isn't that after all the most unnatural of all forms of fiction are not the great facts of human sin and human suffering present everywhere to be accounted for is not death a real and fully illustrated power in our very midst isn't this life at its best very short shall we talk about that being natural writing which ignores these three great elements that sooner or later enter into all our lives it is not ignored said miss cameron speaking indignantly what can you mean some of the finest passages of modern fiction have to do with sin and suffering and as for death tragedy i am sure has a prominent place in all great novels granted but isn't it ignoring a subject to present only the bare outlines of facts and dwell upon the results without an attempt to reach the cause or the remedy without even a hint indeed that a cause is known or a remedy suggested nothing is more bewildering to me in modern fiction than the coolness with which men and women write volume after volume ignoring the one great ever-present ever-working factor in human history the reverent student of history sees nothing plainer in every volume he reads than god's hand shaping controlling guiding the great writers of fiction seem to a great extent to have forgotten him so entirely has it become the custom to ignore christianity as a powerful agent in human affairs that certain critics have given themselves to criticizing the few who remember it i recall reading but a few days ago a book review written in a semi-commendatory tone in which the writer having found some points which he was kind enough to approve added to be sure her characters have an astonishing way of changing their natures all of a sudden and growing surprisingly patient and forgiving and the like but this is pardonable perhaps in fiction and the tone of the whole is helpful i have not quoted literally but that is the idea i remember it distinctly because it was reviewing a book with which i happened to be familiar 
and I realized that in just so flippant a way as that, the tremendous fact of conversion had been disposed of. Doesn't that seem very strange to you, Miss Cameron? We live in a world which witnesses every day to these marvelous changes. Men who have been in the depths of drunkenness, or worse, if there is a worse state than that, men and women who have been all that is low and vile and terrible, become suddenly new creatures with changed appetites and desires and motives, and the fiction-writing world looks on and smiles, and writes its stories of human lives, and is silent about the greatest event which can happen to any life. Still, some people do not believe in these things, said Miss Cameron. It was a weak answer, and she knew it. But he had paused suddenly in his outburst, and was looking at her as though he was waiting for a reply. That is not true, he said quickly. I beg your pardon, I mean that there are facts in the world which reasonable beings do not deny. No one in his senses, for instance, who is at all cognizant of events as they are occurring in our large cities, but must admit that there are men and women who, a year ago, were fair representatives of all that is evil, and who today are living earnest, worthy lives, and if they choose to inquire into the facts, they can learn that these changes were sudden, not that the lives became in a day as distinctly changed as they are now, but that the desires and inclinations were changed, oftentimes in a moment, and they can learn that without exception, these people who have been so changed, attributed all to the power of one Jesus Christ. Also they know, all of them, that they live in a land which acknowledges in its civil government, in its schools and colleges, in its very dates even, the power of this same factor. Why in fiction, which professes to represent life as it is, do they think it natural to utterly ignore him, or in their reviews of those who do not, speak of his work almost with a sneer. Despite her want of interest in the speaker, Miss Cameron could not but be interested in his theme. She was a thoughtful girl, in certain lines. She was capable of understanding intelligent conversation, and the humiliating fact was that she had belonged all her life in a social circle where, by common consent, anything serious or earnest in the way of conversation was purposely set aside. For a young woman who was not by nature flippant, this was hard. She gravely considered what had been said to her, and admitted that there was truth in it. Still, she said thoughtfully, recalling the belief, or rather the unbelief, of some of her favorite writers of fiction, if people are not believers in Jesus Christ, how can they write of his work? But, my dear Miss Cameron, Jesus Christ is a fact in history. Sane people cannot ignore him. He lived and died. Nothing that we have to do with in the past is more certainly attested than this. He is to be accounted for in some way. It is folly for writers of fiction, above all others, to ignore him. For whether they like it or not, he has had more to do with life in the present and in the past than has any other name in history. If they are to write of things as they are, or were, with any show of sincerity, they must have to do with him. But I ought to beg your pardon, I did not mean to give a lecture on fiction. I have had to give two lectures in class today, and seem to have gotten into the mood. I had it in mind to speak to you on an entirely different subject, one which has occupied my thoughts much today. Miss Cameron, if you could help a human being who is in need of help, I am surely right in thinking you would like to do it, am I not? She was on her guard in a moment. This fanatical young man, who wanted even novels to be impossibly good, should not inveigle her into any philanthropic scheme. Perhaps so, she said coldly, though I consider the if with which your sentence began an important one. I do not believe I can help anybody. I am not one of those persons of whom you have been speaking, and I do not know how to be of use in the world, even if my tastes lay in that direction, 
which they do not. Do you mean that you are not personally acquainted with Jesus Christ? The color flamed into her face. She had never in her life before been spoken to directly on this subject. The manner in which it was now done struck her as strange. Certainly she knew a good deal about Jesus Christ. She had heard of him since her babyhood. She used to kneel beside her crib and lisp his name. And this I ask for Jesus' sake, was as familiar to her as her own name. Yet she did not feel acquainted with him, and she was a truthful girl. I suppose I am not, she said, trying to smile. But that seems a strange way of putting it. It is the only way of putting it, Miss Cameron. Believe me, one cannot have an actual, personal acquaintance with him without having it color one's life, permeate one's desires and motives, change one's nature indeed. I wish that I might be permitted to introduce him to you. I can recommend him as the truest, wisest, most faithful friend and helper that human being ever knew. I do not understand you she said coldly, and I will confess that it sounds to me like fanaticism. Yes, I have no doubt it does. That is because you and he are not friends. He does not force his friendship, Miss Cameron, but how can you help desiring it? However, there is a sense in which that has not to do with the work of which I was speaking. It is only common human kindness of which I am in search. There is a young friend of mine, a mere boy indeed, scarcely twenty, who has recently come from a country home. He has been well brought up, and has a good mother, but he is having his first experience of city life. He finds himself bewildered, accustomed in the country to associate with the best people, and to feel on terms of equality with them, he discovers himself to be quite alone here. He has become identified with a church because his mother wished it, that is, he has rented a sitting in its gallery, and has, or was, reasonably regular in attendance. But he has no at-home feeling anywhere. His clothes are not quite what he finds other young men wearing. His manners are not the same as theirs. These things he feels, but does not know how to correct. What he needs imperatively and very soon is friends, women with whom he can feel at ease, and who in a hundred little indescribable ways can help tide him over a dangerous period in his life into safe waters. Do you get the idea? I have longed for a home which had a mother in it, and safety and kindliness. I find it difficult to express just what I want, but it is something which true women can give to boys younger than themselves, and I am not sure that any other human beings can. I have tried young men, and they are partial failures. It is a curious fact that boys will take from a woman whom they respect the help which they will not allow one of their own sex to give. It is very commonplace help for which I am seeking. If Ben knew how to enter and leave a room, how to conduct himself in accordance with the common courtesies of life, what it would be proper and improper to do at a well-appointed table, Oh, a score of things which people are supposed to breathe in unconsciously, and which they do, more or less, in cultured atmospheres. It is these common, and in a sense, unimportant things, that are shutting Ben out from the companionship which he needs, and forcing him almost into a companionship in which he feels at ease, but which will injure him and hurt his mother. Why was he telling all this to her? He actually questioned it himself, even while he talked. Certainly, she had not given him reason to hope that she could or would do anything for anybody. Yet there was a sudden softening on her face, even while he waited, and the eyes which drooped from before his gaze were misty. A vague wish she felt for the moment that she were the sort of woman which he seemed to fancy her, a woman who could do kind things in the world, helpful things. This country boy, for instance, who felt out of place in the city. She had had something of the feeling. There had been circles in which she had felt quite out of place, not because she did not know how to act, 
nor what it would be proper to say under given circumstances, but because her dress was not such as made her feel at ease among the other guests. Oh, she could imagine very well what it was to Ben. She should really like to help him, but how could she? What would Lucia think, or her mother for that matter? And what was there she could do anyway? Rod and Mac had never felt the need of any help from her, had never sought her in any way. She knew no more about boys than did other girls who had not brothers. It was absurd to think that she could do anything. The hour for closing the library had arrived, and nothing had been accomplished. Professor Landis could only apologize for monopolizing her time, and then both had to leave without the books for which they had come a long distance. They separated at the door, for Mr. Landis had an errand in another direction. He walked away with a grave face, telling himself that he feared it had been a wasted hour. Of what use to talk about poor Ben to a young woman who did not know any way of peace for her own feet to tread? If he could only help this girl who seemed in such sore need of help. He wondered why it should be so difficult to say the right word to her. He had told her he wished she would allow him to introduce his master, but he had not done so. Instead of attempting it, he had drawn her thought away from her own sore need and talked of Ben. Well, perhaps he was not the one to influence her, but in that case, why was she so often in his mind? End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of What They Couldn't by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Home Thrusts. As for Mary Cameron, her homeward walk was an exceedingly disturbed one. Try as she would to put some of the sentences which had been spoken away from her, they clung. She had affected to be skeptical over certain statements which Professor Landis had made but in her heart she knew she believed them. She had not lived an utterly blinded life thus far. Limited as was her practical knowledge of Christianity, she could call to mind remarkable changes of character in persons known to her, yes, and sudden changes. Was not Tim Nolan, in the old days, one of the trials of her uncle's life? Did he not at least three times a month appear at the office with bleared eyes and blackened face, and humbly confess that he had been at it again? Was he not discharged regularly once a month, and hired again because he confessed such penitence, and made such strong promises, and because her uncle was sorry for his wife and children, and could not help a lurking feeling of interest in Tim himself? Had there not come a week in which he lost all patience, and declared that he had now discharged Tim Nolan for the last time, that he had been on a spree for five consecutive days, and was in worse condition than ever before, that it was worse than useless to try to do anything more for him, and demoralizing to the other men to keep giving him chances? And then, did not Tim Nolan appear to him one morning, with clean-shaven face and clothes neatly mended, and with a look in his eyes such as had not been seen there before, and beg for one more trial, promising that if he failed this time he would not ask again for mercy. Had they not laughed at their uncle for being too credulous and tender-hearted, in that he tried him again after all? And then, oh marvel of marvels, Tim Nolan stayed. He took no more sprees, he lost no more time, he passed directly by the saloon where his earnings had been regularly spent, he went to church and to prayer meeting, yes, more than that, he took part in the prayer meeting. They had laughed about it at the time, they girls, it seemed so absurd to think of Tim Nolan having anything to say that was worth saying. But their uncle had unwittingly spoken the truth, he never discharged him again. Tim had been suddenly, mysteriously, completely changed. The things which he used to love he apparently began to hate. The companions whom he had sought but the week before, as friends, he began to shun as enemies. 
and when he was asked, as some of the curious asked him, to give a reason for this strange change, he was wont to say solemnly, One night the Lord Jesus Christ came to me, and got hold of me somehow, and I ain't the same man I was, nor ain't like to be. Tim Nolan was a living witness to her conscience that the words which had been spoken to her about Jesus Christ that afternoon were true. Moreover, she could recall other instances, some of them quite as marked as this, changes which had been marveled over in her circle of friends. There was young Dr. Powelton, a cultured, scholarly skeptic, sneering in a gentlemanly way one day about the superstitions of modern religion, the next, on his knees, in the presence of some of those before whom he had sneered, vowing allegiance henceforth to Jesus Christ, yes, and keeping faith with him, being from that hour so changed a man that they could but speak of it for a time whenever his name was mentioned. Without exception, people so changed attribute it to the power of Jesus Christ. This is what Professor Landis had said, and it was true. There were witnesses enough known to her, and always the same name to stand for. Yes, it was folly to ignore such a power in the world as this. It was silly to write books about life, and pass in silence a force which was able to pervade all life. As her judgment made this admission, there came to Mary Cameron for the first time a vague longing to realize that force in her own nature. What a thing it would be to be suddenly changed, to begin tomorrow morning, for instance, and show by her life that she was another person. It is true the change would not be so marked as in Tim Nolan or in Dr. Powelton, but Mary Cameron, being an honest person, told herself frankly that there was opportunity enough for change in her that would be noticeable. She knew herself to be growing steadily in irritability. Each day it became more difficult to keep even a show of patience with Aunt Eunice and Lucia had always aggravated her in dozens of petty ways. As for Emily, every one knew how utterly unendurable a girl of fifteen or sixteen could be on occasion. Yet there are people who manage to live in peace even with such provocations. She went swiftly back over the recent past, and could not recall a morning for days, hardly for weeks, in which something rasping had not come up for conversation, something which had led her to say words for which she was sorry a moment afterwards. It is all Aunt Eunice's fault, she told herself bitterly. A saint from heaven could not have more patience with her. Yet no sooner had she admitted the thought than she was obliged to add to it that they had been far from peaceful before Aunt Eunice's arrival. In short, it was the habit of her life to differ with Lucia, and discuss the most trivial things until they came to sharp words, especially if Emily were at home to aggravate her. She was even sharp to her mother, and spoke often to her father in a way which she did not herself approve. Oh, there certainly was opportunity for great improvement in her outward life. There were also other ways in which she admitted that she would like to be different, Professor Landis was fond of the word peace. He had it often on his lips. He seemed to think it possible for one to be always at peace, no matter what the outward circumstances of life might be. Was it possible to have such a friendship with this one who seemed so mysterious to her, and over whose name Mr. Landis's voice lingered with reverent love? Such a friendship as would calm all the turbulence of life, smooth out the crooked ways, atone for slights and disappointments and discouragements. She did not believe it, yet might it not be worth trying for? There was a power about it all which she did not understand, which she had never felt. What if she should decide now and here to give herself to this new life? She had ceased praying long ago. Rather, she had ceased observing the outward form, save as she bowed her head in church with the others but it is doubtful if her thoughts roved more freely there than they had in her earlier days when she went down on her knees before retiring and thought she prayed. 
it seems a startling thing to say of a fairly well-educated young woman in this christian land of a believer in and outward supporter of christianity but i suppose it is true that she had never prayed she weighed the possibilities now much as she might have weighed the question whether she should or should not go to the lecture that evening should she take a new stand begin to pray to read her bible to go to church regularly and to prayer meeting and honestly try to follow christ she had never given it careful consideration before but why should she not she was tired of all her surroundings nothing in or about her home or her life was quite as she wished it why not have it utterly different in short why not try christianity for all it was worth she did not settle the question but as she applied the latch-key to their own door she almost thought she would matters inside offered abundant opportunity for the exercise of any new virtues she could command betsy whose duty it was to attend to the furnace during the day had evidently forgotten it and the sitting-room was cold aunt eunice wrapped in an ugly shawl was shivering over the register and grumbling about trying to get warmth out of a black hole in the floor there isn't any fire here she exclaimed as mary opened the door of course not said lucia coolly the fire is in the cellar aunt eunice not in that black hole well i tell you there isn't a speck of heat coming up and it is as cold as a barn here it always is for that matter i wonder we don't all get our deaths and we shall before the winter is over why aunt eunice it was only this morning that you complained of the room being as hot as a furnace and said it was so more than half the time well that is just what i say now it is always either too cold or too hot never a decent reasonable fire what is the use of catching me up every word i say like a pert girl as you are who is going to fix the fire that is what i want to know your father is upstairs why don't you call him and tell him that the fire has gone out it is betsy's business to attend to the fire said mary with dignity already she felt her half-formed resolution slipping away she was cold and the dimly lighted room looked very cheerless and both aunt eunice and lucia were evidently in ill humor what was the use in trying to be anything but miserable oh betsy echoed aunt eunice spitefully the things you expect of that girl she couldn't get through within a day if she was as smart as she is dull and stupid i don't wonder she never gets her work done i am sure you put too much on her if you two girls would stop your everlasting puttering over paint and embroidery and do something your mother wouldn't have such a hard time of it and betsy would stand a chance of getting her own work halfway done i never in my life saw such management as you have here how edward endures it i don't know he was brought up very differently i can tell you the camerons always had things in systematic order at their house and each had his or her work to do i wish our names were rafferty instead of cameron said lucia as she went hastily from the room and she banged the door a little the atmosphere did not brighten as the evening drew on they gathered presently at the dinner table but mr cameron was even more silent than usual in fact there was such an utterly miserable look on his face that the girls hesitated to address him and their mother had evidently been crying it is some money matter of course said mary to herself and it irritated her to think that they must always be haunted by that merciless friend poverty aunt eunice harped upon the extinct fire and upon the folly of expecting a blundering girl like betsy to start it again until lucia darting an angry look at her asked if she didn't think it her christian duty to go down and help betsy or perhaps make the fire in her stead somebody ought to adopt that girl she affirmed and send her to boarding school she was evidently out of her sphere in the kitchen overworked and ill-treated according to aunt eunice's views 
it would be a virtuous act to report her to the society for the prevention of cruelty to which aunt eunice animals or children she finished turning toward her with a wicked smile on her face betsy is rather old to be called a child and it is only four-footed animals that the other society attends to isn't it i confess i don't know how to manage it it was mirthless fun if lucia had not been troubled over the question of what fresh calamity had disturbed her father and mother she would not have indulged herself in it aunt eunice deigned no reply even the semblance of conversation was dropped after that mary who had faint memories of her half-formed resolve hovering about her fell to wondering what suppose she were that changed person of whom they had talked that afternoon would she do to brighten the gloom of this dinner-table suppose she were capable of making gentle cheerful replies to aunt eunice and of telling some pleasant bit of news which would cheer her father and of winning lucia into a more amiable frame of mind something of that kind she felt sure one of miss warner's goody characters which she had criticized would essay to do well would it not be a laudable act yes but the trouble was it could be done only in books that was what she had meant to express to professor landis the fact that it was only book people who succeeded in doing these things then her thoughts wandered to ben reader what was it that Mr. Landis wanted her to do for him? A girl with a home, indeed. What good would a visit to such a home as theirs was to-night do to a lonesome boy? A well-lighted, well-warmed saloon, where the people were good-natured, would perhaps be preferable. As for her mother, she stole another glance at her downcast face. What could she have been crying about? what extra thing had happened and they not told they were treated as children things which they ought to know kept from them she was growing irritable again less sure of her wish even to make that radical change in her character into the midst of the silence and gloom of this dining-room came emily with the whir and bustle peculiar to her letting in a rush of cold air as she came which caused Aunt Eunice to shiver and draw her shawl closer about her. Emily paid not the slightest attention to the gloom which enveloped the family. "'I've had such a lark!' she said, tossing school books and wraps in a promiscuous heap and taking her place at the table. "'Nanny Fuller and I have been away down to the skating park. Oh, there are such lots and lots of people there this afternoon. The first really good skating of the season, they say.' there are some new people college boys i guess splendid-looking fellows and they skated exquisitely i was just dying to skip in and join them father i really must have a pair of skates i would rather go without shoes than skates you may have to do both replied the father with no lighting up of his worn face but emily had already flitted to another subject why mary cameron have you reached home I didn't expect you yet for hours. Did you come up on the car? What a commonplace way to finish a special afternoon. I thought you would walk. It is quite the fashion now for very particular friends to take long walks when they have important matters to settle. What particular folly is uppermost with you just now? asked Mary in her coldest and most indifferent tone. Emily laughed gleefully you should have heard nanny take off the scene she is a perfect mimic she told to the life just how professor landis gesticulated in the more exciting parts and if you could have seen her draw herself up and pretend to look at him before she made reply you would have thought it was your very self i never saw anybody like nanny for describing scenes what is all that asked lucia growing interested while mary looked bewildered and annoyed what was the silly girl talking about why nanny had been to the library the branch one you know over on duane street and there it seems she saw professor landis and who should be his companion but our mary nanny said it was as good as going to a play to watch them of course she was not near enough to hear what was said and she wouldn't have listened if she had been 
but she said she did not need to hear in order to enjoy it. They talked for hours, and were both just as eager and interested as they could be. It was great fun to hear her tell about it. She took Mary off to the life. There they were, she said, surrounded by books, and neither of them looking into one. She came away and left them there, but her cousin Robert joined us while she was telling me about it, and said he could add the last chapter, that the librarian actually had to tell them that it was time to close that part of the building, and they went away without a book after spending the afternoon there. Really? said Lucia, joining in the burst of laughter with which Emily finished her sentence. I should think that the parlor would have been a pleasanter place than the public library for a confidential interview. Still, I am thankful to have something accomplished. Are you to be congratulated, Mary? What was there in such utter nonsense to make Mary Cameron's eyes blaze with anger? The girl was too refined by nature to enjoy this species of amusement, and to do Lucia justice, she rarely descended to it but Emily was at the age, and had such intimacies, that her temptations lay just in this direction. As a rule, her older sisters bore her attacks with at least outward indifference, and contented themselves by calling her a simpleton. But one glance at Mary's face this evening would have shown that she was in no mood for trifling. In truth, the girl's heart was still sore over the continued absence and silence of Russell Denham six weeks since he had left her with that gay farewell and not a word had she heard from him for the first few weeks she watched the mails with an eagerness of hope and a sickening of suspense such as only those who have been through like experience can understand not a small part of her humiliation had grown out of the fact that her family were more or less disappointed also her mother even had questioned her closely and been betrayed into expressing surprise that she did not hear from Mr. Denham, and Lucia had not failed to characterize him as a flirt, declaring that she considered a female flirt despicable enough, but when a man descended to it, no words were equal to his description. She and Mary had had more than one sharp exchange of views concerning him, Mary invariably taking the position that he had shown her no more attention than was common among ladies and gentlemen. In her heart she did not believe this, but not for the world would she have admitted it in speech. Emily's giddy nonsense might not have hurt her so, had she not caught that sudden gleam of interest on her mother's face, a look which said as plainly as words could have said, that to know that one of her daughters had definite plans for the future would be a relief. Poor Mary resented this. She knew, it is true, that it was only the grind of poverty and the uncertainty of the present which made her mother think much of such possible provisions. She knew that the mother would not have been dazzled by any prospects which did not touch the inmost affections of her children. But, nevertheless, it was bitter to feel herself watched and commented upon. To feel that that silly Emily looked upon her as growing very old, and wondered among her mates probably, as she did openly one day at home, whether Mary really would be an old maid like Aunt Eunice. To feel that even her father speculated as to the possibility of having one person less to provide for in the near future. As has been said before, there was less of this feeling than Mary imagined. She had grown morbid over it, because there had been more or less speculation as to Russell Denham's intentions, and more or less satisfaction looked, if not expressed, when his attentions became somewhat pronounced. But there was no such continuous espionage upon her friendships and movements as she chose to think. Still, it was all these things combined which made Emily's folly seem like gross and premeditated insult. Her response was prompt and emphatic. "'Emily Cameron, what do you mean by making such an utter fool of yourself not only, but dragging in your family as well? And Lucia, instead of rebuking, has to help you along. I must say, I think I have borne enough of such coarseness at the hands of both of you.' 
if it has come to the point that one cannot encounter the most commonplace of acquaintances in a public building and exchange a few words of conversation with him without being caricatured by idiots i think it is time that something should be done to keep them from roving the streets as for professor landis you may insult him to your heart's content for all i care he is nothing to me but an acquaintance from the country with whom i try to be civil when i come in contact with him by accident make all the fun of him that you choose but in future i advise you and nanny fuller to leave me out or it will be the worse for both of you then this angry young woman rose abruptly and left the room my patience said emily looking after her with a half scared half amused face she is as mad as a march hare and at what i should like to know what do you suppose she will do to nanny and me kill us she looked fierce enough to didn't she said aunt eunice you girls do beat all for quarrelling that i ever heard in my life the three of you can't be together for fifteen minutes without having some sort of a rumpus i should think your father would go raving crazy he looked at that moment more like fainting he had toyed with his knife and fork but eaten almost nothing now he pushed the untasted coffee from him and rising with a slow step like an old man he too left the room end of chapter nine chapter ten of what they couldn't by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten how will it all end the tumult of indignation in which mary cameron went to her room continued far into the evening lucia came up soon after dinner and made ready for a lecture which was in the immediate neighborhood earlier in the day the girls had agreed to go with emily who had been requested by one of her teachers to attend but mary in response to lucia's reminder said shortly that she had changed her mind lucia hesitated and nervously moved sundry articles on the dressing-table while she decided how to say what she meant to say at last it came abruptly i wish you wouldn't mind emily's nonsense so much mary she doesn't mean anything but fun and in what i said i was just trying to lighten the gloom a little father is awfully worried about something and i wanted to divert his thoughts you took a very strange way to do it said mary in her coldest tone but never mind you need not offer any apology i ought to be quite used to such experiences by this time emily needs to be rebuked not encouraged you need not wait for me as i most decidedly am not going out then lucia went away wishing that she had left mary to indulge her ill humor without trying to propitiate her as for mary her disagreeable words had hardly passed her lips before she would have recalled them if she could she realized the hatefulness of her character at least to some extent in the light of the talk which she had had with professor landis her shortcomings were more marked than usual at the same time she could not rise to a real desire to make herself better instead she yielded to her inclination to brood over her annoyances and emily's rudeness until as has been said her indignation rose the truth is she was one of those unfortunate persons to whom a laugh is worse than a blow to feel that emily's companions had made her the subject of their keen wit set her blood boiling into the midst of her gloomy and angry thoughts came a sound which suddenly held them in check her room was directly over her father's and when the register was open even conversation in the room below could be distinctly heard what came to mary at this time was an unmistakable groan from her father's lips and then the words i believe i would rather have heard of his death then her mother in strong sharp tones edward i should think you would be afraid to talk in that way i know it frightens me to hear you i tell you you are hard on the poor boy if anything will drive him to desperation it will be the way in which you write him to-night 
I wish you would not write at all. Let his mother do it. It seemed to Mary that her heart suddenly gave a great throb, then stopped beating. What had happened? Either Rod or Mac was in trouble of some sort. Father and mother were always brooding over something which they did not explain, and now some terrible thing had come, and she was ignorant of it. She would not endure it another moment. She would claim her right as the eldest of the family. She rose up quickly, her limbs trembling so that they all but refused to support her, and made what speed she could to the room below. Entering without the ceremony of a knock, she broke forth. "'Mother, I want to know what has happened. I heard you and father talking, and I know there is something wrong with the boys. I think it is unjust and cruel to keep me in ignorance. What is the matter?' "'Hush,' said Mrs. Cameron. "'Nothing very dreadful is the matter. Only your father is worn out and excited over trifles.' Mr. Cameron interrupted her gravely. "'Rachel, nothing is gained by trying to gloss over a wrong.' This is not a trifle, and we injure our own consciences by trying to make it appear so. He sat at his writing desk, paper before him, pen in hand, but he had written no word on the page, and his face looked drawn and haggard, quite as though he needed to be in bed instead of trying to write. Nonsense, said Mrs. Cameron, with the sharpness of a heart that was desperate. I tell you, you are making altogether too much of a boyish act done on the impulse of a moment. See if Mary will not tell you so. Mother, what is it? said Mary, almost stamping her foot in her excitement and anxiety to learn just what had happened. Mrs. Cameron made haste to answer. Nothing serious at all, I can tell you. McLeod found himself short of money and in need of certain things in haste, so instead of delaying to write home for funds, he has sent an order to the store where he has been in the habit of shopping, and has had the bill charged to his father, as was natural enough, I am sure. If a boy cannot depend on his father to that extent, it is hard. "'And he has written about it?' asked Mary breathlessly. Before Mrs. Cameron could reply, her husband, shading his face with his hand, spoke in a low, humiliated tone. No, Mary, he has not. No good will come of our trying to hide our eyes to the truth of this matter. The facts are these. It is six weeks since McLeod ordered the bill of goods from Dunlap and Pearson's, a place where I never trade if I can help it, and never had a penny's worth charged. No word has come to me in the meantime of any such transaction. The first I learn of it is a bill presented to me today. Mary caught eagerly at the suggestion this offered. Then I should say it was a wretched forgery. Somebody has been playing sharp with the boys. I wonder you would think that Mac would do such a thing. But it is just like some unprincipled college boy. I should send the bill to Mac at once and get him to ferret out the mischief. Slowly, as one convinced against his will, his father shook his head. That will not do, Mary. You may be sure I did not believe such a story about my boy without proof. I went at once to see Mr. Pearson, and he showed me two letters from McLeod, describing carefully the sort of cut there must be to the vest and the shade of the neckties. It is the old temptation, you see, clothes. The boys knew that I could spare them no more funds for such a purpose, so they have taken matters into their own hands. Both Rodney and McLeod have replenished their wardrobes in this way. The bill is over sixty dollars, Mary. While she listened, Mary's face had alternately flushed and paled. She stared at her father and scarcely heard the eager words which her mother poured forth. What if it is? Sixty dollars goes a very little way toward supplying the necessities of two young men, and Mac always liked the goods best at Dunlop and Pearson's. I have heard him say there was a style about them which could not be found elsewhere. They have felt it absolutely necessary to have the things at once, and have taken the liberty to send for them in their father's name, because they knew the firm would be sure of him. I must insist that I don't think it is such a very great liberty to take with a father. To be sure, they ought not to have done it, 
but they are young and cannot be expected to think ahead very much. Then Mary spoke, her voice low, her words studied. Father, I suppose it is as mother says, that the boys did not stop to think how it would look to us. They know we have always raised the money for their needs somehow. Perhaps they have in mind a way of earning enough to pay the bill, and only borrowed your name for a little while. Businessmen do that sometimes, do they not, as an accommodation? She hardly knew what she was saying. She knew very little about business matters, yet enough to feel that probably her words were weak. But there had come to her a great longing to say something soothing to that terribly crushed father, who sat with his head bowed on his hand, and with a strange, grey look on his face that seemed to age it infinitely. The mother bestowed a grateful look on her eldest daughter, and spoke quickly. Of course there is some such explanation without a doubt, as I have been trying to make you understand. You see how the matter looks to Mary. You have always said that she had a clear brain. She does not see anything so very crushing in this. I tell you, you do very wrong to work yourself up over it in this way, as though it were a criminal matter. Some real trouble will come to people who persist in making mountains out of molehills. It is being dishonorable and dishonest, said Mr. Cameron, his voice low but terribly distinct. I do not want to think of it for a moment as otherwise. I do not want the temptation of thinking that it can be considered anything else by honest people. The boys will not be helped, but hindered, if we gloss over a sin. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Cameron, wiping the quick tears from her eyes. You will drive the boys to desperation if you write to them in that spirit. What is a father for but to overlook the mistakes of his children? I don't say they did right, but I say, as Mary does, that they did not think there was anything very wrong about it. Why, an acquaintance might take that amount of liberty if he felt sure of being able to pay in a short time, and I presume the boys have their plans. They are probably quite sure of winning the money prizes that will be declared in a few days. After that, Mary, feeling her utter inability to make any further suggestions, or to administer comfort in any way, slipped quietly out and went back to her own room. Once there, she closed and locked the door, slipping the little bolt after she turned the key, as though she would in this way shut out even the thoughts of others and be more utterly alone than it is possible ever to be. She was in a tumult of pain, humiliation, indignation. Which had the uppermost place in her heart? It was all very well for her to try to smooth over this astounding piece of news before her father. He needed all such helps. But in her heart she called her brother's action by its true name. It was bitter to have to admit it. A Cameron stooping to a dishonorable, nay, to a dishonest, act. They had been poor, they had resorted to all sorts of trying devices to make the yearly income meet the yearly demands, but the name, as far back as any of them knew, had never been sullied by a breath of dishonesty. Oh, they were in debt, but that was what Mary with flushed cheek and a curious pain in her heart called honorable debt. Her father had explained to each creditor that he was a little behind this quarter, that he would divide among them what he had, and that by next quarter he hoped to be able to pay the entire sum and they had been kind, and had assured him that they had no fears. His name was sufficient guarantee for honorable dealing. But Dunlap and Pearson had never been among her father's creditors, and the boys knew it. They knew also that the firm was the most expensive, not to say extravagant, in their prices, of any in the city. Oh, as her father had said, nothing was to be gained by mincing matters, the boys had been dishonorable and dishonest. She winced over the words. She felt sure that she could have struck an outsider who had dared to use them, yet to her own heart they would speak truth. What was to be the end? Boys who began in this way went often to utter ruin. She had read about and heard about a great many. 
debt and dishonesty were the two potent factors in their ruin of this she was sure but no thought that any such experience could touch the cameron name had ever before occurred to her at that moment she thought of the transformed lives about which professor landis had talked that afternoon the men who almost as one might say in a moment had changed natures she remembered her own illustrations which had come to corroborate the truth of his words and she found that she actually craved such experiences for the boys suddenly she seemed to awaken to the thought that the boys were not all that they might be they had been selfish and careless of the comforts of others this she had known at least she had often so accused them yet these had seemed very trifles when her brothers were away from home and she thought about them tenderly now she felt that they like herself had dwarfed lives ay and they had temptations which she had not realized before and were yielding to them how would it all end while perplexities and sorrows of this character were wearing the hearts of the cameron family professor landis a self-constituted guardian of the young man reader was not having a prosperous time in addition to the fact that this servant of christ felt himself in a measure responsible for every soul with whom he came in contact he had a slight acquaintance with ben reader's family he had seen and talked with the hard-working heavily burdened father and the meek anxious-eyed mother who waited back in their country home for news of ben they were prematurely old these two a wretched mortgage which would have been as a mere toy to a man of capital was yearly sapping away their energy and courage they might almost of late years be said to live for the purpose of gathering together and hoarding enough money to meet the semi-annual payments no they lived for one thing their boy ben there were other children older and younger than he but ben was the only boy and some way their hopes of release from the burdens which had all their lives oppressed them were centred in him i'll pay off that old mortgage when i am a man and be done with it were the words the boy of twelve had spoken drawing himself up proudly and looking at his mother in such a way that she took heart and snatched him to her side and kissed him hungrily as she said i believe in my soul that you will the feeling thus planted grew with the years until it became natural for the girls to refer with fond hopefulness to the time when ben would be old enough to help them out meantime two older sisters married and went away from home not far away within driving distance indeed of the old homestead they married poor men and simply continued the struggle for existence in other homes instead of the one in which they were reared so near were they and so exactly were their lives a repetition of the lives of their parents that it hardly seemed as though a break had been made in the family but when ben went away it was another thing ben when barely nineteen had an opening for business come to him from the great city professor landis whose father's farm was not far from the reader homestead had seen ben occasionally during his summer visits home and had heard of the family burdens and the family hopes as centred in the boy it was he who had secured the opening and great had been the excitement of the reader family when ben departed cityward desolation is no word for the feeling which he left behind him the married sisters when they drove over for an hour's visit with their mother lamented his absence as loudly as did those left at home boys are missed so much more than girls they said they are noisier and take up more room somehow and then they all fell eagerly to telling one another what a splendid chance ben had and how lucky he was to get it these hard times and how kind it had been of professor landis to speak a good word for him and what a thing it would be when ben got into business for himself and got ahead enough to pay that dreadful mortgage and they talked loud and laughed nervously over small nothings to cover up the quiver in their mother's voice 
as she said that sometimes she felt that if they could only have been home again just as he was she would be willing to go on paying interest on the mortgage to the end of her days after all the city was a great ugly dangerous place and she didn't know they were not afraid for their ben they interrupted her to say but in their hearts they were these married sisters their husbands knew a little more about city life than they did and the things they told them made them drive over home oftener and ask hungrily for letters from ben then they every one parents daughters and sons-in-law took to reading surreptitiously and with bated breath all the terrible stories of accident and pain and crime with which the city weekly paper seemed suddenly to teem was the world wickeder that year than ever before it certainly seemed so to the reader family something of all this professor landis knew and it increased his sense of responsibility for ben reader he had been instrumental in bringing ben to the city often he regretted this often he had reason to fear that the city was going to prove too much for the country-bred boy whose feet had never been firmly set on a solid foundation viewed as a study ben reader was interesting he had lived his nineteen years without great temptations of any sort the home atmosphere from which he came might be clouded with anxiety but it was loving it had been a pleasant place to ben all these years there had been saloons in the village, but Ben lived two miles out and rarely went to the village of evenings. On the few occasions when he was belated, the lights of the saloon did not look so cheery to him as that which glowed in the open fireplace at home, where he knew mother and father and the girls were waiting to hear the news. The saloons had not tempted him. He heard nothing about them, thought nothing about them neither alas did his father or mother when mr reader was asked to sign a paper protesting against some flagrant nuisance in the village he always signed it and always remarked complacently these things don't come very close home to me my boy doesn't belong to the people who find their level in such places the consequence was that ben went to the city with only the force of habit to hold him in check and that splendid factor habit found itself a mere reed when it had to be used as a central force in the city all things were very different there was no wide fireplace with its splendid back logs there was no cosy tea-table with something warm for ben because he had been out in the cold above all there was no mother sitting mending and smiling at the stories he had to tell and admiring his feats of industry and strength in the city there was a cold dreary fourth-story back room shared with an uncongenial fellow boarder there were dismal breakfasts and greasy half-cooked insufficient dinners and no companionship the bright lights of the saloon appealed to him the boys who were no better dressed than he and knew no more than he appealed to him they were friendly and cheery and made him feel at home and the smith boys the worst of their set were the most friendly more than anything else ben reader needed the atmosphere of a home to surround and envelop him and whatever else there was in the city there seemed sometimes to be no homes certainly the boy from the country found none and could not help almost laughing at Professor Landis's earnest attempts to make the tall, dark, solemn-looking city houses into homes. Still, though he laughed, the good-natured boy made occasional efforts to meet his helper halfway, not so much for his own sake, be it confessed, as for the helper's. It was a pity to disappoint Professor Landis when he really seemed to care, and for that reason, Ben went occasionally to a church social or Christian endeavor gathering, and tried to mingle with well-dressed people, and make himself believe he felt at home, and nearly always went back to his fourth-story room in a rage, telling himself that he would not be caught in a scrape like that again. Professor Landis could not blame him. Matters connected with these socials did not move according to his ideas. 
even the best-intentioned people did not seem to know how to make the evening pleasant and helpful to a certain class. The socials fell on an evening when Dorothy Landis was unavoidably engaged somewhere, so that tower of strength was denied to her much perplexed brother. End of chapter 10《ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハッピーエンドオブ・ハ A few days preceding the social, he learned to his delight that the long absent pastor had returned. His pulpit had been supplied for several months while he traveled with an aged and invalid father who needed his care. The supply was an old gentleman who was unable to do any pastoral work and who had been seen only from the pulpit on Sundays. It was therefore with great satisfaction that Professor Landis was introduced one evening to Our pastor, the Reverend Mr. Edson, and found in him a young, energetic looking man who greeted him with heartiness and promptly expressed his pleasure in the fact that the professor and his sister had decided to cast in their lot with them. He will be just the man to win Ben, Mr. Landis reflected and noted with satisfaction that he had arrived in time for the social. On the evening of the following day, Professor Landis, having a leisure hour, resolved to call upon the pastor and give him a little of young readers' history and a hint as to the influence of the Smith boys and their set. On his way thither, he fell in with Ben himself and conceived the idea of taking him captive for the call. It was no new work to the professor, he had been for years acting in unison with his pastor. The two had worked together with mutual pleasure, and nearly every time they met had exchanged views in regard to the special ways of reaching and helping certain ones whose names were on their list. Professor Landis had sorely missed this friendship in his new home, and had looked forward eagerly to the return of the pastor. He rejoiced in the thought that the man was in his early prime and full of vigor and enthusiasm. Now here was Ben, and across the street could be seen from the study window the outline of the pastor's head. There was no time like the present. He would take Ben in and let the pastor captivate him. Then, at some other opportune moment, he would give him such points as might be helpful in the study of the boy's character. Ben, my boy, he said, laying a friendly hand on that young man's shoulder, I want you to turn back with me and make a call. Mr. Edson has arrived, you know, and I am going to run in and make his acquaintance. I met him at Dr. Preston's, so I can introduce you. We shall both find it pleasanter this evening for having had this chat with him. Ben demurred. He wasn't dressed for calling, although, truth to tell, he had on at that moment his best suit of clothes. He never made calls, he shouldn't know how to act. These and a dozen other trivialities were overruled. The professor had a good deal of influence over Ben, at least when he was with him, and they mounted the steps of the manse together and were presently shown into the pastor's reception room. Good afternoon, he said, holding out a cordial hand to welcome Professor Landis. You are just the person I want to see. There are two points in which I fancy I shall enlist your interest. And then Professor Landis presented his companion. A swift, well bred glance from head to foot, which was felt rather than observed, and the keen eyed pastor had gauged Ben Reader's position in the world. Ah, indeed, he said carelessly. A Sunday school pupil of yours, Professor? Glad to meet him. Be seated. I was looking over the announcements about the approaching ball game when you rang. Unusual thing, is it not, in this region, to be able to have a game so late in the season? This one will be an exciting affair. The boys are well matched on both sides. 
I told my father he must let me get off in time for the game. I had missed two, and it wasn't within the bounds of reason to expect me to sacrifice another. He laughed, of course, as he spoke. It was partly mere talk, yet he was evidently excited over the coming contest, and quite in earnest in his determination not to miss it. "'You are fond of athletic sports, of course,' continued the pastor. "'All professional men are, I believe, in these days. A great change, my father says, since his time. Oh, I do not play very often, because I have no time for the drill. Pity, too. Sometimes I think I will take time and let some of the work wait. But I attend the match games as often as they are within reach.' Professor Landis explained that the duties of his profession kept him occupied quite often during the hours of a baseball contest, and added frankly that in the neighborhood from which he had recently come, the game had become so entangled with liquor and gambling that he had been compelled to withdraw all recognition of it, even as a looker-on. "'Oh, no,' said the clergyman quickly. "'That is not the way.' We do not want to withdraw from such gatherings, but to hold on to them, and throw our influence on the side of good morals. True, but when one's influence fails to work the desired reform, one must take care how he is counted on the wrong side, you know. When it reached the point with us, that a booth was set up on the ball ground where choice wines and liquors could be bought, and when the gambling spirit ran so high that it was considered a matter of course, some of us felt it necessary to withdraw. The clergyman laughed lightly. Oh, well, he said, it will not do for us to be too straight-laced. The boys will indulge in some of these doubtful things. They mean no harm. They have a booth on our grounds where all sorts of improper things can be bought. I don't patronize it, and they know that I don't. But I am on hand at their games, and they expect me as much as they do the players. You must go to the contest, Professor. You have probably hidden yourself among your books until you have forgotten how to be merry. We'll show you how. Well, never mind. We might not agree on all these points, though I shall convert you, I am sure. You are much too sensible a person to hold to narrow views. We mustn't run away from the world entirely, you know, because it does some things we don't happen to fancy. The world is a jolly good fellow, after all. Here is something which will interest you. Whereupon he plunged eagerly into a description of certain lectures which were soon to be given by eminent speakers. Lectures on highly literary topics such as only scholars could appreciate. There had been some difficulty in securing them for the season, and the clergyman dilated upon it, and his important and complicated part in accomplishing it. Under other circumstances, Professor Landis would have been much interested. As it was, he could only remember that poor Ben did not even know what the subjects meant, which rolled so glibly from the tongue of the clergyman. He made an effort to express his interest briefly, and turned to some topic which might have a bit of common ground. It was all in vain. Throughout the interview, the minister as persistently ignored Ben as though he had been a mere speck on the wall, and persisted in bringing forward topic after topic for conversation, which was manifestly impossible for him to be interested in, or even understand. Professor Landis arose at last, disappointed and bewildered. What did the man mean? Did he not understand that Ben was one of his flock? As for Ben, it was with difficulty that he could restrain his feelings while in the minister's presence. As soon as the door closed after them, he gave vent to what was apparently an uncontrollable burst of laughter. "'I hope you'll excuse me,' he said, as soon as he could speak, and he was still laughing. "'But it was so funny to see you trying to make that man know that I was there at all, and you did fail so entirely, even though I did my best to help.' I coughed twice and knocked the big brown book off the table, but that last was an accident. Then seeing that Professor Landis did not join in the laugh, but on the contrary looked grave and perhaps slightly disturbed, he essayed to turn comforter. 
Never mind, Professor. It isn't in a man like him to care for a fellow like me. If I were a book bound in calf, say, or even a great ball, it would be another thing. But being nothing but a blundering boy, what could you expect? Don't you see how it is? I don't belong in the same world, and there is no use of putting me into it. If you could make up your mind to give a fellow up, you would be more comfortable. And so would the fellow." This last, in undertone, evidently not intended for his companion's ear, but he caught the muttered words and smiled, and rallied himself. "'Ben, my dear fellow, that is nonsense. I hope you do not desire me to give up your friendship, because we have called upon a man who was preoccupied, and persisted in continuing the trains of thought which he had evidently been indulging when we interrupted him.' Mr. Edson has just returned after a long absence, you remember, and he hasn't gotten into line yet. I presume he is a good deal worn. Constant attendance upon an invalid is very wearing work, and professional men rest their brains and bodies by these athletic games, you know. Then he feels responsible for the course of lectures he was describing, and of course must push it on all possible occasions." By evening he will have been settled, and will be ready to interest himself in people. He must be fond of young people, for he is himself young, and you know what a large company of them attend his church. Do you take the southbound car? I must go the other way. Well, you will remember to call for me tomorrow evening, will you not? Oh, yes, said Ben, with a toss of his head and a half-annoyed laugh. I've given my word, and I'll be there, but I'd rather be hanged. I tell you now, honestly, there won't be any pleasure nor comfort for me at that place, and I don't understand why you want to push me in. There are lots of young people, but you know as well as I do that they are no more like me, the most of them, than that minister is, and I'm thankful to say I can't see any resemblance between us. Professor Landis laughed, and lifted his hat for good-bye, being glad as he did so that there was no time for words. He would not have liked Ben to know how utterly that minister had disappointed and dismayed him. It had been an unusual experience. He had always heretofore found in ministers his heartiest supporters in his efforts to win young men, and this man's work had seemed always to lie in the direction of young men who needed to be won away from themselves and their companions and surroundings. As he sat in the corner of the car, being carried downtown, Mr. Landis did what he seldom allowed himself to do. He went over the interview with the pastor, step by step, and worried over it. Why had a man who had to do with a church made up so largely of young people— been so unwise, so actually rude, in his dealings with one of them. True, he might not have realized that Ben attended his own church. He asked if he were a pupil of his. Perhaps he had heard of his scholars at the lower mission, and supposed Ben to be one of them. But even in that case, the lower mission had no church organization, and Mr. Edson was as much the pastor of that flock as any man was. Besides, Without regard to church or Sunday school, Ben was a boy who either belonged to the fold of Christ, or needed to be drawn thitherward. Why had not the heart of the young man responded to this possible opportunity, and greeted him as a brother? He had made excuses for him to Ben. What else was there to be done? But really, and here this Christian worker pulled himself up sharply, was he going to condemn a man, and a minister at that, because he was not always ready for work and watchfulness? Had he not himself been off guard times enough to be patient with the obtuseness of others? It was himself who was to blame for rushing the young man in, uninvited, without knowing whether the time was opportune or otherwise. If he had gone alone to make his call, and talked of reader and his temptations and needs, it would have been another matter. Whereupon he resolved, if he could possibly make time for it, he would look in upon Mr. Edson during the next day, and explain why he felt especially anxious that readers should enjoy the church social. Having settled this, 
he was the sort of man who could make time on occasion and by four o'clock of the following afternoon he was again in the pastor's study mr edson was as glad to see him as he had been the day before and quite as eager to talk this time it was the choral union which filled his thoughts the cantata of esther was to be rendered and mr edson had been appealed to as a tenor it is old music he said that old favorite revived you know and will not need much rehearsing on my part i think i will help them and i promised to look out for a bass voice are you not just the one professor it would be quite out of the question for me said professor landis quickly then he plunged headlong into the subject which had brought him to the study there was no use in waiting for favorable openings by the way mr edson the young man i brought in with me yesterday is a particular friend of mine and i am looking for friends of the right stamp for him then he described as briefly as he could ben's environments making much of the mother and father whose hopes centered in him the minister listened somewhat absently he even turned the leaves of a new magazine while he did so once he interrupted to ask why didn't the fellow stay at home and help his father and mother where he was these country chaps are always running away to the city and ruining themselves when they might at least help support the family at home that is true on general principles said his caller but in ben's case it would hardly apply his father is a carpenter of the ordinary sort and there is not work enough in the town where he lives to employ him he has a little place with an acre or two of land but there is a mortgage on it which is sapping the energies of the family ben has ambitions or had concerning that mortgage the best thing for him to do seemed to be to get employment which would bring in a little ready money for the family and with the hope of laying up something for the debt i secured the situation which the young man now holds and so feel an added responsibility for him ah said the minister they are great bores aren't they these responsibilities look here this is a clever sketch is it not one can almost see that ridiculous old fellow trying to pose as an orator and he held up the magazine at which he had been surreptitiously looking professor landis gave it a passing glance fairly well done he said now about the church social i have got reader to promise to accompany me there i had a special reason for desiring it this evening above others because here he bent forward and gave a rapid vivid picture of the peculiar temptations which were likely to coil about ben on this evening unless his friends were on the alert and his earnest desire that influences might be brought to bear upon him through the people he should meet which would tell for his future mr edson put down his magazine and listened at last but on his face was a disturbed not to say annoyed expression my dear friend he said as his collar reached a period it is evident that i must make a confession to you i am not the sort of hand-to-hand -hand workman which you suppose there are clergymen who can do that kind of a thing but i am not one of them there is a sense in which i am out of my sphere in this church though of course i do not say that aloud i do not expect to be here long it is a good place to study in because the demands of society are not what they would be in an uptown church and i expect of course to do my duty as long as i am here but my forte lies in preaching the church is very full as you see i have crowded it ever since i have been here you have noticed perhaps that since my coming a different class of people those more like yourself have been drawn in i feel that my influence is among all such the perpetual rush after bad boys and rough boys and uncouth hoydenish girls which some pastors keep up is not in me and i honestly wish i could say that my church was not the place for such i said i did not expect to remain here long that of course is entirely between us and it may depend upon what i am able to accomplish with the church if i can gradually gather about me those whom i feel i can benefit 
who are sufficiently intellectual, for instance, to be helped by my style of preaching, and those whose pocket-books are sufficient to afford me a decent salary, why, I shall remain. I am not such a stickler for location that I care a great deal about its being farther downtown than some other churches. The streets nearest us are being peopled by a very fine class, and there is no reason in life why they should waste their time in riding uptown to church, if a church to their mind can be found and sustained nearer by. But in order to get them in and make them comfortable, we must not give too much attention to the other class, who are at present quite too numerous. The plain truth is, Professor, that we ought not to expect boys like your young protégé, and men like yourself, for instance, to be fed from the same pulpit. The boy is right, there ought to be some church where both pulpit and pew would be more entirely on a level with fellows of his stamp, and where they should feel at home. I believe in mission churches most heartily, but I am not calculated to run one. I have spoken very frankly to you, confidentially indeed, for I know you to be in a sense an outsider, with no lifelong associations here to run against, and I feel the importance of explaining to you that I actually do not know how to reach young fellows like the one you brought to see me yesterday. I would like to do it if I knew how, but I do not. It is absurd to suppose that the sermon I am now at work upon, for instance, can interest him. I am sure it cannot, and it is my misfortune that there will be dozens, almost hundreds in the audience, of whom the same might be said but I preach for the few you understand, with the hope and belief that the character of the food offered will draw others of like tastes. I am sure you get my meaning, Professor. Yes, said Professor Landis, rising. I think I do. Still, I hope you will remember my boy tonight and give him a greeting. Then he went away walked the whole length of the square before he remembered that he had intended to take a car at the other corner, and as he roused himself to the present, said, with a long-drawn sigh, The man is right, he is out of his sphere. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of What They Couldn't by Pansy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. A New Departure The institution known as a church social is capable of a variety of forms. The one in which Professor Landis had with infinite pains persuaded Ben Reader to attend was different from any of his former experiences. Evidently it was held at one of the homes which Mr. Edson believed he had drawn to his church. There were a number of invited guests who did not know his church, and who believed, apparently, that they had been invited to a full-dress party. Moreover, the original members of the flock, in anticipation of such an experience, had done what they could to make their attire festive, and to give a general air of society life to the entire gathering. The result was, that in a more marked sense than Professor Landis had supposed it possible, his protégé felt out of place and miserable. In sore disappointment and dismay, this Christian worker looked about him for an ally. The pastor, on whom he had hoped to lean, was absorbed with the younger members of a new family who lived, he had informed the professor in hurried undertone, in one of those handsome houses away up the avenue, and had been twice to church. They were wealthy and cultivated. By all means, they must be held for the church around the corner. Come and be introduced. Professor Landis had excused himself on the plea that a friend was waiting for him in the hall, and promised attendance later. Then he had gone in haste to where Ben was standing, leaning drearily against the wall, listlessly watching the still-coming guests, although the hour was already late enough for him to wonder if he could not be allowed to slip away. He had done what he could to make himself smart. There was even a rose in his buttonhole, but his face was uncomfortably red, and his very hands looked self-conscious. Mr. Edson, 
who had hurriedly passed that way but a moment before, had not even recognized him by a nod. To do the man justice, his ignorance was not feigned. He did not remember some faces well, and no thought of Professor Landis's protégé had entered his mind as he passed the uncomfortable boy. "'Come with me to the library,' said the professor, slipping his hand through Ben's arm. "'I want to show you a famous picture which hangs there. It has a history, and I know you will like it. I fancy you are fond of stories, are you not?' I'm fond of anything that will take me away from that corner where I have been leaning until I have bored a hole in my best coat, I guess. I say, Professor, haven't I done penance long enough? I can be good for some time, perhaps, if you'll only let me get away from here. Ben, I am looking for the coming of some friends whom I would like to have you meet. I think they must be here very soon. If they aren't, said Ben significantly, and I have to wait for them, I guess I'll make my plans to stay to breakfast, because it's a good deal later than it was. "'Oh, Mr. Landis,' called a lady at that moment, "'come here, please. We need your assistance very much.' "'Go on,' said Ben, letting his arm drop. "'I'll wait for you in the library. No, thank you. I'm not going into that crowd of women. I'd rather wait three hours for you.' Very reluctantly, his companion turned from him. One of the ladies held an open book over which two others were leaning, and an eager discussion was evidently being carried on. It did not seem courteous to ask them to wait, and Ben had already slipped away. The library was apparently deserted, and the lonesome boy dropped into a chair with a sigh of relief. At least he was not in the way here and there was a chance for him to get his troublesome feet tucked under the window drapery. At that moment someone spoke to him. "'I wonder if this is Mr. Reeder, Professor Landis's friend?' "'That is my name,' he said, springing to his feet in astonishment. "'And I know Professor Landis.' "'Then let us consider ourselves introduced. I am Miss Cameron,' and there is scarcely a person in this house whom I have met before. I heard Professor Landis mention you once as a young friend of his, and saw him with you just now, so I determined to claim acquaintance. Mary Cameron's intimate friends would have been amazed at her gracious tone and winning smile. What new departure was this, as unlike her as possible? Truth to tell, she was somewhat surprised at herself. She had declined the invitation to the social when first given, but after consideration had suddenly resolved to go. If they must live in this part of the city, it would certainly be well to have some speaking acquaintances. She had exchanged calls with the daughters of the hostess and knew them to be unexceptionable. She had not been out in company for several weeks, and was bored with the commonplaces and wearinesses of her life. Lucia was housed at home with toothache, and felt unamiable and selfish, and Aunt Eunice was always in the sitting-room evenings. To escape anywhere would be a relief. With no better motives than these, she had come to the church social. Her dress was severely plain, and simplicity itself. She had by no means chosen her best attire. Her idea of the congregation on Smith Street was that it was crowded with common people, and although the Kincaids had opened their house for the evening to entertain them, of course the people would remain common. It was embarrassing, and in a sense disappointing, to find herself mistaken. Mr. Edson was apparently right about the class of people whom he was drawing to his church. These were certainly well-bred, and, if they had not been too much dressed for a church gathering, would have commended themselves to Mary Cameron as cultured. They had not, however, the best culture. They seemed to be well acquainted, to enjoy one another's society, and to give exceedingly small attention to strangers. The result had been that Miss Cameron felt more alone than she had ever been before. She had not even met Professor Landis yet, 
it was perhaps the feeling of loneliness which gave her a sudden sense of sympathy with ben reader moreover she had not forgotten professor landis's appeal to her for help being a new experience it made a deep impression help of that sort at least had never before been asked of her during the time which had intervened since her conversation with professor landis mary cameron had done much thinking the shadow of disgrace which she could not help feeling had fallen upon them through the action of her brothers had made her shrink from the company of her acquaintances and spend most of her time alone she was haunted by the fear that people old acquaintances of rod and mac had heard of their act such stories she believed always leaked out somehow and were always exaggerated what if they were discussing her brothers and blaming them and commiserating the family and wondering whether the bill could be paid by the already overburdened father and wondering if there would be more bills of a like nature in the future in these and a dozen other ways she had tormented herself her father and mother after the first outburst of misery seemed to have settled down to face the inevitable what had been written to the boys mary did not know nor did she understand how her father had managed the bill it was paid he assured her but he had not chosen to be more explicit and had looked so worn and burdened that she had not liked to question thereafter by common consent the subject had been dropped lucia knew nothing of what had occurred nor of course did emily mary rejoiced over this fact but all the more felt the necessity of doing her brooding in secret it was all these things which helped her to remember ben reader professor landis was looking out for him trying in all ways to help him if a good and true man such as the professor evidently was had interested himself for her brothers would they have been different young men from what they now were not that they were in any sense on a level with ben reader she could not help curling her lip even in the privacy of her own room over such an idea the boys were splendid fellows but then there were young men who would not have done what they had who were superior in many ways to them she admitted it to herself she would not have borne a hint of it from another professor landis had said that boys could be helped by women older than themselves she cast about their circle of acquaintances to see if there was one woman who had possibly been helpful to her brothers and smiled in a sarcastic way at the thought there were numberless young women some of them older than the boys who had been glad apparently to receive their attentions to help them spend money for concert and lecture tickets and creams and caramels and what not but as for helping them well why should she blame them she had never helped anybody either and she had attended many lectures and parties with young men still she had never been among those women who sought friendships with persons younger than themselves perhaps if she had she might have accomplished a little good in the world somewhat to this young woman's bewilderment she found herself at times yearning to accomplish good when had she ever thought of such things before possibly you understand the subtle mixture of motives which made her suddenly resolve to introduce herself to young reader it was a sudden resolve nothing had been further from her thoughts until she saw him dropping into the library chair in a bewildered attitude having been apparently deserted by his one friend her friendly way of introducing herself had been different from ben's former experience with city ladies and made him feel on familiar terms he resolved to be entirely frank with her i want to get out of this awfully he said it is nothing but a horrid bore if you are a friend of professor landis i wish you could coax him to let me alone i mean about such places he does it for my good you know but upon my word it will be bad for me if i have to go to many more of them to please him i think i shall go hang myself to be rid of it all she laughed amusedly 
she had never heard a society young man go on in this way don't you like church socials she asked i hate em said ben with energy feeling an immense sense of relief in being able to give vent to his feelings i hate this one the worst of all they haven't had eating in the others but they have even added that horror to this one miss cameron laughed again in genuine merriment what is your objection to eating she asked i thought young men were always ready for refreshment of that sort he shook his head with a serio-comic air not in such places if they had some of mother's doughnuts to give a fellow and her and the girls to wait on them why then his voice choked in spite of himself and he came to a sudden halt while a mist gathered in his eyes a moment before he would have scoffed at the idea of his being homesick but the mention of his mother's doughnuts had been too much miss cameron was interested and touched she had not known that boys away from home felt like that. "'There is nothing here half so good as your mother's doughnuts, of course,' she said gently, more gently than some people knew she could speak. "'But the coffee is very nice, and there are some dainty little cakes which fairly melt in one's mouth. You must be sure to try them before you go.' He shook his head. "'It isn't the things.' he said speaking disdainfully as one who resented both his own weakness and the idea that this woman should suppose that he cared only for doughnuts it's the everlasting style they put on the not knowing whether it is the big spoon or the little spoon you must use or whether you ought to let them both alone and take the coffee with your fork and whether you must swallow things when you hate em because everybody else is doing it and whether you take two kinds of things or only one. You see, the whole jumble is what bothers me. It was partly fun now. He saw that he was amusing her, but that it was a sympathetic amusement. In truth, she was very sympathetic. She knew all about spoons and forks and the small conventionalities of society life. But could she forget how great had been her embarrassment over the absence of many of these society extras on that day that hateful luncheon was served the array must be bewildering she said cheerily to one who has lived a pleasant home life heretofore and is just beginning to belong to the big world but after all it is very easily managed after a little experience suppose you take me out to the refreshment room and let me pilot you through its mysteries I want you to try those little cakes, and I promise to explain just how many may be eaten at once. Her eyes were dancing with amusement, but all the time there was that note of cordial friendliness in her voice, born of an honest desire in her heart to be useful to this country youth. Ben Reader was quick to feel the difference between her manner and the cold and formal civilities he had heretofore received from the women who belonged to this new world professor landis's words about having independence enough to take help where help was offered also came to aid him and he surprised himself by frankly accepting the suggestion fifteen minutes later professor landis having escaped from the young ladies with inquiring minds was seeking everywhere for his protege in distress lest he had escaped and sought the smith boys after all he came upon him at last to his utter astonishment in the room where refreshments were being informally served he was holding a cup of chocolate but giving amused attention to his companion who was apparently describing something in an animated way and the professor's astonishment was no whit abated to discover that the speaker was miss cameron i cannot tell you how much i thank you he said to her nearly an hour later when ben had at last been permitted to take his departure his eyes had been bright with interest when he came to say good night and his words had been hearty upon my word and honor professor i've actually had a good time that i should live to confess it that woman is tip-top she puts me awfully in mind of my sister sarah 
That is, I think she is some like what Sarah would have been if she had had chances, you know. Church socials and that sort of thing. His gray eyes twinkled with fun. You know what I mean, don't you? It seems as though she was like our kind of folks that had been with the other kind long enough to learn all they knew, and yet hadn't forgotten her common sense. The way she put me through out there at the supper room was a caution. I know which fork is which, Professor, and spoons, too. You can't stump me with them again. When did you meet forks and spoons under formidable circumstances? asked Professor Landis, with a laugh almost as hearty as Ben's own. Why, that little Darlington fellow that you introduced me to tried to take me up and couldn't. He had me go home with him to dinner one night. It was raining cats and dogs, and I had to wait for a package to take back to the office, or I wouldn't have done it. And I got all tangled up among the forks and spoons and things, and his face got red as a beet because I used the wrong ones, and his little sister laughed outright. I've been afraid of em ever since, the forks and spoons, I mean, and six or eight different kinds of napkins. But she straightened them out. I say, Professor, why haven't you given me a chance with her kind of folks before? No wonder the Professor was grateful, and to think that it should have been Miss Cameron. He was a good deal bewildered. Had his entire estimate of the girl been at fault, or was she playing a part? If she was, it had certainly been a very kind, friendly part, and had put Ben more at his ease than he had ever seen him. He wondered whether it would do to tell her about the sister Sarah, and our kind of folks, and decided that it would not. But the voice was very pleasant in which he said, I cannot tell you how much I thank you. You have given my boy a pleasant hour tonight, and it was just when I was at my wit's end how to hold him longer, though there were special reasons why he ought to be held. You have done a very kind thing tonight, Miss Cameron. He could not be more surprised than she was with herself. Why had Ben interested her so much? He was a new experience in every way a bright, merry boy, who had evidently looked up to her with admiration as to a superior being, and had been ready to follow her lead, yet he had been as original and entertaining as any one she had ever met. If that was the way to do good, she was sure she did not object to doing it. There was nothing to thank her for, she told Professor Landis. The hour she had spent with his protégé had been the pleasantest one of the evening. His eccentricities had amused her. "'He is a good-hearted boy,' she said, her face softening at the thought of some of his half-merry, half-serious, and wholly tender words about his mother. "'It is only the exterior which needs polish. He is coming to call upon me, Professor Landis. I have promised to play some pieces for him which he used to sing for his mother,' and a new one that he is learning to surprise her when he goes home. And Professor Landis, who had really taken this boy to his heart, and troubled over him more than he himself realized, felt such a sudden sense of relief at the thought of this home opening to him, that he could not help putting intense feeling into his words, as he said, "'God bless you, Miss Cameron!' It was certainly pleasant to discover one's self to be of use. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of What They Couldn't by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13: A Good Fellow in Every Way. There were other experiences connected with that eventful social which need to be chronicled. It was after Ben Reader had departed, and Mr. Landis was wondering whether he could be spared to do likewise, that he was waylaid in the hall by a new acquaintance. "'I say, Landis,' said Mr. Kennedy, seizing his arm familiarly, "'I want an introduction to the lady with whom you were just speaking.' I have noticed her several times this evening, and asked two others to oblige me, 
but they were not acquainted with her. Mr. Landis hesitated, and there was a slight trace of embarrassment in his manner. I will ask if I may do so, he replied at last. She is not an intimate acquaintance, and I am not privileged to take liberties. Then he passed on quickly, unable to overcome a feeling of annoyance. He had met Mr. Kennedy but once before, and had not been prepossessed by his manner. Why, it would perhaps have been difficult to explain. He was not accustomed to people who addressed him as Landis, or who seized hold of him in that offhand manner. But these were certainly not reasons on which to base any opinion of character. Still, he tried to be conscientiously careful of his introductions. There were responsibilities enough without assuming such as these, but when one was asked, he sought his host and questioned. Kennedy? Oh, he is a fine fellow, a nephew of Dr. Eustace Kennedy on Boulevard Avenue. He is on here from New York on business for his firm. A good fellow in every way, I presume. Mr. Landis came slowly back in search of Miss Cameron. You will remember I do not vouch for him, Miss Cameron. He is an entire stranger to me, but he asked for an introduction. Mary Cameron smiled coldly. He seemed to her unnecessarily particular. She did not believe in treating people as suspicious characters until they could prove the contrary. Mr. Kennedy was evidently pleased with his acquaintance. He devoted himself to her during the remainder of the evening, up to the moment when she disappeared within the dressing room to make ready for her waiting father. During this time he had asked and received gracious permission to call at the Cameron home, Miss Cameron being more suave than usual in order to mark to herself her disapproval of Mr. Landis's evident coldness of manner. He wants his boy Ben patronized in every possible way, she told herself, but when one comes who is on the same level in society with ourselves, he must needs explain who is his grandfather and how far back the family can be traced before one may be friendly with him. Nor did it atone for his caution to realize what her conscience told her, that it was character and not position which Professor Landis required in his friends. Of what use to be painfully particular even about that? Why inquire into one's exact past, root out every little fault and failing, and make them an excuse for withholding one's friendship? She felt sure that Professor Landis would be just that sort of man, and she resented it. Poor Mary Cameron was sore-hearted about character in these days. It was something new to have to wince over the possible stains in the Cameron name. The Christmas holidays had come and gone, and her brothers had spent them away from home for the first time in their lives. No one but the father knew just what sort of a letter was sent them, but, whatever it was, they had resented it, had written loftily, that is, McLeod had, the younger brother did not write at all. He had assured his father that he was not aware that he had committed so heinous an offense. Other boys, his classmates in college, shopped on their father's name whenever they chose, and their accounts were always honored and no questions asked. They had always been very careful, he and Rod, had gone without many things which to others in their set were considered necessities in order to save their father from unnecessary expense, but they certainly had not understood that they were expected to go without clothes. Perhaps they would better both leave college without more ado and get positions as day laborers or something of the sort if their father really could not afford to let them appear like others. As for coming home for the vacation, since they had apparently so disgraced themselves and the entire family, it was not probable that anybody would want to see them. They both had invitations to spend the holidays with classmates, and had decided, in view of the last letter they had received, to accept them. Over this letter Mrs. Cameron had shed bitter tears. Her boys were her idols. To live through Christmas and New Year without them, seemed more than her much-enduring heart could bear. 
she blamed her husband with bitterness. She told him it was no wonder the boys felt as they did, after the letter he had probably written. She gave no heed, or at least apparently no credence, to his earnest attempt at explanation. He had not written bitterly, he assured her. He had spoken of their act as it deserved, spoken truthfully. He did not dare do otherwise. But he had told them that he did not believe they would have done it had they stopped to think, and that he forgave them, and would pay the bill, and never, of course, let any outsider know it was contracted without his consent. Oh, yes! she had replied. You spoke truthfully, no doubt. You made them angry with your cold hard truths, and you have driven them from you and from their mother. If they go wrong now, you will have yourself to thank. Some of this talk had been in Mary's presence, Mrs. Cameron having so far forgotten herself as to ignore it. The result had been curious. Mary, the only one of the girls who had been made acquainted with the real reason for the boy's absence during the holidays, had found her sympathies being drawn in two opposite directions. There were times when she felt that her father had done just right. Who would speak plainly to the boys if he did not? Of course they ought to be reproved, and sharply, for taking matters into their own hands in that way. It was absurd to say that they had done it thoughtlessly. Whatever thoughtlessness any of the Cameron family might be guilty of, surely there was no excuse for their spending money without due consideration. It had never been plentiful enough, at least since they children were grown, to warrant any such proceeding. This she said very distinctly to their mother, calling forth a burst of tears and the statement that the boys never had any help or comfort in their sisters. She did not know how it was, some brothers leaned upon their elder sisters and were guided by them, but her girls were more interested in other people's brothers. This was hard, and she did not mean it. She was sure that the brothers were tenderly loved, and she did not understand enough of what their sisters might have done to intelligently reproach them. Yet the accusation stung. Mary was beginning to realize that there was truth in it. She did not admit it, however, to her mother, but replied with cold dignity, after which each went to her own room and was miserable. But there were other times when, in the bitterness of her disappointment at not having the boys at home for the holidays, as usual, Mary blamed her father and let him know that she did. "'You are mistaken, Mary,' he said to her one day, "'in supposing that I was severe with the boys, as I see you do. I could not tell them other than the truth. You would hardly have had me commend them for their act, I suppose,' but I assured them that if the thing never occurred again, it should be forgiven and forgotten, and that I would pay the bill just as soon as I could. I scarcely see how you could have said more, was her hard reply. Fathers forgive and forget even grave crimes, do they not? At least we read in books about the infinite patience and forgiveness of good fathers, and to use the same language to the boys as you would had they been guilty of forgery or something equally dreadful, must have been hard to bear. Then the father had sighed and turned away, feeling that there was no sympathy for him anywhere, and he questioned with himself as to whether his standard of morals was too high for this present world. Then Mary, in her efforts to make amends to her mother for the lack of sympathy she had shown, and the words which ought not to have been spoken, essayed, the next time they met, to comfort her by regretting in unsparing terms the letter which had kept the boys away. If father had let one of them write, instead, all would have been well. Men do not know how to deal with such things." She wondered at father for not knowing that the boys would have been much better managed by their mother. Whereupon Mary, in her turn, was dismayed and vexed to be answered coldly to the effect that her father probably knew what was best to be done without asking advice from his children. 
he had always been a good and self-sacrificing father she was sure there could be no reason why his children should suppose that he had suddenly failed them as to writing a harsh letter to the boys she had never believed that he did harshness was foreign to his nature and mary would oblige her by not adding to her burdens at this time by censuring him perhaps it is not to be wondered at in the midst of all these conflicting views that mary was bewildered and sore-hearted and at times more unreasonable than ever before it was the restlessness which had grown out of this state of things which helped to send her to the church social and it was a curious desire to experiment and learn whether there was really anything which she could do to help a boy that had led her to introduce herself to ben reader perhaps there was never a girl more ready to be influenced either for good or ill than was mary cameron just at this time but for lucia's and emily's unfortunate teasing in connection with professor landis she would have allowed herself to enjoy his society and be influenced by his words but the feeling that emily at least was on the alert and would be likely to watch for ways to amuse her young friends at their expense held this self-conscious woman from the help of which she was in such need if thoughtless girls could only in some way be made to realize the mischief which their tongues may do in the name of mere fun what a blessing it would be to the world mr kennedy was a different type of man from any who had heretofore crossed miss cameron's path lucia had more than one gentleman acquaintance who pleased themselves while with her by little special attentions and sudden graceful turns in their sentences calculated to impress her with the fact that she was more interesting to them than was any other human being and lucia accepted these gaily for what they were worth and knew too little about the truest refinement to understand that she thereby brushed some of the bloom from her life's fruitage but mary's innate sense of honesty had instinctively repelled all such friendships most people were apt when with her to express only what they meant either mr kennedy was an exception or he meant a great deal for a new acquaintance mary cameron who was as has been said sore-hearted and half afraid of her friends welcomed this new peculiarly deferential manner as something unusually pleasant when mr kennedy called which he did as soon as propriety allowed the good impression which he had made was deepened he was certainly very agreeable and more gentlemanly emily declared than any man she had ever seen except professor landis mr cameron who rarely commented upon the guests at his house said that the young man had a head on his shoulders and probably knew how to use it he was connected with a leading business firm in new york dear me said emily i wish he would fall desperately in love with me and ask me to elope with him it would be so nice to get a little money into this family i shouldn't much care how it came so that we got it why need you elope asked lucia if you could only bring the first mentioned wish to pass couldn't the rest be carried out in a respectable manner befitting the cameron grandfather oh i don't know laughed emily i suppose there would be some bothersome hindrance about my being too young to know my own mind and all that sort of thing but i'm not i can assure you my mind is to have money all i want for myself and plenty to spare for all the rest of you and as i said before i am not particular how i get it i would even allow a husband to be thrown in if there were no other way in my day said aunt eunice severely girls hardly into their teens did not jest about love and marriage and matters of that kind they had too much self-respect emily giggled i did not say a word about love she declared it was money and marriage aunt eunice and you may depend upon it that if i find upon diligent inquiry that mr kennedy has plenty of money i'll do my best to coax him to decide for one of us 
I don't particularly care which one, so that it is in the family. It seemed not worth while to anybody but Aunt Eunice to make any reply to such barefaced nonsense. But she continued the argument, if argument it could be called, provoking by her very gravity more daring nonsense still from the giddy girl, who finally verged so near the impudent that her mother had to silence her. Mary, however, remembered and thought seriously over one or two of her sister's sentences. Money was what the family sorely needed. Her father's air of settled anxiety, and her mother's alternate fits of melancholy and nervous unrest, emphasized this thought daily. Retrenchment was, more than ever before, the order of the household. Emily's expensive music lessons had at last been given up, to her great delight, and even the dancing lessons were threatened, but the child was so miserable over yielding those that her mother had not the heart to insist. She economized in whatever way she could, or thought she did, but to a student of even ordinary economy, the number of daily leaks which were allowed by these people, who did not know how to economize, would have been amusing if it had not been pitiful. Mary, as she went over in her weary mind the condition of things, admitted with Emily that a wealthy marriage to a good, careless man, who would be willing to lavish such money on his wife, and care little as to what became of it, would be a great blessing to the family. And if this Mr. Kennedy was... She broke off there to say to herself indignantly that of course no respectable girl would marry for money but then he was very pleasant, all the family liked him, and if he really cared for one, what would prevent one's learning to be quite fond of him? As the days passed, there grew to be more occasion for thought of this character, for it began to be increasingly apparent that Mr. Kennedy cared, and for Mary Cameron herself. His attentions, which were at first distributed with great cordiality among the entire family circle, not excepting Aunt Eunice, gradually centred so much, that Emily began to say, with an air of great apparent relief, I do believe it is to be a rich brother-in-law instead of a husband. How nice! I shall like it ever so much better. They always give candies and things to young sisters-in-law. I've read that in books ever so many times, and those he gave me last night were delicious. Hyler's very own. I was the envy of half the girls in school today on account of them. For some reason not understood by herself, Mary was not disturbed by all this. She made no attempt to check Emily's exuberant satisfaction, and to her frequent reference to Mr. Kennedy's propensity for bringing her candies, made no other comment than that, if she ever should be in a position to bestow gifts, she would remember how easily Emily's tastes were satisfied. Nor did she, amid all these pressing possibilities of her life, forget the boy whose gratitude she had won at the social. At last Ben Reader summoned courage to make the call, which, somewhat to his astonishment, he had promised. He found Mary at home, in the family sitting-room, which was in fact the back parlour, and because the piano was there, she determined to entertain her caller in the presence of the entire family. Ben was at first much dismayed at meeting not one, but five ladies, and Emily exerted herself to the utmost to make him feel at ease. Lucia, at an utter loss as to why he had come, was interested in his frank, boyish face, and seconded Mary's efforts. The result was that Ben laid aside his embarrassment, and before the evening was over, showed his bright, fun-loving spirit and his genial good sense to such advantage, that one and all declared after he had gone that he was really very pleasant and bright if he was a country boy." He reminds me of a boy I used to know ever so far back when I was a boy myself, said Mr. Cameron, with a pathetic little sigh which was apt to accompany any reference to his early life. 
Where did you pick him up, Mary? He was at the church social which was held at the Kincaids, you remember. The pastor of the church is interested in him, I believe, and wanted to help him through the dangers of city life. I promised to play his songs for him if he would call. He has a pleasant voice, has he not? He would really make an excellent singer if his voice could be cultivated. She hurried over the explanation. There was in her mind an unaccountable aversion to mentioning Professor Landis in connection with Ben. Of course, it was the pastor of the church who was mainly interested, she told herself. Pastors always were. It was probably he who had set Professor Landis on the boy's track. How else would a teacher come in contact with a boy who was clerk in a store and had never been to anything but a district school? At all events, she was not going to set Emily off with some of her nonsense by admitting that Professor Landis had asked her to be kind to Ben. No comment was made on her explanation, save by Emily. I think better of that, Mr. Edson, if he has really taken time to think of a boy from the country, she said complacently. I didn't suppose he ever brought his lofty mind down to such trifles. Why, Emily, said her father, a little amused, as he always was by this youngest daughter's comments, what do you know of Mr. Edson? Not much, father, and I can't say that I want to. He seems, well, stuck up. There are no other words that will express it. I was in Hartenberg's the other night when he came in with Miss Kincaid. They stopped at the notion counter where I stood talking with Nellie Evans. He chattered away to Miss Kincaid like a magpie and never even noticed Nellie, though she is a member of his church. After they had gone out, I asked if that wasn't her pastor and if she hadn't been introduced to him. Oh, yes, she said. She had been introduced five or six times. Somebody was always introducing them. But he never remembered her for all that, unless he happened to see her in the Bible class. I shouldn't like such a minister, Father. Nellie Evans is as good as Miss Kincaid if she does have to sell crimpers and things to her behind Hartenberg's counter. Oh, well said Mrs. Cameron, feeling that she ought to apologize for a minister. A young man like him cannot be expected to remember all that swarm of young people without years of practice. But Emily nodded her head sagely as she said, I'll venture this yard of crochet that he remembers Miss Kincaid whenever he sees her. And Mary, a heightened color on her cheeks, wondered if he really was interested in Ben Reader, and whether she had been quite as truthful as usual. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of What They Couldn't by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 – A New Game not only Mr. Kennedy, but Ben Reader, came again. They met one evening in the Cameron back parlor. Ben had arrived first, and was domiciled with the family, having a good time, when Mr. Kennedy was announced. "'May I not join the circle?' he asked, as the parted curtains revealed Emily in the act of initiating Ben into the mysteries of Halma. "'It looks very homelike in that room.' They made a place for him around the center table. Ideas of economy had drawn this family closer together than had been their habit of late years. The winter was a cold one, and the furnace, after the manner of those eccentric creatures, frequently chose the back parlor as the room into which it delighted to pour its heat. Therefore the back parlor was by common consent chosen for the family room. Then, one drop light could be made to do for several things, and Mrs. Cameron fell into the habit of bringing her work to it. It was Mr. Cameron's custom to give his evenings to the daily papers. Often of late, he brought pencil and paper instead, and figured over weary lines of figures, apparently in a hopeless effort to make their sum less. 
the girls chose the room because their own was cold and having nothing in particular to do they toyed with bits of fancy work and rejoiced when the bell announced a possible relief even ben reader had been welcomed with smiles he was bright and good-natured and brought news sometimes from a part of the world about which they knew little and over which emily at least was curious on the evening in question the entire family was present aunt eunice with her interminable knitting lucia trifling over her crochet and emily whose books had been dropped that she might instruct ben in the game mr cameron had his columns of figures but put them aside when mr kennedy was announced and welcomed him with a look of relief with a heightened color on mary's part but a resolute air ben was introduced of course mr kennedy would wonder how a boy like him came to be at home in their circle but it could not be helped she would not copy what she despised in others and ignore him apparently there was no need to worry over the result mr kennedy accepted ben without a questioning glance and included him in the conversation a little later when mary was at the piano and mr kennedy had been turning the music she took occasion to give the explanation which she thought was due our young guest is new to city life and ways mr kennedy as i suppose you have observed the truth is he is a homesick boy who has few friends worthy of the name and some enemies in the guise of friends and you are trying to supply him with the one and hold him from the other i understand said mr kennedy with a lighting up of his handsome face that is certainly kind and is the sort of thoughtfulness which i should expect especially from you i appreciate it more than you think perhaps i was a homeless boy myself once then miss cameron's truthfulness came to her aid at least she could not listen to commendations which were not her due you give me too much credit mr kennedy i am quite new at any such attempt and should never have thought of it had it not been suggested to me by another person he laughed lightly you have not a very true estimate of yourself i think i have observed it before however it is a failing so rare that one is tempted to admire rather than quarrel with it i like your boy's face it will give me pleasure to second your efforts in any way that i can evidently this was not mere words they went back presently to the circle around the table and mr kennedy drew his chair near to the players and supplemented emily's careless teaching devoting himself to the side of the learner with such skill that ben was the winner if you are fond of games he said while ben was rejoicing over his victory come and see me some evening and i will put you in the way of having one which is even more interesting than halma what is it emily asked jealous for her favorite but mr kennedy's attention had already been called elsewhere and he did not hear the question after that evening the friendship between mr kennedy and mary cameron made rapid progress on some pretext or other he managed to be with her a part at least of every evening he took her to choice concerts and lectures he took her one moonlight evening on a wonderful sleigh ride behind two swift flying ponies he took her to the art gallery to examine a certain rare picture which they forgot to examine so absorbed did they become in each other's society it was but the evening before mr kennedy must return to new york and he did not know when it would be his privilege to visit her city again he told her in fact it depended upon her entirely whether he should ever care to come again after that how could they remember the picture they were late in getting home and mrs cameron herself opened the door to them oh mother are you still up asked mary and something in the tone of her voice made her mother turn and look closely at her is mr cameron up also asked mr kennedy eagerly is he in the back parlor then may i not go in at once and have a few minutes with him 
consider mary how little time there will be to-morrow he gave himself consent being apparently too eager to wait for a demur and mrs cameron wondering yet understanding followed mary into the dining-room whither she had escaped oh mother she said her cheeks aglow he does rush things so what made you let him talk to father to-night he did not wait for my permission what is it that he wants daughter oh mother don't you know and yet it is all so sudden i do not wonder at your question i understand said mrs cameron all the mother in her heart coming into eyes and voice oh it is not so sudden to me i have seen for days that he meant to get my girl away from me if he could i am only half glad mary i do not know that a mother could be expected to be more it is in the nature of things of course but you are the oldest you know it will be the first break mary are you sure you are doing what is the best for your happiness oh mother i am not sure of anything it is sudden to me he took me by surprise i thought he liked me a little but one can never tell i have thought she came to a sudden pause the color flaming over her face she had almost said i have thought so before of one other person and it meant nothing why should she think of russell denham now assuredly she did not want to call him to the remembrance of her mother she went upstairs in a fever of excitement refusing to wait and see mr kennedy again as mrs cameron suggested refusing to give her mother any more words tell him i had to go to my room she said pausing halfway up the stairs in answer to the appeal for a message at least for mr kennedy i will see him in the morning at whatever hour he can come i could not wait to-night it is so late mother i can't i don't want to see him again i want to think think repeated mrs cameron with a troubled look it seems to me that the thinking should have come before but she spoke to herself mary had fled the next day the entire cameron family were in a state of subdued excitement indeed on emily's part the word subdued does not apply she was wild with delight the very brother-in-law i would have selected from the whole united states i do believe she declared i used to think i liked professor landis better than any other gentleman and i think i do yet but i am saving him for myself and mr kennedy comes next such jolly times as he will give me when he is once married and settled down i do hope mary you are not going to keep him waiting long you can't long engagements are gone entirely out it is the style now to be married within a very few months after the formal announcement is made when will it be mary i haven't the least idea said mary with composure what a ridiculous child you are emily i don't believe you will ever grow up oh yes i shall i shall blossom into young ladyhood now in a night i shall have to to keep lucy a company what is the good of being a young lady when there is no chance for fun now i shall have a rich sister to visit and she can make parties and things for me and dress me to fit the occasions won't it be jolly amid the laughter that the girl's manner more than her words called forth lucia said i think that the prospective brother-in-law ought to be warned if he were a millionaire he would hardly be equal to the demand which you could make how do you know you are to have a rich sister why of course i am mr kennedy is a nephew of the kennedy tribe and they are all as rich as jews he is a member of their firm and so of course he has lots of money that is the only drawback to professor landis professors are always poor aren't they they are in books poor but learned you know i don't know how i'll manage that for i always thought i should never marry a poor man mary you will have a carriage right away won't you and ponies and a coachman 
I always thought a coachman belonging to a family would be the height of bliss. And make him wear livery, too. You might use mother's coat of arms. Wouldn't that be fine? For almost the first time in her grown-up life, Emily's nonsense did not jar on her sister's nerves. On the contrary, she enjoyed it. The girl was absurd, of course, but there was an underlying truth in her fun which soothed Mary Cameron's heart. She had come to the rescue of her family. This genial, merry-hearted young man, who had lavished money on her so freely during their short acquaintance, would be almost sure to let her do as she would with large sums. What would she not do for the girls whose lives had been so cramped for the lack of a few dollars, for the overburdened father whose constantly increasing anxieties had eaten like a canker into her heart, for the mother who had sacrificed in many ways for her, as Mary knew well, though she had never acted as though she did, above all for the boys who were held away from their home because of poverty. She felt sure she could manage it so that the remainder of their college course need not be crippled in such petty ways as it had been heretofore. Oh, it was blissful to think of all the joy she could pour into this home life. She, who had, in her secret heart, longed to do something for them all, and had felt so impotent that it had kept her irritable and unlovely. They should all see now how much she loved them, and how royally she could show it. During this entire first day of her engagement, this thought remained uppermost. At three o'clock, Mr. Kennedy hurried away to catch a New York train. There were no tears to mar the closing minutes of his stay. He was coming back so soon, and was such a short distance away at any time, that it did not seem worth while to be gloomy over his absence. Besides, there was no time. While they stood at the window watching him run for his car, having waited with an assurance characteristic of him until the very last moment, a messenger boy arrived with a dispatch from the long-delayed Rachel, announcing her coming on the 450 train, whereupon the family excitement was turned into a new channel. The daughter and sister, who had been absent for so many years as to seem almost a stranger to the younger ones, and whose probable coming had been heralded and deferred so many times as to give them almost the feeling that she would never come at all, was now unexpectedly at the very door. "'The idea!' said Mrs. Cameron. "'On the 450 train! Why, there will barely be time to meet it! Your father will have to be telephoned at once. Run, Emily, and attend to it, and tell him to be sure to go himself, for I cannot, and none of you girls would know her. Not know our own sister! Emily exclaimed. How absurd that seems! I believe I should know her by instinct. Why, we would know her from her photograph, of course. This probability was discussed and it was finally agreed that since Rachel had not even sent them a photograph in two years, and was at the age when two years make great changes, it was hardly to be supposed that she would be recognized. Emily finally gave up the desire she had to meet her at the train, doing it, however, in a characteristic manner. "'After all, I don't believe I want to meet her. It is awfully pokey standing around a railway station with a stranger.' one never knows what to say, and if you have thought of something and shouted it out, it isn't heard in the din, and by the time it is repeated, it sounds so silly you are vexed with yourself for having said it at all. I'll wait and welcome my lady at home. It is queer to be half afraid of my own sister, but that is exactly my state of mind. It was the unexpressed state of mind of every one of them, the mother not accepted. Six years make such differences, even with one's own children. At eight o'clock of that same evening, the newcomer was alone in the back parlor, which had been lighted brilliantly in honor of her homecoming. The family had been together there since dinner, and but a moment before had scattered. Mr. Cameron had reported that he must go out to a board meeting, 
much against his will. Mrs. Cameron had been summoned to the kitchen with a view to the morning meal. Lucia had been obliged to accompany Emily to the latter's dancing class, and Mary had excused herself for a few minutes on the plea that some last arrangements for the new sister's comfort were necessary. They had all, despite their best intentions, treated her as though she were a guest, a loved and honoured guest indeed, but still it was not an ideal homecoming. The truth is, it had not been possible to be quite natural. Even Aunt Eunice seemed to have been stirred out of her usual grim calm. "'Poor child!' she had said when she greeted Rachel, and then her eyes had grown suddenly dim. After dinner she went directly to her room, no one knew wherefore. So Rachel was for the moment alone. She arose from her easy chair and wandered into the shadows of the long front parlour, where a single gas jet burned faintly. She found her way to the low, wide mantel, leaned her arm on it, bowed her young head upon her arm, and thought. It would be very strange to let the tears come, now that she was really at home, but they were very near the surface. She had parted only that day with Cousin John, and Cousin John had been her brother for six years. Just at that moment came Mr. Kennedy from the car at the corner, and sprang up the steps of the Cameron home. The curtains had not been drawn, and he saw, or thought he saw, Mary Cameron leaning in a dejected attitude against the mantel, her face hidden on her arm. It was reasonable to suppose that she was being desolate because she missed him. He would give her a surprise, if it could be managed skillfully. "'I will announce myself,' he said to the astonished Betsy, when she answered his ring, for Betsy, with the rest of the family, believed this man to be well on his way to New York. "'Your mistress is in the front parlour, I notice, and you need not mention my coming to the others. That is a good girl.' He emphasized his direction by something hard and shining which he slipped into the girl's hand, and she went smiling away. If he wanted to see Miss Mary without being bothered by the others, why shouldn't he? He went swiftly and silently toward the bowed figure robed in black, as he had seen Mary that day, and as, in the dimly lighted room, he believed he saw her still, bent over her and kissed lightly the fair outline of cheek which was all of her face that was visible. Then there was a sudden uplifting of a haughty head, and a pair of cheeks that blazed turned toward him, while a strange voice said, "'What does this?' and stopped and began again on the instance. "'Can this be—you cannot be—one of my brothers, Rod or Mac?' Mr. Kennedy, who was at first dumbfounded, was a quick-witted man and took in the probable situation. "'I beg ten thousand pardons,' he said, "'and I hardly know how to explain myself unless you have heard of me. You are Rachel Cameron, I am sure, and I thought you were your sister Mary. Have you been at home long enough to have heard of Willis Kennedy? No? Then I must explain further.' I am neither Rod nor Mac, but I am nevertheless entitled to a brother's consideration. Your sister Mary is my promised wife, but I assure you I did not intend to claim relationship in such wild fashion. I thought to take her by surprise. The color slowly faded from the fair face, and Rachel gave him the benefit of a very frank, bright smile. It would be absurd to be dignified with even a stranger under such circumstances. "'I understand,' she said, in a voice which was singularly pure. "'I have been at home for a few hours only, not long enough for confidences, unless they are surprised out of one. But I am very glad to extend a sisterly greeting, if I may.' And she held out her hand. "'And then to call my sister.' "'She is not expecting me,' he explained, I am supposed to be nearing New York at this moment, but I missed my train, lucky fellow that I nearly always am, and cannot get away now until midnight. 
there were some tiresome complications connected with the delay telegrams to send and replies to wait for or i should have been here sooner in time to welcome you perhaps i have the advantage of you miss rachel having heard you mentioned frequently but i was not aware that you were expected to-day upon my word muttered this young man as rachel cameron having lingered to respond to his explanations went finally in search of her sister upon my word she is as delicious a specimen as i have ever struck has the air of a queen and can be as gracious as one and as indignant how her beautiful eyes blazed over my greeting a lively beginning for a prospective brother-in-law i will admit but i cannot say i regret it if a fellow had only met her sooner eh and she were the uncle's favourite what then nonsense of course i do not mean anything of the kind i wonder if mary will appreciate my breathless dash up here to give her an hour or two of my precious time and i wonder if her sister will tell her of my mistake i certainly shall not End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of what they couldn't by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen catherine spelled with a k some of those last sentences need explanation in order to give it it will be necessary to return to the evening in which mr kennedy was introduced to miss cameron arrived at his boarding-house after the social he found his cousin Eustace Kennedy waiting for him. Eustace Kennedy was the son of a leading physician in the city, and was himself a lawyer of fair promise. Dr. Kennedy's uptown house was supposed to be too far away from business centers for his nephew's convenience. At least the young man was very willing to make that an excuse for finding other quarters during his stay in the city the stately mansion where everyday life was managed in a dignified and methodical way was not at all to this young man's taste he knew very little of his preoccupied uncle and was not especially fond of him and there were no young people except the aforesaid cousin the two men did not assimilate very well and by mutual consent saw extremely little of each other though they were friendly enough when they chanced to meet in view of this state of things it was a surprise to willis kennedy to find himself waited for on the evening in question it appeared that his cousin had just returned from a trip to a neighboring city and had brought him a message of importance from his business firm still it would have kept until tomorrow, laughed willis kennedy you need not have hunted me out away down here to-night for it I should not have had time to-morrow to deliver it, replied his cousin, thereby showing in a single sentence the contrast between himself and his relative. Then he asked, How do you pass your time after business hours? What do you do with yourself evenings, for instance? Blunder around anywhere. This evening, for instance, I have been to a church social. Indeed whereupon both gentlemen laughed. "'I have, on my honor," continued Willis Kennedy. "'Got caught with a young fellow who runs that sort of thing, and couldn't civilly refuse. However, I am glad I went. I had a reasonably pleasant time, and made the acquaintance of an extremely interesting young woman.' "'In this end of the town, who is she?' a miss cameron who seemed to be almost as much of a stranger as i am myself although i believe she lives not very far from the scene of action to-night miss cameron echoed his cousin what sort of a person tall and fair with unusual eyes and a great deal of hair and more than her share of stateliness that describes her very well though she was friendly enough to me I am sure she could be stately on occasion. In fact, I saw a little of it this evening, when one or two persons she did not fancy tried to talk with her. You are in luck, my boy. If she was gracious to you, I would suggest that you follow up the acquaintance. 
I know Miss Cameron by sight and by reputation. She can be decidedly stately, as you say. She is an heiress, or is to be, as soon as a certain uncle resident in California dies. The interesting thing about it is that she does not know it herself, nor do any of her family. It is a law secret which I am giving away. They live quite plainly, I believe, and have not too much of this world's goods. It is rather interesting to know that the oldest daughter will come into possession of something over a million before long. Romantic, isn't it? The uncle is quite old and feeble now, we hear. The revelation will probably come in a few months at the latest. It is quite a second-rate novel plot. He has kept his eye on these relatives, it seems, through all the intervening years, hardening his heart apparently to the amount of good his money might be doing while he is here, and waiting to astonish them at the end. "'What an extraordinary story!' said his cousin, deeply interested. "'Are you sure she is sole heiress? And do you say that none of the family know of it?' "'Not one. There is an old family feud, I believe, which has kept them apart.' and this uncle cannot make up his mind to be reconciled while he lives, but proposes to smooth everything over after he is gone. Oh, yes, I am as sure as a member of one of the firm having his business in charge ought to be. But it is a grave secret, remember. I do not know why I gave it away. I am not in the habit of gossiping about business matters, as you are aware. You took me by surprise mentioning the lady's name." I hope you will understand that it would make serious trouble for me if the story should leak out. Of course, said the other, cheerily. I can be as mum as an oyster when I choose. I wouldn't mention it for a share in the Bank of England. It might jeopardize the millions. But, as you say, it is a very romantic story. What is the fortunate lady's first name? Catherine, spelled with a K. There is another name, I believe, but I do not recall it. I remember thinking that Catherine Cameron had a euphonic sound. And she is the only daughter, you say? Oh, no. There are other daughters, half a dozen for aught I know, but she is the elect one. She bears the magic name which connects her with a memory dating seventy years back. So our chief says, Romantic to the end, you see or rather, to the beginning. Well, don't lose your heart for all that, if you can help it. For there's many a slip, you know. Good night to you. Come up when you can. Now Mr. Willis Kennedy's soliloquy after his meeting with Rachel Cameron will be understood. At the same time, I hope it is very plain to the reader that this young man was not that favorite character in a certain class of novels, a fortune hunter. Had he not become decidedly interested in Mary Cameron before his cousin Eustace gave that interesting secret into his keeping, it is by no means certain that he would have put himself out in any way to seek her acquaintance. But it occurred to him as a very romantic thing that he should have been spending an hour with the lady, and should have felt more interested in her than in any other lady of his acquaintance. He had asked and obtained permission to call upon her, and had fully meant to do so, before he heard of her prospective millions. The day came when he liked to emphasize this fact. As the acquaintance progressed, he tried to put the millions out of his thoughts entirely. He told himself angrily one day that he wished he had never heard of them. It would be an extremely awkward thing for him if Mary should ever learn that he had known about her fortune long before she did. He avoided his cousin, wishing to hear no more, and being scrupulously anxious that he should not know how well the hint given in jest had been acted upon. He carefully avoided all reference to the Cameron relatives, and tried to look utterly indifferent when Rachel Cameron was mentioned, and it was announced that she had been with relatives in California. He could not help a gleam of satisfaction, as Mary explained to him one day, when he was marking handkerchiefs for her, that the K stood for an old-fashioned family name which had a history. 
All our names have histories, she said, smiling. Father and mother keep up the family traditions. He tried to appear interested only in the corner of the handkerchief which should have the initials, but as he carefully fashioned the K, it was impossible to put away the sound of his cousin's voice. Catherine spelled with a K. He did not believe, not even in his inmost soul, that the consciousness of what was to be had hurried his intentions toward Mary Cameron, save as, of course, as he told himself, any sane man would know that he could not in his present circumstances support a wife. There were days when he went over these things carefully, and explained to himself with almost painful reiteration, that he cared more for Mary Cameron, a great deal more, than for any one else in the world and at such times he was almost sure to add that that little witch of an Emily Cameron would drive away the blues from any house, and that the Cameron girls were all charming. He and Mary would, one of these days, give them the surroundings they deserved. Much of this soliloquizing went on after he had returned to New York and taken up again his regular round of duties and pleasures, he was not a young man who devoted himself exclusively to business. The claims of society were always loyally acknowledged by him, and it was not to be supposed that because he was engaged to be married, he should therefore become a hermit. Instead of that, he must think of his future wife and hold for her a place among his friends. He reflected with no little satisfaction that he claimed as his acquaintance some of the first people, and that as a married man he would, before a great while, be able to hold his own with the best of them. Meantime, Rachel Cameron was trying to find her place in her father's house and settle into it. To leave home as a little girl, with all the plans and memories of girlhood, and to return to it a young woman, with every plan in life changed and every memory dimmed, is a bewildering experience. Nothing was quite as she had thought it. She roomed with Emily, and that exceedingly bright and exceedingly giddy girl bewildered her quite as much as did her elder sisters. How strangely the child was bringing herself up! For nobody seemed to be trying to bring her up. This was the mental comment of the sister, not quite three years her elder. One subject, which since Aunt Eunice had become a member of the family was often a bone of contention, was brought up one evening when they were gathered in the back parlor. This was no other than Emily's extravagant fondness for dancing. She was urging the importance of being allowed to attend a dancing party which was to be given by one of her school friends, and her mother and Mary were both opposing it, each on different grounds. I do not understand why you want to accept Nettie Baker's invitations, Mary said. The family are not in our list of acquaintances at all, and the young people do not go with our set. Then Emily. Oh, our set! I hate those words. We haven't any set, so far as I can see. We have dropped out of our old ones since we came down here to live, and for my part I am glad of it. I don't believe in sets. When people are nice and you like them, is that not enough? Emily, interposed Lucia, I am surprised at you. You should remember the honor of the family now. Are we not at last about to have an alliance with money as well as family? Think of Mary and choose your associates with care. This reference drew from Mary only a good-natured laugh. She liked to remember always that she was soon to be in a position to give advice to those younger sisters as an autocrat and to lighten her father's burdens. Let it always be remembered that she was sure to put this thought in the forefront. Still, she felt it sometimes necessary to moderate their expectations. You should not be too sure, she said to Lucia, because Willis is a Kennedy and belongs to the great firm of Kennedy and Kennedy, is no reason why he should have a great deal of money at present. Remember, he is a young man. 
Emily nodded her head in that sage way she had, as she said, I'll risk the money part. He has enough of it. Doesn't he waste it awfully all the time? And she glanced effectively at the diamond ring which gleamed on Mary's finger and flashed its brilliancy in a thousand reflected sparkles. That's the largest diamond I ever saw a lady wear. He might just as well have chosen a smaller one and saved his money if it was scarce. And then think of that box of Hyler's very best. A great big box. This was mixing the grand with the ridiculous to such an extent that there seemed nothing but laughter for the whole family. Emily would rather have the candy than the diamond ring, I believe, said Lucia, and Emily nodded instant assent. Of course I would. I can divide that with my friends, and I couldn't the ring. But never mind either of them just now. Let us settle about this party. Mother, why do you say I can't go? It is a question of dress, child. You say you have nothing suitable to wear, and I am tired of telling you that we cannot afford to spend a cent for dress this quarter. We have even less than usual to depend upon. Of course, said Emily, with another of her nods. It is always less than usual, and there are always unusual expenses, aren't there? I know that story by heart. But I can furbish up my old dress, I suppose, and wear it if I have to. All I shall want will be some gloves and slippers and a few flowers. But even those are out of the question, Emily. I cannot consent to your asking your father for a single penny this quarter, for anything but absolute necessities. You must see how harassed he is. Then Mary sighed, and could not help wishing that she had in her pocket-book the hundred dollars which her ring must have cost, and she could not help thinking of the time when she could, with great delight, supply Emily's small needs. It would certainly be pleasant to look after her in this way. While she was thinking these thoughts, Aunt Eunice was talking. "'I don't see what you mean by letting her go on in this way.' If she had a hundred pairs of slippers and gloves, and was my girl, she wouldn't go to any dances. I can't, for the life of me, think what her father is about. He isn't brought up to be so careless. It's a disgrace to the family name. None of the girls of his mother's family went to a dance any more than they would go to a smallpox hospital. Emily was never other than amused over her aunt's tirades. She responded to this one in the utmost good humor. "'Aunt Eunice, what harm is there in a dancing party?' "'What harm? A girl of your age is old enough to know the harm without asking. Wasting your time and strength in skipping over the floor and simpering with the men. Supposing you were to die at a party just while you were hopping around in that silly way.' The girl replied only by a merry laugh. Emily, said Mrs. Cameron, reprovingly. Well, I can't help it, mother. It is too funny. What has dying got to do with it? Suppose I should die while I am washing up the lunch dishes for Betsy. It would be an equally inappropriate time, I am sure. Oh, you can make fun of even a deathbed, said Aunt Eunice angrily. I am perfectly aware of that. But I knew of one girl who died on the floor of a ballroom. She went against her father's will, and she was brought home a corpse. Now that is the truth. Emily had much ado not to laugh again. She could not see what that incident, solemn as it was, had to do with the subject. But, Aunt Eunice, she began again, if we had to choose all our occupations and amusements with a view to possibly dying in them, a great many things would look inappropriate, don't you think so? I think in a world like this we have no time for simply amusing ourselves. It is a sick and dying world, full of trouble and suffering of every kind, and isn't going to last long for the youngest. We ought to be busy about other things, and dancing is just one of Satan's devices for leading souls to ruin. No respectable girl ought to have anything to do with it, 
and if i were your mother my lady you wouldn't if i had to tie you up at home aunt eunice how glad you and i ought to be that you are not my mother this was as far as the argument had extended when the doorbell interrupted them and professor landis was announced they made room for him in the family circle apologizing that the wind blew in just the wrong direction and the furnace declined to have anything to do with the front parlor he had hardly time to express his pleasure at being welcomed to the cozier room before emily pitched her question at him professor landis do you think it is wicked to dance oh not at all said the professor regarding the bright-faced girl with amused eyes why should there be anything wicked in that i don't know i am sure aunt eunice you hear what professor landis says and he is as religious as oh a great deal more religious than the minister some ministers anyway well said aunt eunice with firmly set lips i have seen a great many different kinds of religious people i'm glad i'm not that kind myself professor landis with his mirth beaming eyes still fixed on emily continued there is a charming little dancer at the university if you will call upon me some morning i will get him to perform if he is present he is not a regular student you understand and cannot be depended upon as to ours a student at the university that is a queer place for dancing what does he do it for for his living he earns it regularly in that way at least most of his extras mince pie and matters of that kind you understand somebody whistles and he dances in perfect time then we throw him a bit of pie or a bone possibly from our luncheon to show our appreciation he can dance on two legs and hold out the other two for the aforesaid pie he is accomplished oh said emily pouting a little while the others laughed you are talking about a dog i was in earnest aunt eunice thinks we ought not to dance for fear we might die while we are at a dancing party what harm would it do if we did i mean she added in response to her mother's reproving look and aunt eunice's exclamation it wouldn't be the place one would choose of course but why does that prove it wrong any more than it would prove it wrong to go on a journey because one might die on the way and one certainly would not want to it does not said professor landis perfectly grave now in my judgment it proves nothing of the sort that is what i think said emily waxing more earnest and all those things they say against it that it takes time and is frivolous and unfits one for study so do croquet parties and tennis parties and musicales and all sorts of things if people attend them too often or stay too late and yet people who are good christians go to them and frown on dancing i don't see any sense in it Allie Fenwood's mother won't let her even learn to dance, and she lets her play at musicales and stay later than I do when I go to a dancing party. I think it is inconsistent and silly. Professor Landis regarded the pretty girl with kindly eyes and said gently, May there not be a reason back of all these, of which you have not thought, that emphasizes the disapproval of some persons for this form of amusement i am sure i don't know what it can be said emily with energy and then the guest looked at the mother the thought in his heart was what can that mother have been about while her beautiful young daughter was budding into girlhood end of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of What They Couldn't by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen Being Weighed. Mr. Landis said Mary, who decided that about this time a change of subject would be wise. How is our friend Ben prospering? I have not seen him for several weeks. 
it was surprising, to those who did not understand it, how entirely Mary Cameron's manner had changed toward their neighbor. The certainty that there would be no further occasion for teasing her at his expense seemed to have sweetened all her thought of him, and no one of the family welcomed him more cordially than did she. Lucia and Emily were outspoken as to their pleasure in his society, and even Aunt Eunice had admitted that he was well enough. It cannot be said that the two families were intimate, for the sister, Dorothy, seemed the busiest of mortals, and had little time for society, nor had the young ladies of the Cameron household met her friendliness with such abundant cordiality as to lead her to earnestly desire their companionship. But there were occasional evenings when she was at her interminable classes, in which Professor Landis seemed to have leisure for his friends. And at such times it began to be natural for him to drop in next door. The family were not yet intimate enough to ask questions. Even Emily had to content herself with surmises, but she commented on them as freely as though they were known facts. For instance, after this fashion... I should think Professor Landis would hate awfully to have his sister teach in the evenings as well as daytimes. I suppose she wouldn't have to do it if she didn't take time to keep house for him. Why don't they board, I wonder? Shouldn't you think it would be cheaper for them? Anyhow, I'd find something to do, if I were he, that would make money enough for her to rest in the evening. Almost all men are selfish, I believe." Mary, don't you hope that Mr. Kennedy will be a delightful exception? Over Mary's question concerning Ben, the professor looked grave, even disturbed. I am afraid I cannot give you an encouraging account of him, Miss Cameron. I feel more disheartened and troubled over him now than I have since his first entry into city life. He has developed some dangerous tastes of late, especially for a boy of his temperament. I do not know how it will end. Immediately, Emily was curious, also sympathetic. Oh, dear me, she said. How sorry I am. I like that boy, and we had real fun together playing Halma. He is just as bright. Mr. Kennedy gave him some hints one evening, skillful hints, such as I do not know enough to give and after that I had to watch with the greatest care, or he would beat me every time. Professor Landis did not smile. Instead, his gravity deepened. He has natural tastes in those directions, I fear, he said. Possibly inherited tastes, I do not know. What, for Halma? How queer! I did not know that people inherited such things, why do you fear it, Professor? There is surely no harm in playing Halma if there is in dancing. Emily, said Mrs. Cameron, one would think that you were a professor and our guest your pupil. Why will you ask so many questions? I am only in pursuit of knowledge, Mother. What is the harm in Halma, please? Thus pressed, he admitted that he was not thinking of Halma, but of other games less innocent. What games? Emily immediately asked. She was fond of games, she declared. Was there a new one, and was it really wicked, or only a trifle dangerous? She believed she liked things that were just a little bit dangerous. It gave them a sort of spice, didn't he think? What was this new one? He was thinking of nothing new, he told her. Ben had learned to play cards, he was sorry to say, and they fascinated him, as they had many another stronger than he. Cards! exclaimed Aunt Eunice, dropping her knitting to lift up her hands in a gesture of dismay. Then he is lost. He is just the kind of boy to go to ruin fast. I could see it when he was here playing with Emily. I don't believe in any kind of games myself. They are all luck and chance, and they lead folks down to ruin. I've seen it time and again. I shouldn't wonder if your Halma was the beginning of it, Emily. No, 
said Professor Landis quickly, or at least Miss Emily is in no sense of the word to blame. It was very kind of her to give up her evening to Ben's amusement. No one could have foreseen that he would make the jump from the quiet home game of skill to the public card table. He was very fond of Halma, said Emily, a little touch of apprehension in her voice. The Cameron family had been brought up to have a horror of cards. Their father, who had had a bitter lesson in his youth, had been pronounced on this subject if no other. I noticed how eager he was to win. Did he go directly from that to the cards, Professor Landis? He was invited to do so, Miss Emily, and was carefully taught the first steps. It was done in kindness, I fully believe, without so much as a thought of the possibility of evil consequences. But Ben is already weary of a game in which there is nothing to win but success, and plays for a cigar, or a ticket to the theatre, or any trifle, just to give spice to the game, he says. Who could have been so mean as to have started him? said Emily, in sharp indignation. Almost everybody with sense knows how boys away from home are ruined in this way. There is a girl in school who cries half the time because her brother keeps losing at cards and getting them into frightful trouble. Now I suppose Ben will go and make his father lose his house after all. I think it is horrid. Mary Cameron bent over her work as if absorbed in it, and said not a word, while the others talked on about Ben Reader, his prospects and his dangers and Emily questioned, but received no light, as to who started the boy on his downward way. But Mary knew. Her cheeks glowed as she recalled the fact that Mr. Kennedy had been exceedingly kind to the boy, and had taken pains to put him in a way to make his evenings less dull. I had him come into the clubhouse with some of the young men whom I know pretty well, and taught him a game we are fond of, just to help keep him out of mischief. He is really a very bright boy, worth looking after. My friends were good to him, and he had a real jolly time, as he expressed it, and was surprisingly grateful. He hasn't happened to strike a great deal of kindness in this world, I fear. This was the way Mr. Kennedy had put it to her, and she had admired him for his kindness, and said within herself that he had been more practical in his efforts than Professor Landis, who seemed to have nothing better to offer for the boy's entertainment than church socials. She had thanked him for the interest he took in Ben, and had felt that he did it to show her how entirely he was ready to further any efforts of hers. But he had spoken only of a game they were fond of. Why had he not said a game of cards? Was it accident or design that he had not? Moreover, was he a card player himself, a habitual one? If so, and her father knew it, what would he say? What had she to say herself? It seemed strange, seemed almost like design, that neither he nor Ben should have mentioned the word in her hearing. Although Ben had told her of the jolly evening which Mr. Kennedy gave him, and had said he was what he called a brick. If this were really an attempt to deceive her so early in their acquaintance, her eyes glowed at the thought. But she rallied instantly and began to upbraid herself. What nonsense it all was! Why should he have mentioned cards? He probably merely happened not to do so. Everybody played cards, she presumed, except ministers and men with old fashioned ideas like her father and occasionally a fanatic like Professor Landis. She scarcely knew any young persons besides themselves who did not play at home for amusement. That was different from going to saloons and gambling houses to play, of course. Mr. Kennedy ought to have been more careful, and to have remembered that Ben Reader was away from home and friends. But because her father's young brother had been almost ruined with cards years ago, and he therefore had had a horror of them ever since, it was not necessary to pounce upon the world and try to bring it to that level. People have been ruined by fast horses before now, 
but that did not make it a crime to drive the best one could afford. So, while the talk flowed on about her, she heard it but dimly, and patched up a piece with her heart and conscience, and was glad her father was not there. He might question even more closely than Emily, and he had troubles enough now. When she gave attention to the talk again, it was still about Ben Reader and cards. Emily was saying, But Professor Landis, that is shocking. Mary, did you hear that? He says Ben played all night last night, and went to the store without any breakfast or any sleep. At that rate he will get sent home in disgrace. Perhaps it would be a good thing for him if he were. I wonder if they would be good to him. I wonder if fathers and mothers, out of the books, are ever real good to their children who come home bad. Do you suppose they are, mother? How would we all treat Rod or Mac if we were ashamed of them? Emily, said her mother with such sharpness and yet such pain in her voice that the thoughtless girl paused, looked at her wonderingly, and said, Why, mother, I am only supposing a case. But, Professor Landis, really, can't anything be done to get Ben away from that place? I'll help. I'll play Halma with him every evening for a month, if that will do any good. I don't want him to go back to his mother spoiled. He told me some nice things about her. Can he not be persuaded to take the Lord Jesus Christ for an intimate friend? Then he will be safe from temptations of every sort. It was Rachel Cameron's clear voice which asked this question, asked it simply, naturally, as though it were the most reasonable possible solution of a difficulty. Professor Landis turned eager, almost hungry eyes upon her, and spoke quickly, while the others stared as though she had used a language unknown to them. "'Miss Cameron, you have struck the only force which I believe will do my poor Ben any good. I know something of the power of that disease called gambling, when it gets hold of a boy like Ben.' and he has seized upon it as though it were the thing his life had been waiting for. If he would but allow himself to be introduced to Christ and accept his friendship, all would be well. Is it not the marvel of marvels that a young fellow of fair sense otherwise should reject such a friendship? Nothing so strange to me in life as the fact that men and women everywhere are doing the same thing said Rachel Cameron, with a note of pathos in her voice, which made it very expressive. Emily looked from one to the other curiously, and could not resist the temptation to ask another question. What do people mean when they talk like that? How could joining the church and going to prayer meeting and things of that sort help Ben Reader, for instance, keep him from wanting to play cards or do anything else that some people thought he ought not. Miss Emily, have you never met intimately people who found Jesus Christ such an absorbing fellowship that they desired above all things to frequent the places where he could be met and do the things in which he could join them, who, in short, found him satisfying? No, honestly, I don't believe I ever have. I know ever so many church members, of course. Lots of the girls in school are, and they do not seem to me to have nice times at all. That is, I mean, their nice times have nothing to do with their religion. Sometimes they say, Oh dear, I suppose I ought to go to prayer meeting tonight. I haven't been in three weeks. And they speak as though it was an ought and not a comfort. No, meditatively, I don't believe I know one person whom it makes happy. Father is a church member, has been for ever so many years, but he is as unhappy as he can be. All sorts of things worry him. And Aunt Eunice is a church member. But you aren't happy, are you, Aunt Eunice? You know you said only this morning that it was a cross-grained world, and you were sick and tired of it. I don't think there are any such people as you are talking about, Mr. Landis, and I don't understand how that kind of thing can do a boy like Ben Reader any good. The slow color mounted to Aunt Eunice's very forehead. 
but contrary to the habit of her life she answered not a word professor landis looked at rachel cameron and smiled a slight grave smile we are being weighed in the balances of a keen observer he said is it possible that we shall all be found wanting the color went and came on the girl's fair face she felt like a stranger in her own home more of a stranger than was this next-door neighbor yet ought she to let such a challenge as that pass in silence there was a moment of intense stillness no one seeming to know what to say next even emily the irrepressible being apparently subdued then rachel spoke again emily dear though we are sisters i am almost a stranger to you i hardly know how to say it because my life may not match my words will not indeed because though i love jesus christ and try to copy him i know only too well what an imperfect copy it is after all but i do want to tell you that he satisfies me i do not reach out after anything that this world can give if it must be had at the expense of an hour's separation from his approving smile and i do know that if that young man should give his life up to christ's keeping he would keep it for him and make it a joy and in the truest sense of the word a success amen said professor landis let me bear the same testimony throughout i do not wonder that you find it hard to understand because of the many poor imitations which we make but in your fancy work you do not quarrel with the perfect pattern do you because of the mistake you make in working by it and then mr cameron's night key was heard in the door and some of them at least were glad that this conference which had taken such an unexpected and embarrassing form was over but emily began it again when she and rachel were in their own room i liked what you said she announced as she stood at the dressing bureau twisting her hair out of shape for the night it sounded interesting somehow and you looked as though you meant it but i don't understand it if things are as you and professor landis think why don't we see more results why isn't poor father for instance helped and rested instead of being tormented half out of his life with the struggle to live i'll own that sometimes i feel as though i would steal a little money in a sort of respectable way you know just to help him out you have no idea how he is harassed month after month with bills and things he is doing his very best why doesn't his religion come in and help him are you sure it does not asked rachel gently perhaps his weight of care would be too much for him but for that help but emily i cannot speak for the experience of others only my own i know i have been helped to live and to endure some things that else would have been too hard because i was sure that my dear lord jesus sent them to me and knew all about it what hard things can you have had to bear asked emily turning and bestowing a curious searching look upon her but finding that there was no reply to this wonderment her mind promptly travelled to another subject well i know i don't understand such things what is the use of talking about them there is one thing i do understand however and that is dancing can't you contrive some way for me to get to that party you are quick-witted i fancy and i am just dying to go it will be the event of the season for us young things as aunt eunice calls us don't you dance rachel well now why not as rachel with a quiet smile shook her head you don't believe all that rubbish that aunt eunice gets off i know you don't you have too much sense even professor landis doesn't believe it and i don't know a more particular person than he what did he mean to-night by a reason back of all that looking as wise as an owl when he said it emily dear said the sister drawing closer to her and resting a hand on her plump shoulder may i ask a few questions which may sound strange to you 
of course said emily brushing her frizzes vigorously ask anything you wish and i can be solemn too if there is occasion then don't you think that there may come a time in your life when you will have a friend whom you will love more than any other person on earth love enough to marry i mean and go away from home and everybody if necessary with him why i don't know said emily laughing now perhaps i shall be an old maid i would rather like to be only i should want to represent a different species from aunt eunice still of course i may possibly marry what of that then do you not believe that when that time shall come you will feel humiliated to remember that you ever allowed passing acquaintances perhaps almost strangers liberties which should belong only to that one chosen from all the world emily's cheeks flamed what do you mean she asked abruptly even sharply i may be a very giddy person as aunt eunice declares fifty times in a single day that i am but i allow no one to take any liberties with me i cannot imagine what you are talking about my dear little sister have you not in the dance allowed privileges that if offered outside the dance under any other circumstances than that of engagement to marry would have been considered insulting i do not waltz the child said almost sullenly father won't let me no and i presume that is your only reason you are young and have not thought of these matters yet you ought not to be expected to perhaps others who have had experiences of life should think for you this called forth a burst of laughter such as you said emily you are so aged and experienced almost nineteen rachel laughed and blushed i know emily but i have had an unusual experience aunt catherine was a wonderful woman and she had some wonderful children emily if i should tell you some things which my aunt catherine told me once when i had great need of help you would be shocked beyond measure tell me then said emily i like to be shocked i should think it would be a delicious sensation was there any use in trying to talk seriously with such a volatile creature rachel dropped her hand from the white shoulder and turned away again to make preparations for rest adding after a moment this sentence i will tell you only this emily and i am sure of it if any pure-minded girl could hear how men bad men talk about the dance and even the most innocent and childlike among the dancers she would never allow her name to be mentioned in connection with this amusement again End of chapter 16chapter 17 of what they couldn't by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 17 just once yet despite all that had been said to her emily went to the party when she lay down that night beside rachel she supposed that she would not she was vexed with rachel angry indeed and only half believed what had been said to her how should rachel know so much she was only a little older than herself mother did not think dancing was such a dreadful thing nor did father or they never would have allowed her to learn to dance of course one must choose one's companions with care didn't she always wasn't their set just made up of girls and boys whom she knew almost as intimately as she did her brothers and sisters some of the girls went to dances that she did not care to attend and chose companions whom she wouldn't but what of that was she to give up her fun because somebody else did something wrong what a charming world that would make it was hateful in rachel to say such things to her if the world was as ugly as that she did not want to know it rachel must have met some strange people out in that horrid california where she had spent so much of her life she had always thought of the people there as only half civilized 
and this proved it. Still, if Rachel felt so, perhaps others did. Perhaps Professor Landis thought, she did not finish the sentence, but even in the night and the darkness her cheeks glowed with shame. Did Professor Landis really think that it was indelicate to dance, the kind of dancing that she did? How could he? She did not want to do anything indelicate, this young, gay girl. She did not want people to think she did, especially people whom she admired and respected. She dropped asleep, saying to herself that she would not go to this party. It was larger than any to which she had ever been invited, and there were to be some strangers present, Bertha Foster's cousin, Richard, among the number. She had been quite anxious to meet Bertha's cousin, because everybody said he was so handsome and such a splendid dancer. She was the best dancer among the girls, they all knew it but perhaps it was just as well that she could not go. By morning she did not think it was well, and by the time she had returned from school she was sure that her sister Rachel was a western-bred prude, and Professor Landis a narrow-minded crank, and that it was just too dreadful that she could not have fresh gloves and slippers and things when she was going to wear her old dress." Mary had thought so much of late about the time when she could bestow trifles of this kind that she could not resist the temptation to experiment just to see how it would seem. There was a certain five-dollar gold piece in her possession, which she had almost spent a hundred times, and then had drawn back, resolving to hold it a little longer. Why? The answer to that question would have been very hard for Mary Cameron to have put into words. There was no sentiment connected with the giver, a stern-faced uncle who had felt compelled to bestow because of many disagreeable duties which she had done for him. At first she had kept it because she liked the gleam of gold in her pocket-book. Then, as wants grew more numerous, she could not be sure which of the many needed things to bestow it on. It was a sort of extra, and had a right to be treated as such. Then there had come an evening when, as Russell Denham and she sat together in the parlor, she had occasion to hunt through her pocket-book for a certain card, and he had seen the gold piece and asked about and handled it. Was it a treasure piece? Was it charmed? Did she know there was an old legend about pocket-pieces that were charmed by the giver to the everlasting happiness of the receiver? Did she suppose he could charm that for her, so that whenever she looked at it his image would appear? There had been much nonsense and laughter, but Mary had admitted to herself, when he was gone, that he had charmed the gold piece. She could never see its gleam afterwards without seeming to see his handsome face reflected in it. After that, nothing which could be bought with money was to be exchanged for that gold piece. Now, however, the time had come when all this ought to be changed, was changed forever, Mary Cameron assured herself with a firm set of lips. Russell Denham was nothing to her. She did not wish to remember him. Nevertheless, she had no desire to spend that particular piece of money about anything connected with her wedding outfit. It might be folly, probably it was, but the feeling was there. She wanted to be rid of the gold piece. The thought which came to her at last in its connection she believed was an inspiration. It should buy slippers and gloves and a bit of fresh lace for Emily, and the child should go to the party on which her heart was set. Emily was radiant. Certainly there was pleasure in the bestowal of the gift. She danced about Mary in a perfect abandonment of delight, and assured her that she was a blessed old darling, that she should never forget it of her, never. Then, growing serious, at least as serious as Emily Cameron ever allowed herself to be, she assured her sister that she had never seen anybody in her life improve so much as she had since her engagement. She had never imagined that it could have such an effect upon character as it evidently had and now if Aunt Eunice could only get engaged too, they would be a comparatively happy family. 
she came home from the party in the gayest of spirits. Everything had been perfectly lovely. The company was large, the refreshments more elegant, the toilets more exquisite, the dancing more superb than at any previous time in her long experience. She had much to say about the greatly admired Cousin Richard. He is magnificent, Mary, handsomer even than Mr. Kennedy, I do believe, and a gentleman like him. He says nice little things all the time that he does not mean. Well, don't you all know what I mean? As a shout of laughter greeted this statement. Just pleasant nothings which make you feel as though you were a little nicer and prettier and more interesting than anybody else. And yet that you know he will repeat to the next girl he dances with, and you don't care if he does, though he didn't repeat them very often last night. He confined his attentions chiefly to me. That is because I am the best dancer among them. It is queer, too, when I don't practice half as much as the others. Some of those girls go to a party or a rehearsal or something of the sort nearly every evening. Mary, Mr. Forbes knows your Ben. He says he saw him at the club rooms, and he says he is a little country simpleton, and is losing all his earnings, playing games that he does not understand. Besides, he thinks some of the fellows cheat him just for amusement, because he is too much in earnest, and gets so excited. I told him what I thought of it all, and he agreed with me. He says boys who have their living to earn, and who are excitable and ignorant, ought not to meddle with cards at all. There were reasons why all this talk troubled Mary especially. Was it possible that her first effort to help in the world was to result disastrously? If Ben Reader had not been noticed by Mr. Kennedy, he might have escaped cards. And but for her sake, Mr. Kennedy, she felt instinctively, was not one to trouble himself about a boy like Ben. Then, too, Emily was so excited, so almost reckless. Were these late evening parties just the thing for her? It is true she had not opportunity to go very often. But was she not, like poor Ben, too excitable to indulge in such things at all? If she had looked worn and jaded and been irritable, Mary thought it would be almost better, because then she could see for herself the evil effects. But she was, on the contrary, more wide awake than ever. She talked and laughed incessantly, was in royal humor with the world in general, and perfectly sure of one thing, that she would go to another dancing party as soon as she could. I danced seven times with Mr. Forbes, she confessed to the girls in the privacy of their own room, and he begged for another, but I was as firm as a rock. Then he said if I would not dance with him, I must promise not to with anybody, and I promised willingly, because I was tired by that time, and there was nobody there worth dancing with after him. That was one of the nice little nothings I told you of. He didn't care two straws, of course, whom I danced with, but it was fun to hear him pretend that he did. Over this confidence all the sisters looked troubled. I thought, said Lucia, that it was not considered good form to dance so frequently with the same person. Well, it isn't, Emily admitted frankly. That was why I refused him for that last dance. Though, of course, we young girls do not follow excessive etiquette about such things as the people do who are really in society. Besides, he is Bertha Foster's cousin. That made some difference— I am quite intimate with Bertha. She coaxed me to waltz with him. She said he was the most delightful waltzer. Then Mary spoke indignantly. Emily Cameron, you don't mean that you waltzed, and with a perfect stranger, after all that father has said about that. Yes, I did, just once, said Emily, pouting a little, yet evidently relieved that she had confessed the truth. What is the harm? The girls all do it with their special friends, and I feel really peculiar in always refusing. It looks as though I was afraid of myself in some way. It was Bertha, though, who coaxed me into it. 
she said she wanted her cousin Richard to see that the girls here were equal to the New York girls that he had been raving about. You needn't look so disgusted, Mary. I don't mean to earn my living by waltzing, nor to do it again, perhaps. I forgot all about what father had said for the minute. The music made me wild. They were playing just the loveliest waltz. I couldn't keep my feet still, and Mr. Forbes stood waiting, and all that I thought of was how lovely it would be to be flying around keeping time to that music. So I just went. I shouldn't think there was any harm in it if it weren't for father's notions. Or, well, yes, I should, too. She colored and corrected herself. Emily Cameron was, like her sister, honest by nature. I don't think it nice for girls to do it with everybody, nor very often with anybody, perhaps. But, oh dear, I don't know what I think. I just couldn't help doing it last night. But I don't mean to again, ever. If you girls go and be cross and hateful, I shall be sorry I told you. Then the excited child lost all self-control and cried bitterly and Mary Cameron wished she had used her five-dollar gold piece in some other way, and wondered what sort of a person this Cousin Richard was. Also, the more she thought about it, the more did her heart grow sore and anxious for Ben Reader. Perhaps her pride was somewhat piqued. Professor Landis had been so grateful for her kindness to him, and now he had probably discovered that, indirectly, she was to blame for this sudden descent of the country boy into the pitfalls of city life. Was there nothing that she could do to help Ben? At this point in her thoughts, she reflected almost indignantly upon Mr. Landis and her sister Rachel. If these two believed there was a power which could take hold of Ben and save him from himself, why did they not do their utmost to bring it to bear upon him? Well, did she not herself believe in this power? Certainly she did, but... And then she put her thoughts as far away from that subject as she could. Since she had not settled it that she was going to do, herself, what she believed to be a reasonable thing, and eminently important for Ben, the less she considered it, the more comfortable she would be but she would not forget Ben. She met him on the street a few days afterward, and took special pains to stop and talk with him. Where had he been this long time? Emily was anxious to annihilate him in a game of Halma, and she had a song, a new one, which would fit his voice, and his mother would be sure to like it. When could he come and try it? Would he have a leisure hour this evening? Certainly Mary Cameron could be gracious and charming when she chose. But Ben was non-committal. He didn't know, didn't believe he could come this evening. No, he couldn't come tomorrow any better than tonight. And he laughed, a half-shamefaced, half-sullen laugh, over this admission that he was simply making excuses. What was the use? he asked. He was no singer, never would be never would be much of anything, and, here he turned his face away that Mary might not see the feeling in it, he didn't believe he should try it any more. Oh, yes, you will, said Mary cheerily. You will try this new piece and like it better than any you have seen. It was sent to me on purpose for you. Why, Mr. Reader, when I tell you that you have a good voice, you ought to be polite enough to believe me for I am a very fair judge of voices, it is said, and I always speak the truth. Will you come this evening? I want you to promise, because Professor Landis says you are sure to keep your word. He is mistaken. Ben's voice was husky now. He thinks a lot of things of me that are not true. I'm not to be depended upon for my word or anything." prove the falseness of that by promising to come to us at eight o'clock this evening, she said gaily, and being there at the stroke of the clock. He would not promise, and she had very faint hope of seeing him, but he came promptly to the moment, not in a genial mood, however. He looked sullen and miserable, and was evidently going to be hard to entertain. 
he declined almost roughly emily's gay challenge to win a game from him told her there would be no great honor in that he was easy to beat and used to being beaten he wished he had never played a game of any kind in his life and emily for once was silenced and looked timid and distressed the song did not fare much better at his hands he was persuaded to try it but his voice broke utterly in the middle of a line and he refused to make any further effort declaring it to be the meanest air he had ever struck rachel cameron made earnest attempts to second her sister's efforts but did not get on at all with ben he would not be interested in anything she proposed and was altogether so sullen and rude in his manner that but for the fact that it was all the evident result of some inward misery mary would have lost patience with him as it was she had a yearning to help him which she could not have explained even to herself to the relief of those concerned he made his stay very short muttering something about having to get back and going out so hastily as almost to omit the usual leave-takings her father was not present and mary accompanied him to the hall wondering as she went whether professor landis would have let him go away so evidently wretched or would have been able to do something to help him while she was considering he turned suddenly and held out his hand his lips quivering as he spoke i hope you will forgive me i hope they all will i've acted like a fool but i couldn't help it i oughtn't to have come but you seem to think i would and you have been there he stopped aware apparently that his voice could carry him no further what is it ben mary asked holding the boyish hand in hers and speaking as few knew she could speak you are in trouble of some kind and away from your mother and all your home friends cannot i help you in any way i should like to then ben snatched away his hand and sat down suddenly in one of the hall chairs and hid his face and let the tears come for a moment she was too distressed to speak she had never seen her brothers cry she had not realized that boys had tears to shed just then she heard her father's step on the walk what would he think to find ben reader in his hall weeping bitterly and she standing near him dumb she pushed open the dining-room door come in here a minute ben she said and tell me won't you what is the matter cannot i be one of your sisters for the time i have brothers you know but no persons would have been more astonished than her own brothers to have heard such words from her ben struggled with his tears and gained the mastery but he followed her into the dining-room and dropped into the chair she indicated i hope you will forgive me he said again i don't know what is the matter that i act so like a baby i am not used to giving myself away in that fashion it all seemed to come over me somehow it was the song made it worse the fault isn't in the air miss cameron those words struck at me they made me think how much i had meant when i came here and what mother was expecting and father and what had come of it and it broke me down miss cameron that friend of yours who was kind to me he meant it all for kindness and i am a great baby to have let it get a hold of me as it has but i wish i had never seen him maybe i wouldn't have got hold of my ruin so soon if i hadn't but i don't know it would have come anyhow i suppose if it is in me mary stood like one paralyzed looking down at him but the unutterable misery even desperation in his voice reached her very soul she roused herself to speak do you mean about cards ben he taught you to play i too am sorry i wish he had not done it still as you say it was in kindness he does not think about these things in the way that some do but surely you are not going to let that one circumstance ruin you 
if you find that the game you have learned to play is an injury, instead of being, as Mr. Kennedy intended it, a rest and amusement, why not give it up at once and forever? People do that who are much older and much more fixed in their habits than you. I had an uncle who played cards incessantly for months, even years, until he was almost ruined. But there came a day when he resolved never to touch another card, and although he was a famous player and was sought after, he never did. Ben Reader shook his head. I can't do it, Miss Cameron. There is a difference in folks, I suppose. I used to think I could do what I had a mind to, but it is a mistake. I haven't been playing with cards a great while, and I haven't had such good luck as ought to make me hanker after them. But I can't let them alone. I found that out. I promised myself, and I even promised Professor Landis last night, that I wouldn't touch them again, and he thinks I keep my promises. I used to think I did, but I went straight from him and played the worst game I ever had, and got myself in such a place that now I must keep on. And then I had a letter from mother, and... Here the poor fellow broke off again, and bowed his face in his hands. He made no outward sound, but his strong young frame shook, and Mary's heart was wrung with sympathy. End of chapter 17「eighteen of what they couldn't by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen a troublesome promise what should she say first there came to her an almost overwhelming sense of the importance of her words just now she could but realize that this was a critical moment for ben reader and she was not used to dealing with souls in danger she took time to mentally rebuke Mr. Kennedy, and that with a degree of sharpness which would have greatly startled that gentleman, for his share in this misery. Why had he not let the boy alone? People who did not know how to help others wisely should not attempt it. Well then, why was she attempting it? Surely no one knew less than she about such matters, but the boy was manifestly leaning upon her she must say something. Mary Cameron had never asked for the help of the promised spirit, but does he not sometimes help those who are in dire need, and are too ignorant to ask? Her first word was a question, gently put. What did your mother say, Ben? For answer, he fumbled in his pocket for a half sheet of common note paper, and handed it to her without raising his head. It held only a few lines, written in the cramped hand of one not much accustomed to writing. Mother's dear boy, you know I wrote you a long letter only a few days ago. This is just a line, because I cannot go to sleep without saying it. Joshua Knowles has been here this evening. He just came from the city, and he thought he ought to tell us that the report was that our Ben had got to playing cards, and was friendly with a set of sharpers, and was getting into trouble. I smiled on him, and thanked him for the pains he had taken. But, says I, we hear from our Ben every week, and we know all about him. Ben, dear, mother doesn't believe one word of it. You know that, don't you? Mother trusts her boy through and through. So does father. But we are getting old, you know, and fidgety. You write a line as soon as you get this, to say that it is some other Ben in trouble, not ours, and I'm sorry for the boy and for his poor mother, but oh, so glad it isn't our boy. Just say so, won't you, for mother's sake. God bless my dear, dear boy. Mary read the lines slowly, with a great swelling in her throat the while. She could almost see that old mother, sitting up to write her words of trust, with the painful doubt creeping in between the lines in spite of her. No wonder that Ben's heart had broken over it. Ben, she said, if I were you, I wouldn't disappoint such a mother. I wouldn't, indeed. 
I would show her that I was the boy she thought me, and that I would be the man she dreams of. Mothers think so much of their boys, Ben. You don't seem to understand, said Ben in a broken voice. I tell you, I have disappointed her. They never said much about playing cards at home, but I know they didn't think I would do it. They would as soon have thought of telling the minister not to, and I've disappointed them. But Ben, begin again. Why, dear me, you are so young and have just begun life away from home, you can't have gotten very far wrong in so short a time. Even if you had, what is to hinder your turning squarely around and being the man your mother and father expect to see, and that you planned to be? Ben slowly shook his head. I don't know what's in the way, he said. The devil, I suppose. They say he is after everyone, and I guess he is. I know he is after me. Something has got hold of me. I've always been a good, steady boy, and always meant to be. But down there at the club room stylish fellows go, you know, and I thought it was a fine thing to have them notice me. They were good-natured and kind, I thought. But I guess they are sharpers. They like to get hold of a green fellow like me and lead him along by inches. Some of them don't mean anything, but the others do. They like the fun of seeing folks tumble, I guess. And I'm in for it now. I owe two of them, and unless my luck changes, I can't pay them. And I can't get away until I do. Don't you see how it is? I'm caught. Poor Mary's heart stood still. Her father's horror of cards made her wiser about their dangers than she was concerning many other things. Ben had evidently been playing for more than a cigar. "'How much money do you owe them?' she asked abruptly. Ben shuddered. "'It is only a matter of twenty dollars,' he said, "'not worth noticing or thinking about, they say. But of course I have to think about it and unless my luck changes, it will soon be more. I don't know how it is. I used to have good luck at first, but it seems to have deserted me. There's a stylish chap named Forbes who lent me five dollars last night, and I lost it in five minutes. Mary drew her breath hard. Forbes was the cousin Richard with whom her young sister had danced seven times to say nothing of the waltz only twenty dollars, but it might as well be a hundred so far as her ability to help him was concerned. If she had but kept that five-dollar gold piece, might it not much better have been spent in this way, both for Ben's sake and Emily's? The thought crossed her mind that Mr. Kennedy, who had been instrumental in this result, might appropriate some of the money which he had tossed about so freely to helping poor Ben out of the net but she shrank utterly from asking his help, although she felt sure of receiving it. How could she explain the situation so that he could understand? She was not yet sufficiently familiar with him by letter to write freely. It was not to be thought of. But Professor Landis, why did not the distressed boy go to him? It is true he was probably poor, his salary could not be very large, and he had a house to support and a sister to keep. Still, perhaps he could manage so small a sum. Why, she felt certain that he would manage it in some way, and she did not stop to analyze the feeling which made it quite possible for her to ask his help when she could not ask it of the man whom she had promised to marry. Ben, she said, if I will secure the twenty dollars for you, lend them to you, you understand, until such time as you are quite able to pay, will you promise on your honor that you will give up this amusement and go no more to the clubhouse or to any other house where they play cards? The slow crimson rolled over Ben's face and neck as he raised his eyes for the first time. I could not think of taking money from you, Miss Cameron. I never dreamed of such a thing. It will not be my money, she interrupted him, I have none of my own. If I had, I would lend to you in a moment. But I have a friend who, I am sure, will let me have it. Will you promise, Ben? 
I told you that I couldn't, he said, almost with impatience. Haven't I promised myself a dozen times already? It seems silly to you, I know, to say that I can't keep my word. It sounds silly to me. Only a few weeks ago I would have called a fellow a muff for saying it, but I've proved the truth of it. I used to believe I could do what I liked, and I've found I can't. Nothing more utterly hopeless than Ben's tone can be imagined. It was very different from the careless way in which that word cannot is often on the lips of youth when it means I will not, or at the most, I do not care to try. This was the cry of a heart which had lost faith in itself and was near despair. Mary Cameron stood appalled before it. The boy was in danger. Her Aunt Eunice had been a prophet when she said, Then he is lost. If ever soul needed the interposing hand, surely he did at this moment. Oh, for the sound of her neighbor's voice just now! Was not this the very moment to point the despairing one to the power who could? But Professor Landis was not even at home, if she had had any way to summon him. She thought of Rachel, but Ben had repelled her kindly advances so rudely, it was not probable that she could influence him. Then who was there? A curious longing to be able to do it herself, to be the instrument for saving this soul in peril, came surging into the girl's heart. But of what use was it? Could she, who did not know the way, attempt to point it out to another? Yet something must be said. Ben, she began, trembling, hesitating between each word, there is a, uh, there are people, oh Ben, don't you know that God is ready to help people who cannot? He could keep you from falling into this dreadful way and breaking your mother's heart. Why doesn't he then? asked Ben, almost fiercely, from behind the hands in which his face was again hidden. There was no help for it. She who had herself turned her back upon him must explain the strength and sweetness of his way to this floundering soul. Oh, Ben, you cannot really mean that question. Would you have been made like a lump of earth which must be turned over whenever the spade pleases, and must grow whatever someone else drops into the soil, whether it be seeds of flowers or weeds? Would you not much rather be the one to choose, to decide, as God has planned that you may be? Why had she used just that figure? She could not have told, had she been asked, save that she had stood that morning and watched a florist at his work among his plants, and something of the kind had floated idly through her mind. But Ben's early life had been spent much among the clods of earth, overturning them with his spade. It made some things plainer to him than they had ever been before. Presently he dropped his hands and looked at her. "'You mean,' he said, "'that while I honestly cannot keep myself from going to the bad, I can choose him for a leader, and he will help me?' Mary bowed her head. She trembled in every limb and could not have spoken. Here she was in the darkness, yet guiding a soul. Suppose she should start it on the wrong path. Ben Reader kept his eyes fixed on the floor after that, for so long that it seemed to her he would never speak again, and she dare not. At last he said, Miss Cameron, I believe I begin to understand what Professor Landis is always driving at. I never got the hang of it before, but you make things plain to a fellow. I'm going home to think about it. If I can settle it tonight, I will. And I want to know if you will pray for me. Mother prays for me every day, I know. But I can't tell her about this. It would scare her so, and she has trouble enough. I've got to have help from somewhere right away. I feel that. I've always known about such things a good deal. Mother doesn't say much, it isn't her way, but she lives things. I knew she was different from other folks but I never felt the need of it myself. I always thought I could take care of myself and make out first rate. Then when I found I couldn't, 
I kind of felt mad against God because he didn't do it for me, as I thought he ought to. But I begin to understand that I've got a part. Now, if I can see daylight about that part, why, I'll do it. But you'll pray it out for me tonight, just as mother would, will you? Was ever one in a stranger dilemma? What was she to say? She opened her lips to confess that she never prayed, did not know how to pray. But no, this would not do. It might be a fatal injury to a soul in peril, and the boy stood waiting for his answer. I will try, she faltered at last, he being too busy with his own thoughts to note the strangeness of her manner. Then he went away at once, and Mary returned to the back parlor like one in a dream. Where have you been? Emily questioned curiously. What did you say to that cross boy? Wasn't he horrid tonight? I hope the next time he feels as ugly as he did this evening, he will stay away. He gave me the blues. Then the family proceeded to discussing poor Ben and his prospects for making a wreck of life. Aunt Eunice and Emily together essaying to answer Mr. Cameron's questions concerning the boy. Mr. Cameron looked even more troubled than the others over his story. I am sorry cards have gotten hold of him, he said gloomily. He hasn't enough moral power to withstand their influence, I am afraid. And he began them in your own house, said Aunt Eunice severely. I hope that is a comfort to you. In the somewhat excited debate which followed this disagreeable statement, Mary Cameron took no part. In fact, she heard very little of it. Her mind was in a whirl of excitement of its own. What had she promised to do? The poor foolish boy to suppose that her prayers, even if she could bring herself to try to offer them, would do him any good. But she must pray. She had promised. A Cameron always keeps his word, was one of the proud sayings of this family, which had come down to them from a famous old great-uncle who kept his word under trying circumstances. Assuredly, if she never prayed again, Mary must try tonight to pray for Ben Reader. How should it be accomplished? Lucia would be in the room all the time, and would be talking, probably. She generally chose that hour to chatter about anything which had interested her during the day. Could she say to her that she desired to be quiet because she wanted to pray? The very idea of such a thing sent the blood flowing swiftly through her veins. She might go now to her room, while Lucia was helping Emily to prove that there was not the remotest connection between Halma and poor Ben's gambling propensities, but she shrank inconceivably from doing so. She would put off the strange duty as long as possible. She set herself to try to plan what she would say. Words of prayer were such strangers to her lips. Visions of her childhood floated before her, and she could seem to hear herself repeating, in grave voice, the old formula. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. But there was nothing in that to help Ben. She knew our father, of course, and she let her mind run swiftly through its various petitions, to make sure that there was nothing there exactly adapted to Ben's case. Then she grew almost irritable. What a ridiculous idea! Why should he need praying for to help him decide so simple a question? If he could not stand alone, and wanted to stand, and believed there was one who could help him, why then wasn't the way plain? Ah, Mary Cameron, haven't you resolved at least a dozen times during the last few weeks that you will curb your impatient tongue, and say only words which the members of your own family can remember with pleasure and comfort after you are gone out from the home forever? And have you succeeded for even a single day in standing by that resolve? And do you care to stand? Well then, isn't the way plain? but of that side of the question she refused to think. Life was too busy just now for her to take up any new line of work. The end of it all was that she compromised with her conscience in a miserable way. 
Lucia lingered over her preparations for bed in an exasperating way, replying to Mary's impatient attempts to hasten her that she need not wait. There was the bed before her, and the road to it was certainly plain. At last Mary went to bed, and covering her own face from view, murmured her shamefaced prayer, Oh Lord, help Ben Reader tonight. She had not an idea that such praying would be heard, deserved to be heard, but when one had made a wretched promise, what was one to do? End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of What They Couldn't by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen: A Startling Witness. Rachel Cameron had been several weeks at home before she succeeded in getting to the midweek prayer meeting. Surrounded by people who were not in the habit of attending, it was surprising how many obstacles they heedlessly threw in the way of one's doing so. At last it was Aunt Eunice who, as she expressed it, set her foot down. "'I'm going round on Smith Street to the prayer meeting tonight, whatever happens, and you needn't any of you plan to hinder me. I never lived so much like a heathen as I have since I came here.' "'Why should she think we would want to hinder her?' asked Lucia, with surprise. But she was equally surprised at being invited to accompany her, and promptly declined. So Aunt Eunice and Rachel went away together. The prayer room was fairly well filled, and a notable feature of the audience was the large number of young people. Rachel looked about her with kindling eyes. She had felt almost alone since her homecoming, but this gathering for prayer betokened that there were many kindred hearts right around her. Yet she was disappointed in the meeting. The singing was hearty and enjoyable, and the minister's address was certainly very fine, and in a sense helpful. But it was an address, not an informal social talk, like the family talks to which she had been accustomed in her aunt's church. Nor was there much praying. Two gentlemen being called upon offered long, formal, entirely proper prayers, and Professor Landis prayed without being called upon, and this was all. Not a youthful voice was heard during the hour, that is, not distinctly. They whispered a good deal, especially those seated in the back part of the house, not in a defiant or daring way, but as though their interest in something was too great to allow of longer silence, and their interest was evidently not in the pastor's address. Nor could Rachel wonder at that, for the most part they were young people who, while intelligent, even keen in their natures, they had not been trained to think closely perhaps on any subject, certainly not on the fine scholarly theme which was engrossing Mr. Edson. Certain of his auditors, however, listened and appreciated. Occasionally they nodded their heads in approval, and they said one to another when the service was over, wasn't that a fine thing he gave us tonight? So intellectual, such a command of language. That will do to print. He is destined to make a stir in the city. I don't know a D.D. among them who could give a more polished address, nor one involving more scholarship. Mr. Edson was prompt in shaking hands with those very people, and, to judge by the sparkle in his eyes, was getting his needful mental stimulus from them. Meantime, the young people were shaking hands with one another, talking almost too loud for the church, and exchanging bits of social life eagerly. They seemed not to look in Mr. Edson's direction, nor he in theirs. However, he saw one person who interested him. He caught Mr. Landis by the arm as he was passing with a bow and smile. Professor, do you know who those two ladies are who stand near the south door, back of Deacon Watson? Mr. Landis looked and explained. The young lady is Miss Cameron, one of a family living on Durand Avenue. I gave you the name a few weeks ago, you remember. The other is her aunt, whose name I do not recall. A guest, I believe. 
That is not the Miss Cameron who was at the social at Kincaid's? No, a younger sister, who has but recently returned home after a long absence. Ah, I was sure I had not seen that face before. Introduce me, Professor. Emily would have had no cause to criticize his greeting. Nothing could have been more cordial. He walked down the aisle with the strangers, talking eagerly. He was very glad to see them in prayer meeting. Perhaps they could come often, the church was so near their home. Would Miss Cameron permit him? The streets were really almost dangerous just now, such treacherous bits of ice here and there. It was not Rachel's hand which he drew deftly through his arm as he spoke, but the much subdued and bewildered Aunt Eunice's. Emily's chatter had not prepared her for receiving such kindness and courtesy from this minister. She was emphatic in her opinion of him, expressed as soon as they were at home. Such a pleasant-spoken man, and so friendly and thoughtful. It wasn't every young man who would have thought of offering his arm to an old woman like her to keep her from slipping. Emily listened in surprise. I think better of him, she announced. He is the sort of man whom I shouldn't have expected to know that there were any old people in the world, nor young people either, except a certain few which fit his pattern. Mrs. Cameron called her to account. Why had she of late adopted such a strange way of speaking of ministers? It was not refined. People should respect the profession more than that. Why, I do, said Emily. That is what is the matter with me. I respect it so much that I do not like to see him ill-treating it. Really, mother, what is the harm? He is only a man, and a young man at that. Besides, I am not saying anything very dreadful about him. Perhaps he will grow better as he grows older. There is room for improvement, I am sure. Then, as she felt that she was every moment making matters worse, the child stopped, laughing and blushing, not at her mother's reproving look, but at the gravity on her father's face. Did it trouble her father to have her speak so of Mr. Edson? He had old-fashioned ideas about ministers. I don't mean anything in the world but talk, she began again. I don't know Mr. Edson, of course, but I will say that he acts as though he thought more of rich people and cultured people than he does of commonplace ones. I don't know why he shouldn't, to be sure. I do. But one resents it in ministers some way. Don't let's talk about him. Tell us about the meeting. What is the use in people going to prayer meeting if they cannot help the folks at home to do good? But Aunt Eunice had become strangely silent. She took her knitting as usual, but neither about the meeting nor the various other topics which came before them did she advance an opinion. It was not until the family had separated for the night that she came across the hall to the room occupied by Rachel and Emily, and so astonished the latter, that, as she confessed to the girls in the morning, she might have been knocked down with a feather. "'Let me come in a minute,' Aunt Eunice said, tapping at the door, then opening it herself. "'I want to talk to you both. I guess what you said the other night, Emily, hasn't been out of my mind more than a minute at a time since. And it's true enough, I may as well own it, but I want to talk about it.' "'Dear me!' said Emily, much startled. "'What in the world did I say? Whatever it was, you mustn't mind it, Aunt Eunice. Nobody ever pays any attention to what I say, least of all I myself. I know it is not worth it.' Her aunt made no reply to this, but dropped into the low rocker which Rachel pushed forward, and motioned her niece to another. "'Sit down, both of you, can't you?' I've got something to say. I tell you it is quite true that my religion doesn't make me happy. It isn't the fault of religion, I know that. For I've had lots of trouble in my day, not much besides trouble, you may say, and I know that I should have gone crazy a hundred times over if it hadn't been for what religion I had. Many a time I have prayed my way out of dreadful scares of one kind and another, and lived through things that I thought I couldn't 
and I know as well as I want to, that the Lord heard me. But that is neither here nor there. I haven't been made sweet-tempered and patient and all that by my religion. It is good for what there is of it, but there doesn't seem to be enough of it to reach somehow. I've felt it more or less for years, but I don't know as it ever came home to me so sharp as it did the other night when Emily was going on, and Mr. Landis said that about being weighed in the balances. I'm not true weight, and I feel it. Your kind, Rachel, seems to be different. How did you get it? And what is the matter with me? Rachel opened her troubled lips to enter a protest, but Aunt Eunice waved it off. Oh, there's nothing for you to deny. I don't mean that you are forward or conceited or anything like that. There isn't a hint about you that would lead anybody to suspect that you knew you had a different religion from some. But it is plain all the same. I saw it the very night you came, saw it plainer than I have on any other face in years. There was a face once that carried it around just as you do all the time, and I envied it then, and felt half mad about it. But that one has been buried a good many years, and my conscience hasn't been troubled by the same sight often. I've thought of it more or less since the night you came, and tonight when that man prayed, I saw the same thing in his face, and felt it in his voice. Who? asked Emily, unable to restrain curiosity even now. The minister? Aunt Eunice made an expressive gesture of negation with her hand. No, child, no, the minister's religion is about like mine. He's got it, but there isn't enough of it to shine through on his face and color all he says. I mean that Mr. Landis. His prayer just seemed to give me a heartache. I'd give anything in this world if I could speak to God in the way that he did and mean it. Aunt Eunice, said Rachel, letting fall the hairbrush and dropping herself in a little white heap in front of her aunt's chair, if I were to try to explain the difference between your experience of life and mine, I should say that you were energetic and brave and strong and had shouldered a great many burdens and borne them yourself and taken only the hard ones, which you did not know how to manage, to the Lord. While I am young and weak, and feel my ignorance, and am afraid to go a step alone, or do the least little thing without the direction and help of Jesus Christ, so that as I walk with him beside me, I look for his approval of each word I speak. Aunt Eunice was watching her face, listening with the keenest interest to every word but her eyes had a perplexed look, as of one who did not understand. "'I don't know how you could,' she said slowly. "'Every word! Why, our words are not of consequence enough for him to listen. They have to be about such homely, everyday things most of the time.' "'Ah, but Aunt Eunice, that is just what I mean. Haven't you kept the extra words for him?' and planned the homely, everyday ones yourself? I cannot do this. I am sure to go astray if I attempt it. I have to take him at his word, and remember that the very hairs of my head are numbered by him. Therefore, nothing is too trivial for him. Besides, when we remember that the simplest words may do good or harm to a soul, they become important enough for even him to have their ordering." still that look of perplexity. I don't suppose I can make you understand, Aunt Eunice said at last with a weary sigh. You are young, as you say, and have had a quiet life, and not much to fret you, and I have been tossed about in a way which you could not even imagine, and my tongue has got so sharp that it cuts when I don't want it to while you, I suppose, never had a temptation to say anything but nice, pleasant words. My tongue has always been the worst part of me, and yours is, maybe, the very best of you. The rich color flowed into Rachel's cheeks, and she bowed her head a moment on her aunt's knee, seeking guidance. Then she said, Aunt Eunice, as a witness of his, I must tell you how mistaken you are. 
so far from my tongue having never been tempted, I will confess to you that it was my bitterest enemy. Mother will tell you that as a little child I was inclined to be rude in speech, and, when excited or angry, impudent. The only time my father ever punished me was for saying very angry and improper words to mother when he was present. After I went away from home, I did not outgrow this sin. I think sins are rarely outgrown. Mine gained in strength, I know, with every day. My Aunt Catherine endured, oh, so much from me. Sometimes it almost frightens me, even now, to think how I used to speak to her, not as you would imagine it possible a self-respecting girl could speak to any person, to say nothing of its being one whom I loved, and who had shown her love to me in so many ways. After I became, as I now believe, a Christian, to my dismay this habit of quick and saucy speech did not leave me. I could control it for a time, but the moment something enraged me, all my good resolutions were forgotten, and my tongue was steadily increasing in its power for evil. One night matters reached a climax. My aunt had been talking with me for being in the society of a person whom she did not approve, and I was trying to justify myself and him. I grew, oh, fearfully angry. God only knows the wicked words I said. He has mercifully let me forget many of them. And then, losing every particle of self-control, I seized a great glass pitcher which stood near filled with water, and flung it at my aunt's head. "'Oh, my patience!' exclaimed that part of her audience which was curled on the foot of the bed. "'Mercy, child!' said Aunt Eunice. "'You might have killed her!' "'I might, and I almost did. The glass shivered in a thousand pieces, and some of them struck her on the temple and cut, and one struck her eye. She suffered agony untold, and it was thought for a time that she would be blind. But God was good to me and spared her sight. Oh, Aunt Eunice, if I could describe to you the horrors of that night which I spent alone in my room, with my aunt in the next room, groaning at every breath, and they bending over her in an agony of fear. At first I could not pray, could not think. I could only cry out, Oh God, let me die, kill me, kill me right away. I am too wicked to live any longer. After a little I knew I must pray or lose my reason. And I, I don't know how to tell you about it, but I cried to God as I never had before. I told him all of my resolutions, made and broken hundreds of times, and then I just gave myself to him in a way which I had not before, gave my tongue into his keeping to be used by him, to speak his words and only his. Well, said Aunt Eunice, after a silence, she spoke almost sharply in her keen desire to hear the rest. Well, Rachel repeated, with a little tremulous smile, he took me at my word. And you didn't get mad after that, and say things you didn't mean? I never did. My aunt lived two precious years after that, and I never once, to her, nor to my cousins, nor to the servants, nor to anybody, spoke words which I could wish afterwards to have recalled. In truth, Aunt Eunice, I was another person from that hour, and I could truly say as Paul did, Yet not I, but Christ dwelleth in me. He kept me, keeps me. What I have often thought about since, and what I want to say now, is that of course it was not necessary for me to disgrace him so utterly with my besetting sin before he would give me grace to overcome it. What if I had gone to him with my temptation at the very first, being sure that I could not rule my tongue, and depended on him to do it for me? Would he not have been quite as willing? The mistake I made was in feeling that I could manage myself, and resolving to do so, and when I failed, consoling myself with the thought that I must not expect to overcome great faults all at once, but that by degrees I could get the mastery. 
it was all i instead of all christ they would have formed a group for an artist sitting there emily on the foot of the bed with her white robes tucked around her too interested a listener to remember to go to bed aunt eunice with her worn anxious face about which the gray hair hung loosely as she had suddenly left it after having begun her preparations for the night rachel with her long brown hair sweeping the floor as she knelt and talked after emily's one dismayed exclamation she had been awed into silence watching her sister she recalled the words of a schoolmate to the effect that her artist brother thought rachel cameron ought to sit for her portrait as an angel because there was nothing in her face that suggested earthliness it was a strangely pure face yes and a calm one i cannot imagine her as being angry thought emily fancy her throwing a pitcher of water at anybody's head she must be dreaming and yet of course it is true how strange i wonder if there is really such power in religion i wonder if it would make a great difference in me if it would in aunt eunice i might have some hope for myself poor old aunt eunice she means it i do believe it is queer for her to come in here and talk to us as she has oh dear what ought i to do now i wonder for now the two whom her fascinated eyes were watching had knelt together and rachel with one soft white hand was clasping the wrinkled bony hand of her aunt and was praying aloud it would perhaps be difficult to convey an idea of the impression which this made upon emily she had never before heard a woman's voice in prayer at first she was mainly occupied in deciding what she ought to do would it be proper to kneel as they had done but i don't know how to pray said this honest young soul and i won't make believe at last she slipped softly into bed deciding that that would on the whole be the most proper thing to do at first she covered even her head with the bedclothes resolved on giving them all the privacy she could then she decided that she would listen there was no harm surely in listening to prayers but before that simple tender strangely earnest prayer was concluded she had covered her face again to hide her tears if that is the way to pray said this gay young girl to herself i almost wish i knew how End of chapter 19